Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this narration of the web series Very Clever Primates, which has 18 parts. This is the first one in that series. A new episode will be released every weekday until we are at the end. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 1 My civilization has known only ourselves for tens of thousands of years. We've searched the galaxy far and wide looking for someone, anyone besides ourselves. People to meet, people to talk to, people to let us know that we weren't alone out here. It was one of the biological researchers in my galactic exploration unit. More or less, a crew would be sent to habitable planets, search for any sapient life forms, and if none were found, we would be sent samples of soil, water, and atmosphere. If any microbes were discovered, we were to make as many immune supplements as we could to prevent infection so that my species could colonize the world. It was awful when one was found. My team would spend dozens of cycles to ensure that we had a shield to the planet's native microbes. It was tedious, stressful work full of deadlines, but it was rewarding once the first colonists arrived. I knew sacrificing 15 cycles of my life to ensure my species could thrive in an alien world would be worth it. It gave me purpose. It gave me meaning. However, during one mundane exploration mission, we found a water-based world. More than 70% of the world was covered in water. The planet itself was haunting to see. All of that water and the absurd orbit of its moon had created painful weather patterns. Storms half the size of continents would spawn in the time it would take our ships to refuel on a solar radiation. However, it wasn't the weather patterns on the strange, water-based planet that had my team curious. The planet had satellites. Artificial satellites, something my own species created when we began our journey into the cosmos. We'd found sapient life on one of the most hostile yet habitable planets that we had ever discovered. I can't tell you what it's like to have thousands of people sit stunned in silence as we finally achieved our species' goal. We had, had found people. We had found a honest to God, aliens. We weren't alone. Tens of thousands of years of questioning answered in that instant. My scale shifted to blue almost immediately. I was awestruck. We had a plan for this. We would have to send back communications to our high command to let them know that we had found another species. We had to play it safe. We were more advanced than the species. We could be seen as anything from gods to tyrants wanting to dominate their planet. We couldn't make landfall on their planet without talking to them. There was so much to think about, so much to do. The communications team scrambled to get in touch with someone in high command immediately. But never... Did I expect that we would be visited? Humans, as we later learned them to be called, were not as patient as we were. We assumed them to be afraid or petrified at the thought of a race hailing from the stars arriving at their doorstep. But when the primitive shuttle came hurtling towards us from the abomination they call a International Space Station, we soon realized that this was not a species that we could scare off. The military personnel on our station readied their weapons, as was protocol in case that they were hostile. We attempted to manipulate our own communications into something, anything, that could broadcast to their vastly inferior technologies. Alas, there was nothing that we could do as that shuttle approached. Our ship was roughly a quarter of its size of the moon, and yet they still strode onwards towards us, showing no fear. Our military like their sheer lack of fear immediately. The warrior caste doesn't impress easily. We uh, were at a loss of what to do. The Trinity of Command, a high-ranking official from each of the three castes, warrior, scholar, and diplomat, each argued amongst each other as to what would be the proper course of action. Their scales were quite orange, let me tell you. You could feel their rage in the entire ship. We scholars wanted to skip protocol and make contact as soon as possible. Let them know that we weren't here to cause trouble. The diplomats argued with us, but said that we needed to bide our time as to not cause a panic in their people's government. The warriors, as was common, simply said that we needed to wait for orders from high command. Boring, if you ask me. We argued so much with each other that when the humans finally, for lack of a better phrase, knocked at our door, we were stunned into silence. Those crafty young creatures knew exactly where the rear cargo bay was on our ship. 
I still remember the laughter as we saw a human literally tied to his own vessel in a haphazard pillar of deep spacesuit, bounding at the cargo hold bay in futility with a gloved hand. The physical structure, upon first glance, immediately matched our own. Four extremities, bipedal, digits in each extremity. It was a shock to see how close we resembled each other. I'm fairly certain that the human, hilariously pounding away at our ship trying to get it open, was enough for the entire crew to relent and over the cargo hold for the humans. All of our hearts stopping in unison as their vessel moved into our cargo hold. The humans didn't account for the artificial gravity and atmosphere, and their vessel collapsed upon entry, causing minor exterior damage to their ship with a few flame sparks due to the oxygen-rich environment. I still laugh about how dumbstruck the humans were at first. Such primitive, but interesting people. The first to meet the humans were the warrior class, plasma rifles at the ready in case they attempted combat. It was clear within minutes, however, when one looked around, making cooing sounds from behind the radiation shielding helmet, that they meant no harm. Two more humans, wearing similar suits, exited the damaged ship. They stared at our military cars for what seemed like an eternity, the rest of the crew were watching on monitors, wondering how they would play this out. One of the humans collapsed, causing quite a bit of concern amongst our ship's crew. The human shook and made ghastly sounds from behind her helmet. That was a key difference between our species that took some getting used to. Humans were sexually dimorphic. The other human who exited with her grabbed onto her fallen form, holding her tightly against her own form, making more of the cooing sounds albeit in a far more muted tone. It didn't take a genius to understand what was happening. Emotion overcame the alien, and their reaction was far more physical to extreme emotion than simply changing the color of the scales like ours was. Diplomats were next to arrive, along with the select members of the biological research team. I was chosen to join them, having been the most senior of my team. I could barely contain my excitement. If my scales were any more green, I would have glowed. Yet, I needed to focus. I needed to take a deep breath and relax. I slicked back the quills of my head in an attempt to look at least somewhat presentable when we would first meet these aliens as I placed a mask over my mouth to prevent contamination. I wasn't going to go looking like an eccentric, lunatic scholar that just got done creating a monster. When we arrived in the cargo bay, however, the soldiers had already disarmed themselves it was clear that these first arrivals meant no harm. Good, I thought. It'd make my job easier. I needed to collect samples of their tissue. They'd likely have many immunities that native bacteria and microbes of their home world, and getting those immunities from the source would make cycles worth of work last mere half orbits. Thank the gods. I took out a phylactery, sorry, a device that keeps fresh samples of alien biological material from degrading out of my lab coat and looked towards the human that had pounded on a cargo bay door, the very thought of which made it hard to control the fluctuations in color indicating amusement. When I looked over the space-suited alien, it dawned on me that I, uh, wasn't sure how to communicate with him, that I needed to remove some of the suit of his to collect a tissue sample. Hells, I didn't even know how to communicate with him at all. Was I just to make absurd gestures in the hopes that he understood? The human gazed at me and spotted my research coat and the device in my hand. He said something that I would later learn was doctor when he saw the coat. Clever, primitives. It was close to a match to what my actual position was. As it turned out, wearing long sleeve body covering protective clothing when working with potentially biohazardous material was a universal constant in the scientific community. I was fortunate enough that these humans... These astronauts were scholars of their own species, intellectuals, the lot of them. Humans still amaze me with how quick they pick up on intentions. Despite my lack of understanding on how to request a tissue sample, he knew exactly what I wanted to do before I even had to explain it to him. It was shocking to see him start to take off his parts of his sleeve and the suit to expose his flesh. It was the color and bleached sand. Faint brown hairs growing from the follicles on his arms suggesting the species' evolutionary origin. While my ancestors possessed scales, their relatives must have possessed fur. Neat. I stuck the end of my phylactery in the alien's flesh and pressed the extraction button. I was immediately stunned, however, when he didn't even flinch when the process started. 
A sterile needle rapidly descended, gathering fats, blood, and skin samples, and retreated back into the tube of the phylactery. He took a brief inhale of air out from his helmet, and when he felt the needle descend, the adial, possessing enough intellect to realize that maybe breathing in the species' atmosphere wasn't the greatest idea. We'd later find out that Earth and Valla, our homeworld, shared a very similar atmospheric composition. But at that moment of first contact, we both decided to play it safe, despite our mutual excitement. I digress. I immediately placed the phylactery and the biohazardous material and safety bag that I brought along. The human didn't even seem to notice the extraction, as I said, despite red ichor that was his viscous blood leaking from the penetrated flesh. It coagulated faster than even most hardy of our species could ever manage. A high pain tolerance and a quick to regenerate. The species was growing more fascinating by the minute. I had work to do, unfortunately, so I could not stay to examine the new species further. I had antibodies to create. I didn't get to hear the breakthrough in communications, but what the humans conveyed to us was both off-handed drawings and attempt at communications in strange tongues. We managed to understand one thing that shook us to the core. It was a warning. If we went to Earth, humans would attack us. I have learned that humans are very good at knowing what people are going to do before they do it, especially their own kind. When we finally got approval to make first contact on their homeworld after the antibodies were completed, being attacked is the only way to describe humanity's reaction. End of chapter. I don't remember when the last I slept. Team member after team member tried to rush me to my quarters so that I could rest. It had been a few days after the aliens arrived and our ship and, uh, well, our computer systems were busy looking into their immune system to reduce as many antibodies as possible for reverse engineering. I was examining their organ systems from the tissue sample I collected. I couldn't rest until I knew more, and there was still so much to know about them even after the rotations of research and study. It was a blessing. I had more than enough time to kill before the antibodies were ready for production. I was supposed to meet with some newly formed team whose purpose was to determine how to approach integrating with these aliens. They were called humans, the diplomats discovered, but I had far too much on my mind to think about that now. Skolan, you have been awake for three rotations. Look at yourself, you're a mess, a young team member said, her scales orange in irritation as she marched into the lab. It was my personal apprentice, Skaresh. Her comment caused my eyes to gaze over the dull grey of my scales. Grey, a universal indication of exhaustion. I risk contamination by staying awake this long. Long periods without rest compromised immune systems, despite how sterile I kept my lab. There were always microbes that slipped through the cracks. I, unfortunately, was getting late in age as well, only further compromising my immune system. I was 173 revolutions old, approaching the middle of my kind's expected lifespan. It showed in my quills too, their normal rigidity slowly fading away. They would soon fall flat over my body in a few dozen revolutions. It was never easy thinking about getting old. Scarash, I'm fine, I replied, crossing my arms, eyes looking over her form. She was a bit short compared to me, a tribute to her youth. She was just shy of 1.75 meters, a meek for a Valan. She was thin as well, quite waifish overall. Other females could probably trample over her if they truly wanted to. Her normal violet eyes had been replaced with cybernetic ones, a soft green glow demonstrating their artificial nature. Her natural eyes must have been poor quality for them to be replaced like that. A blind Valan is a lonely Valan. Beside from one of Tone's voice, there is no way a blind Volan can tell anyone's emotional state without seeing their colors. Nature had not been kind to this poor soul. Despite that, however, she still possessed positive qualities. Her own colors were far more vibrant than the average female, and many men couldn't help but be drawn to her because of it. Were I twenty revolutions younger, I would have tested my luck. Skaresh scoffed shaking her head as she pointed at the hologram or the human that the computer had generated from the genetic material I collected. Several thousand simulations and genetic tests had given us a pretty good look at our galactic neighbor's physiology. We're all excited, Lan, but your health matters more than work. Go, rest, she chastised. 
She couldn't have been more than 40 revolutions, and she was acting as if she was my hatch mother. Was I really in that rough a shape? You're not the boss of me. In fact, I believe it is the other way around, Resh, I replied, my scales managing to provide a quick series of jovial yellow flashes before returning to the exhausted grey. Her scales were a mix of orange, yellow, and violet. I was glad to see my cheeky reply wasn't met with complete irritation. Fine, she stated flatly, leaning against one of the lab counters as she pointed a claw towards the organ structure hologram of the human. So, at least tell me what you found out about them. How different are they from us? She asked, her colors muting as if she focused on the display. I sighed, resisting the urge to rub my tired eyes. Instead, I gave a swift shake of my head. My curls swaying lightly from the exertion provided some motivation needed to get my explanation. I pointed towards the excretion organ towards the human's hologram's flank, as well as the gland that rested above it. After simulations, I've discovered the functions of the most of their organs, I stated, my scales giving a faint blue tint as I looked at that gland. The odd seed-shaped organ assists in scrubbing the blood supply of toxins. Aside from the fact that they have two instead of one, it's these small glands above them that have interested me and scared me, I stated, a soft sigh escaping me. Those glands excrete adrenaline, that is, as you well know, a biological combat drug of sort. I mused, placing my hands behind my back as the blue of my scales grew violet with concern. Oh, please, Skolan, Skaresh laughed, shaking her head, her youthful confidence almost being mistaken for arrogance. We have glands that produce adrenaline too, so what? She stated in almost a sing-song tone, my scales growing orange in irritation at her assumptions. Rush, our adrenaline production is diminished significantly since we became a sapient species. The gland responsible for producing it has shrunk considerably with time. Seeing how large humanities are and how much they produce, their hearts should be stopping whenever they get startled. I exclaimed, the orange of my scales growing brighter, and I haven't even gotten started on how powerful this circulatory system is. Look, I instructed, pointing at the display once more, particularly at the artery flowing in time with its heart. Humanity's blood is thicker than ours, Rash. They possess nearly a quarter more oxygen-transporting blood cells than we do, which are also far more efficient in their purpose. Their blood also possesses many more cells responsible for coagulation. They are better than us in oxygen transportation, as well as bodily repair. It was no wonder the wound from the tissue extraction healed so quickly. I huff. Resh still looked unimpressed, only causing my scales to nearly illuminate with frustration. I haven't noticed anything off about their nervous system yet, so I believe the human's lack of displaying pain was just despite me. I said, trying to keep my tone from sounding too desperate. I noticed Skaresh still having trouble processing what I was saying, causing my shoulders to droop in disappointment. All right, let me explain this to you in layman terms, as you are still in a scholar's academy. I began, turning to look at her, my scales turning pitch black with grim terror. Those glands supply the human body with massive doses of epinephrine, causing their lungs and heart to go into overdrive. This much you know. However, with how much adrenaline those organs can produce, their heart should go into cardiac arrest. However, their heart is so sturdy that it can handle all of that extra workload the adrenaline demands. The blood is capable of transporting more oxygen than ours is, and their tissue repair is faster. Our warriors could put up a fight in terms of technology, but in raw physical prowess, we'd be ripped apart, I said. Precious colors began to mute once more as she thought about what I'd said. It cannot be that extreme of a difference, can it? She asked, giving an inquisitive look my way. I simply shook my head. Their muscles are more dense, their blood is much better at transporting oxygen, they produce far too much adrenaline, and they have extreme physical responses to emotion. So, Resh, you tell me what a pissed-off alien is capable of when their muscles are filled with that much fresh oxygen and minds filled with rage. I spat. The black graveness of my scales gave way to muted yellow, while the chip of thought crossed my mind. Every evolutionary advantage comes at a price, though, I stated. My eyes closing in satisfaction, only an academic could know after a great discovery. All of that oxygen flow and chemical backlash deteriorates their body much faster than ours. At most, they'll live a third of our normal lifespans, and that's if their DNA doesn't rip itself apart, I said, opening up an image of the double helix DNA. 
The alien's DNA is very, very volatile. They aren't nearly as resistant to radiation as we are, despite their DNA having enough buffers to take our beating. Once those buffers are eaten up, replication is a nightmare. Mutation must run rampant through their society. I'm not one to make potential positives into a negative, though. Their DNA is quite interesting, I stated plainly. The yellow of my scales growing brighter and brighter, even fading into a green as I thought of possibilities. I know those colors, Fresh stated, her own scales becoming green as she waited on bated breath for my theory. What are you planning? Well, depending on how friendly our neighbors are, we could very well alter their genetic combination. Their current biological stage is just the beginning. It demonstrates how young of a race they are. They progressed far faster technologically than we ever did. It's as if a hatchling was named Dean of the Valar Academy of Elite Scholarship. Could you imagine what we could do to give them that push into genetic perfection? I asked. The sudden drop of color from bright green to orange told me quite swiftly what Resh thought about that particular train of thought. You're a brilliant biologist, Scalan, she began, but don't you dare think for an instant that playing the part of gods on a young, sapient species is an option. The Board of Scholars would rip your credentials apart even for considering that, she huffed, near growling with an orange fury. I gave a faint chuckle, shaking my head. It's just idle thoughts, Resh. Sleep deprivation must be taking its toll on me, I said. Resh still seemed distant, despite my own downplaying of a whimsical, mad biologist train of thought. Come on, Rush, you know I was only kidding. Now calm down, I'm going to go to sleep, just like you wanted. However, before you leave, please do take a look at their physiology. See, everything they're capable of. Then tell me if you don't have those same thoughts as a young biologist yourself. We're in a scholar cost, Rush. Our purpose is to think of all things that we could do. It is up to the diplomats in high command what we should do, I said. Yellow, fluctuating with grey as I made my way out of the lab, making sure to enter the decontamination chamber first before I made my way to my quarters. Resh would get over it soon enough. Youth had far too innocent a view when it came to scientific progress. My thoughts soon faded from Resh as I pondered the future assignment given to me. I had an appointment with that newly assembled human to Valan diplomatic partnership team. Next, rotation to discuss the high commander's orders. We had a lot of ground to cover, and the trio of humans that we had met before could only keep their mouths shut for so long before the homeworld got wind of our presence. We had to move quickly and efficiently so that our introduction could be a pleasant one. But at least for now, the only thing on my mind was sleep. End of chapter. Three days without sleep took the toll on my body. Half of a rotation passed before I found the strength to awaken from my pseudo-hibernation. The soft, bellowed blanket, currently wrapped around me like a cocoon, provided too much warmth to part with it. Couple that with my exhaustion, the air duct gently blowing cold air onto my bundled-up frame, and you have yourself a very, very comfortable volan. It was heavenly. Scala Scalan, a voice called out from beyond my quarters. I knew that voice. The all too perky diplomat Scoyar. Her voice grated on my nerves. My earlobes folding over to block out that incessant sound. It was sleep time. Scala Scalan, where you were supposed to be at a meeting a quarter of a rotation ago. Are you okay? She called out. A growl escaped my chest, tongue backing away so that my teeth would not cut the sensitive muscle. The orange glow erupting from my blanket made me look radioactive. Meetings with different governments was a diplomat's job. Couldn't the scholar just sleep? By the gods, woman, I was awake for three rotations before I managed to get this much rest. Can you just record the meeting? I trust that it wouldn't have been too difficult. I barked out, the annoyance evident in my voice. A swift pounding was met at the door, followed by my outburst forcing me to further retreat into my blanket cocoon. There was no biological scholar, only Skolan, the cocoon. However, the pounding only seemed to grow louder as she put all of her strength into it. Was she going to bash down my door? I cursed the names of each and every person on the ship as I writhed in my blanket, unwillingly forcing myself free from the comfort of my bed. 
I was half tempted to thrust open the door to display my body in the nude for those rude enough to awaken me. It would have been funny to see the flurry of colors on their scales from the indecency. The radiant orange glow was slowly changing to yellow as the thoughts of seeing their aghast reaction to my naked form flooded my mind. It was true, I was getting older, but that didn't mean that it wasn't fun to act immature. I settled on wearing a basic tunic with casual shorts, making my way towards the door. Entering in the security code on the nearby keypad so that the steel portal would slowly open up. Anyone on the other side would clearly see the unamused expression, scales a dull orange, while I got ready to be verbally attacked by the diplomat. I wished I never had the displeasure of meeting. She was abhorrent. Her colors were all wrong. They swelled. They didn't flow. They were obnoxiously bright, as if everything was either the worst or best thing ever created. She bounced, bubbled, and clicked the claws on her feet on the ground with every step. If she was dumped into the vast abyss of space for the crime of simply existing, I would have thrown a party after her removal. I detested this woman's presence. She was so uh, animated. Did I mention clueless? She was quick to roll into an obnoxiously bright yellow tone even after she saw my less than amused colors. Hello, hello, scholar scalon, she exclaimed, nearly twirling in place. Her cast rope swaying back and forth as she wobbled from the sensations of far too much emotion. Who even wore the cast robes anyway? They didn't have any pockets and were impractical than any other setting besides academy graduation. Every rotation was a celebration to her, and I wanted to vomit. Her colors were gaudy. Her voice was like a screeching engine. Her eyes took too red of a hue. She was a god's damned idiot. And, if you'd permit me being petty, she smelt bad. But I'd be damned myself if she didn't have the least ten emotional partners at any given time. People were drawn to that bubbly moron. She was an emotional disease to me, however, meant to be eradicated. I could fill the library with tomes on just how much displeasure this woman's very existence brought me. I'd go on book signing tours. Well, aren't you just the sleepy, sleepy hatchling, she exclaimed, reaching forward before I even had a chance for a quick retort. She attached a small adhesive badge to my shirt. It was made of thin paper, one side having words in strange characters written on it, a language that I didn't recognize. I pulled my tunic to gaze down at the strange symbols, utterly confused, and growing increasingly brighter orange as I heard those incessant giggles. Do you like your name tag, Skalaskalan? she asked. I lived on the ship with this woman for many, many revolutions. Even still, she used my formal name and title every time I had the displeasure of speaking with her. Just land is fine, yeah. We've known each other for how long now? There is no reason to be so formal. I said, trying my best to keep the kind of tone of voice, despite my irritation being blatantly obvious. Either she was too dim to notice my colors, or she simply didn't care. Her chipper attitude did not falter. But Skull ask on, this is reason to be formal, she exclaimed. I could not stop my eyes from rolling back in distaste. And why is that, Diplomat Skoya? I asked. A snotty tone following suit. She must have noticed my snarky comment this time, for her colors changed. In a shocking term of events, her colors changed to a light orange that blended with her normal chippy yellow. Irritation. Was I getting under her scales? Did I ruffle her quills? The thought was exciting. If you would have been awake, Scala Scalard, you would have known, she said, her normal abrasive voice grinding away into disdain herself. We managed to establish a connection with a group of humans on Earth. This is the first time we will be speaking to actual leaders of the people. And if my very presence around you is enough to turn you into an orange star, you've been selected to take part in this meeting, she said. My scales turned blue almost immediately. Meeting with the alien leaders. That was no job for a scholar. That was a job for diplomats. I was just to ensure my species could survive traveling to the chaotic rock. Why was I selected? That changed your hue pretty quickly, she said, giggling, her orange tones falling back into the bubbly yellow. We've been at hard at work deciphering humanity's languages for the past few rotations while you worked. 
we decided to focus on one of their primary tongues first, what the humans call uh, English. It was their language of the space-bearing humans that made contact with us. Since they told their leaders about you, specifically, they requested you to be there. Why? I asked, my scale still blue in shock. I'm just a scholar. I have no business in the affairs of aliens. That's your job. That's your cost, I said, violent concern mixing with the blue of my awe. It was one of the times in my life that I was okay with hearing what Skoyar had to say. Humans are weird, she said blatantly, the perpetual yellow on a scale shining bright. From what we've learned about them, their political leaders can be one and the same as the scholars and warriors. They... At least from the ones we talk to, don't have castes, she stated, with the quills on my head rising in confusion. No castes, that's absurd, and upsets balance. There's always going to be people more socially inclined than others. Why would they let their scholars lead? Our purpose is to educate, learn, and create. We're not meant to lead and maintain social relationships, I stated, leaning against the frame of my door. This was possibly the most neutral conversation I ever had with Yar. The diplomatic world was so strange. Yet to her, it was all bright and filled with pretty colors. Then again, life was bright and filled with pretty colors for Yar. Yar actually began to rub her arm, his scales changing into a color I had not seen on her. A dull violet. Sorrow. On Yar, of all people. I grew concerned, yet curious. We have had the opportunity to watch how humans operate. Um, they have unofficial costs based on skill sets and material ownership. They're very cold creatures at times. But are born, you grow, and then you either succeed or fail, she said, her quills drooping to match a color. My scale shifted to orange-blue. It was absurd to think about, leaving people to rot if they couldn't succeed on their own. Look, Scalar, Scalon. We must remember that they are a different species, she said, her tone hushed. They're a young species, still finding their way. We find ourselves in an odd, difficult position here. If the humans can see how we operate and succeed, working hand in hand with people from very different lifestyles, they might be willing to change. But on the other hand, if we try and guide them too much, we risk insulting them. Leave the discussions to us diplomats. We cannot risk our only galactic neighbor slamming the door in our face, she said, reaching to place a hand on my shoulder. I sighed, looking over the diplomat, a flash of yellow hitting my scales. I hated this woman, and she did have a point. I sure do hope they change, ya, yeah, I said, my scales changing to pure violet and sorrow for those unfortunate people on Earth left to rot after falling off the ladder of success. I would hate for our own hatchlings to become afraid for their own fates after seeing our neighbors letting their children fail. Yah hummed, it thought, looking down for a moment. I do not think that it is bad as that. The diplomats still need to research more about their history. At the moment, we only have basic translations available for only one of their primary languages and a few broadcasts the humans have sent out into space. I have our AI assistants working on translating, but even they could use a break for after a while. All of those simulations we've put in recently are causing them to get grumpy, she said. Her chipper yellow returning, especially after I donned my lab coat and dress pants to look more presentable. Very well, I trust you'll have at least this English deciphered soon. Most of the ship will need to learn it fairly quickly if we are to make landfall. The antibodies should only need a few more days to cook. I stated, Yah nodding in response. She waved her hand behind her shoulder, claws tapping on the metal floor as she took a few steps out of my quarters. Most certainly, the diplomat AIs were itching to get back to work anyway. They aren't like the scholar's AI. You and your AI friends are always so busy doing that science stuff. I'm shocked your scholars don't go mad from the workload, she exclaimed, refuting my agitation. I steadied my colors. I couldn't let my swiftly growing irritation ruin this moment. If these humans slammed their door in our faces, could our species really deal with the rejection of that scale? This wasn't being declined an emotional partnership if humanity wanted nothing to do with us. Oh no. We would be alone. Again. My scales became more and more black as their dread hit my mind. Even with Yar's chipper humming and bright colors, the only thing I could think about now was the species wanting to be left to their own devices and telling us to leave them alone. 
It made me think just about how cooperative the Valon were as a race. Everything from our social structures to our children rearing was based off cooperation. One could not succeed without the other. To find a species that worked off competition instead, could we even coexist? My thoughts bounced back to the warning by the first humans, how we would be attacked if we arrived. Why? Would they try and kill us and take our technology, like barbarians? I let out a quick breath as we approached the bridge of the ship. I couldn't let these fears get the best of me. They were different, sure, but thinking that our galactic neighbors would be little more than primitive barbarians was not doing them enough credit. We had just met them, and I already had doubts about them. I guess I was just worried that we'd be alone again. I think we all were. The Valon, for all their technological process, really couldn't handle being alone anymore. We were brilliant scholars, kind diplomats, and guardians of the people. But it was so damned lonely out here by ourselves. Ya opened the portal to the bridge of the ship. I'd only been here a few times before. The paragons of scholarship, diplomacy, and battle, the three leaders of the different castes on this particular vessel, were all there. The paragon of scholarship himself personally selected me to lead the biology team after my thesis on how to reverse the process of the necrotizing venom of the calcium sharpmouth plant. I've saved thousands of lives, and it was one of my greatest achievements during my nymph years. However... It wasn't the paragon that held my interest. It was on the humans on the large display in the center of the bridge. My heart picked up in speed as I looked at them. They looked far older than the humans I'd seen before. Their flesh sagging, wrinkled, gray. Their lack of colors was bizarre. They looked so neutral, emotionless. I couldn't get a read on any of them, but from their physical traits alone, I could see that they were, in fact, males of their species. The humans in the Santa clothes were dark green, his breast covered in various ribbons in different colors. What an odd fashion. The fur on his head was gray with age, but his eyes possessed a wisdom of someone who deserved that gray. He folded his hands together, those wise eyes looking right at me as I looked up at the display. This is the one that took the sample of our astronaut, the man asked, text displaying at the top of the screen so that I could understand what was said. The diplomats weren't kidding when they said that they had been working on translators. Indeed, the paragon of diplomacy said, his scales green with anxiety. Humans knew not what our colors meant yet, a good advantage in an initial contact. I can assure you it was just so that our kind could gather immunities to meet you face to face. We mean no harm, as I've said, he spoke. The human rose one of his hands, a sigh leaving his lips as he looked on towards the all-struck species. If you were going to attack us, you would have done so already. You wouldn't have sat by the moon on your ship like a child looking for someone to play with. Like you told us, we're the first aliens you've met in the galaxy. You're making the antibodies so that you don't have to wear hazard suits if and when you make landfall. The question I have is... Why do you need to make landfall? he asked. Not even the paragon of diplomacy had a decent response to that. Why did we need to make landfall? Why couldn't we just let them know that we were here and that we came in peace? Why do we need to get onto their planet? Were we that desperate to meet another alien species that we couldn't leave them alone? The answer was yes, and those clever primitives saw right through us. There is going to be a meeting regarding you, Valon, in a few days, the man said, his eyes squinting. You are going to stay in your ship while we talk about what to do about this. Do you know what chaos you've caused here? Do you know how many deaths you've caused because everyone is terrified that you're going to attack us? But we're not. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. People are panicking all across the planet, he said, sighing as the human rubbed his eyes. How unsanitary. My scale started to fade to a soft black tone, knowing that our kind would be refused our chance to meet face to face with likely the only sapien species in this part of the galaxy. What the human said next shocked us to the core. Don't you know it's rude to visit your neighbors without knocking first? You have my support for landfall here on Earth, mostly because a lot of people would burn my house to the ground if I chased actual aliens from another planet away. It's the other leaders that'll take convincing. 
I have some work to do, and I expect some help. We all collectively let out a sigh of relief, doing our best to keep our composure. Our neighbors were going to open their doors to us. We wouldn't be alone anymore. What do you need? The paragon of diplomacy asked. The human's lips curled into a smile, his upper eye full lifting in amusement. The good doctor making your antibiotics. He comes here first. Wait, what? End of chapter. Chapter 4 Absolutely not, Lan. Again, I reiterate, you're not the boss of me, Rash. You are my mentor. If those uh, primitives are lying to us and they kill you, what happens to me? I'm not spending 15 more revolutions in the academy while scholar bureaucrats decide what to do with me. Rash was taking my latest assignment too well. Despite her rage, all I saw on her scales was a soft, pale violet with concern. Resh was scared. I think we all were when the humans made it abhorrently clear they wanted to speak to me first out of everyone. The terms weren't disagreeable. I'd be allowed armed escorts from the warrior cast as I made my way down there. Still, they were adamant that a mere biologist was the one they wanted to talk to. Not any leadership or diplomats. They wanted to speak to me and were virtually immune to the diplomat cast's sweet talk. When the discussion with the humans finished, we spent nearly three quarters of a rotation discussing what to do. We pinged the nearest high command vessel for instructions. But there were many, many light years away, and by the time we made a jump to FTL, got close enough to high command to receive orders, and returned here, the window of opportunity would be closed. Humans were very, very impatient, and we were not prepared for how swiftly we needed to act. The mission was in our hands, so begrudgingly a bargain was struck. I would be given an armed escort, meet with the humans where we both would discuss how our species would move forward after this unexpected discovery. Humans were very, very hard to read in terms of what they were thinking. They did not have colors to display their emotions. How they communicated all aside from words and tone in their voice was beyond me. We were given two Earth Weeks to learn basic English and to finish the antibodies so that we could survive on the world. At least in terms of microbial infections. And indeed, within three Earth days, the antibodies were finished with a 98.6% adaptation rate. I had to abandon Resha's studies during most of that time, leaving her to study the human samples as well as run additional tests of the genetic code. The vanguard and the diplomats forced my hand, as I had a lot to learn and very little time. I had to learn English alongside diplomats and, as someone who has never opened a linguistic theory textbook in their long tenure of study, learning a new language was... tedious. But learn, I did, as well as the general dialects of the region I was going to. I was fortunate humans and the Valan shared many physiological traits, such as tongues and teeth. Could you imagine if humans used various tones of chirping to communicate? But if they gave off pheromones? Even while studying their language, my mind still was brought back to their biology. Once a biologist, always a biologist, I suppose. At the end of my study, and after the antibodies were administered to every crew member on the ship, we needed two rotations for them to take a hold in our bodies before landfall was even considered. Fortunately... We had more than enough time. All told, even after two rotations out of adaptation, we still had a full Earth day to wait before I was sent down to Earth. Hence, my meeting with Resh had her outburst. Resh, I sighed, looking at her as I would my own hatchling. I will have armed escorts. I have learned one of their languages. And worst case scenario, I am but a calm shout away for aid. Everyone on this ship has been inoculated to a majority of the infectious earth diseases, and we've transmitted the data to high command. I really doubt humans, despite being primitives, would start a fight. I said, unsure if I was trying to convince Resh or myself that I would be safe on the extremely hostile world filled with primitives that could shatter my body if they really wanted to. Resh lowered her head. Placing her two fists against my shoulders, she began to sing soft, sweet praises to Sko, the god of strength, 
patron of the warrior class to me. It was common for the religious amongst our kind, when a friend or family member was sick or facing danger, to utter such prayers. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Stupid, superstitious nonsense. Yet, if it brought rash peace, I would comply. Sko will see you home safe, she muttered once she was done blubbering to a non-existent god. Sko's good about that, she said, her violet scale softly changing to a light yellow. Resh was a phenomenal student, but that religious nonsense would be her undoing. She must have spotted the disbelief in my face, her scale shifting to a deep orange almost immediately. Can't you for once in our partnership just go along with it? It's not like I ask for much from you, she hissed, curls rising in irritation. Can't go along with what I don't believe, Resh, I replied, leaning against the wall of the hallway that we were in. You say that now but I promise you those humans are planning something. There's no other reason that they demand to see you and you alone. Otherwise, I don't care if you believe in the gods or not, but they believe in you. So when you barely make it off that planet after they attack, wondering how you made it back alive, I want you to really think about that lack of faith. She spat, turning around and huffing back to the lab. My colors mixed and flowed in confusion. Where was that outburst from? Was she that petrified? Honesty. The clergy did a number on that nymph. I figured that I would let Resh's colors settle for the remainder of the rotation and relax myself. My own nerves were starting to show. Vibrant green patches on my otherwise neutral palette. I went into our ship's library, taking a seat on the softest, cushiest chair they had available, and simply looked upward out of the observation glass into the cosmos. My kind had done so much. We'd explored nearly one-sixteenth of the galaxy. We've overcome our own primitive natures to become one united species. It wasn't an easy thing to overcome, and it took generations upon generations to forget old hatreds. But we did it. We've conquered almost every obstacle keeping us planet-bound species. We needed a new trial, a new test. Humanity could be that test. I just... Wasn't sure I needed to be a part of it. I couldn't sleep at all as the moment of truth approached. I slowly rose from my seat when the time came to say goodbye to Resh and made my way to the lab to see if she was present. Of course she wasn't. She wasn't in her quarters either. I searched the ship for as long as I could to find her, but she wasn't present anywhere. Perhaps it was for the best. Nymphs, even brilliant ones like Skoresh, still had issues dealing with potential death. As such, I made my way to the lab again, opening up a voice recording program as I began to speak into a nearby dictation microphone. Perhaps a parting gift, if the worst was to come, was in order. Let it be known that Skoresh, should my time on Earth prove fatal, has succeeded in every trial I, Scholar Scalon, High Biological Research Advocate of the Valan Academy of Elite Scholarship, have set before her. Let it be known that I, personally, fully endorse Skoresh's acceptance into the Academy of Elite Scholarship's Biology Department as a recognized scholar of the caste, I said, my scales turning a soft violet. I said the audio record to be released upon the declaration of my death. Skoresh would never, if I died, be sent back to the academy while they search for a new mentor for her. Don't say I never did anything for you, Resh. Forty revolutions and gaining an endorsement, even post-mortem, is the highest honor any apprentice could ask for. You're lucky you're brilliant. If I should die, that endorsement would shave twenty revolutions of study off of her apprenticeship. Alas, the moment of truth came. I turned off my workstation and grabbed two items from my desk, my personal communications terminal, which I could use to access my workstation and communications linked on the ship, and another phylactery. The needle was sharp, and I couldn't handle a gun to save my life. Literally. I stuffed those items into my inner coat pockets and made my way to the hangar, where a team of five warriors awaited my arrival to begin transport to Earth. Warrior cast. Oh, how odd those ruffians were. There hadn't been a need for warfare amongst our people for some time. They were glorified peacekeepers, either going to new planets to clear out areas of hostile flora and fauna, 
or staying on established colonies and voila hunting down criminals to throw into prison. Even with all of our advancement, some rotten eggs existed in a few clutches. However, as new species of potential hostile aliens emerged, the warriors found themselves eager for an engagement. Woe be unto the humans that decided they wanted to pick a fight. I'm pretty sure those five warriors alone would have pointed their plasma rifles downward, shot holes through the planet itself, crawled through those holes, and would emerge on the other side just to strangle one hostile target. What did they feed the warrior cast? All right, Lan. The commander of the unit spoke as we entered the small shuttlecraft, each of us strapping in as we prepared to enter the atmosphere. Earth has about 10% higher gravity than Valar, so you're gonna feel a bit heavy when the gravity pulls us in. Wind and inclement weather are really common too, so if the wild, diseased animals don't kill you, the planet itself will. It's boiling hot and freezing cold at the same time in different locations. We'll keep you safe from the people, but try not to trip on a rock and let the planet get you, she said, cackling wildly while slamming her fist into the cockpit. Get us out of here, we're ready to go, she exclaimed. With a sudden feeling of weightlessness, the spacecraft began to slowly rise. The bay doors opened up, and with a bit of a thrust, we were off. I couldn't see the outside of the shuttle, but I'd like to think the Skoresh was out there to say goodbye. My scales turned violent as my thoughts turned to her. Did I need to be so cold when she prayed for me? I was a manta, and she was concerned about my safety. I started to feel like I was letting the poor girl down until another warrior gripped me by my shoulder. Mind on mission, Scalar, she said, her own scales of vibrant green. Though, I'm sure that was because of her excitement rather than the nerves. Play nice to the colorless, bird aliens for maybe a rotation or two, then we'll go back and let the diplomats take over. Easy, she said, giving me a compassionate look. Compassion? From a warrior caste? That was shocking. I nodded in reply and began to practice some common English phrases in preparation for meeting the humans at their desired coordinates. I'm sure the warriors looked at me as if I was mad. It didn't take us long to reach the area they wanted us to. We landed on a slab of artificial stone easily enough and slowly began to emerge from the aircraft. Warriors first, then myself following suit. The very second I walked out of the shuttle, I was in sheer awe at the beauty of the place. Vibrant green hues assaulted my eyes as I looked around, wrapped my lab coat a bit tighter around me as the wind of this planet whipped around my form, giving me quite the chill. Fortunately, the warrior armor kept them nice and warm. Lucky them. A dozen or so humans stormed out of a nearby stone building as we left the shuttle carrying rifles slightly similar to those our warriors had. I couldn't help but chuckle as I saw their weapons. Solid, projectile-based weaponry. That would work on their own, but with how hard in the warriors' armor was, they'd be lucky to crack the first layer. Still, if that kept these humans from worrying about the spooky aliens, more power to them. Which one of you aliens speak English? One of the human soldiers barked. Strangely, his guns weren't pointed at us but rather on the forest beyond our little stone outpost. The warriors all looked at me in confusion. I was the only one that had been given the language training, it would seem. Fantastic. That is me, I said in what I assumed was broken English. The human dialect was so brutish and bizarre. They forced their tongue into movements against their teeth and the roof of their mouth. It lacked the finesse of the Volant speech, Great, sir. We gotta move. Now. He paused, turning to the woods once again, shouting, Stay back! At the top of his lungs. What was he shouting at? I couldn't see or hear anything. Stay back or we will shoot! As his voice echoed out, I looked to the commander of the warriors, who was clearly at a loss. Her scales flowed in and out of various colors before I could hear a rumble. It was faint, but it was growing louder and louder. Go! We need to go now! Why? I asked. My question would soon be answered. From the woods, a tide of flesh emerged, all in different tones of clothing. Humans, hundreds of them, charging from the woods towards the fenced-in area. Not a single soul amongst them concerned with the threats of the soldiers as they marched forward. The warriors lifted up their own rifles in preparation of the assault. There they are! The aliens are here! A human near the front of the tide shouted, 
causing a roar of noise from the other humans as they only trudged through the forest faster. A few soldiers opened up their steel doors and stone building. Go! Now! I was barked at. I nodded, looking the warriors with me, nudging my head towards the door so they got the message. We more or less sprinted into the building, just as the gates barricaded us from the outside world were hit. As those steel doors closed behind us, the distinct sound of solid projectile gunfire echoed into the dark chamber we stood in. We really were attacked. End of chapter. Chapter 5 These humans are absolutely idiotic. How in the hell has they got their species into space when they can't keep the civilians out of secret locations is beyond me. The commander of the warrior cast unit was fuming, and for obvious reasons. We were all pretty orange from how the humans handled our arrival. I, for one, felt my quills stand on end out of irritation. Did they want us to get killed? I wanted answers. We all wanted answers. Between the incompetence of our diplomat class and the human government that we were currently hosted by, I started to question whether or not actually making contact with the humans was a good idea at all. It was a tale of the best intentions got awry. Perhaps we were meant to be alone. The steel door behind us slammed open, the already on edge warriors readying the rifles, aiming them at whoever marched towards us in that strange steel and stone room that we were stationed in. The human soldiers shut the door behind them, barring it shut before raising their hands in what I assumed to be a sign of trust. Easy, easy, we're not here to kill you, we're here to take you to the general. One of the human soldiers, face clad in a black mask, stated, his eyes wide. Human eyes were fascinating. They possessed many different colors, contrasting their skin. Blues, greens, grays, round, and so expressive at that. Perhaps that is how their species communicated their emotions. I certainly felt myself trying to read their eyes. The warrior cast, on the other hand, was more concerned now with getting this mission over and done with. They had enough of these primitives and their foolishness. What is the alien saying? The commander asked, her grip tightening on her rifle in anxiety, scales shifting from orange to a vibrant green. They say they mean no harm, I replied, listening to the shouting outside. It was faint thanks to the stone walls, but, um, let me just say that they weren't exactly kind with their choice of words towards their soldiers. As my thoughts turned to the people outside, however, I looked at the soldier, my eyes growing serious. Did you just shoot your own people? I asked, my tone stern. The soldiers looked at each other for a moment, their own commander shaking his head. This is a restricted area for authorized personnel only. They knew the risks breaking in, he stated. He stone cold as he moved forward. Now tell your bodyguards to lower their rifles, or we're going to have a problem. The general is waiting for us down below. I was a bit caught off guard by how bold and brutal the human soldiers were, even in the face of technologically superior beings. They still showed no fear, and, in fact, made threats. I would have gained quite a bit of respect for the primitives if they weren't so disgusting towards their own people. Shooting at your own kind, I knew humanity still warred with each other, like we did all those millennia ago. But to show no remorse for it, that is what made these people alien to me. They lacked compassion. There was only the mission. I turned to look at the commander, Scar Anna, sighing in disdain. Lower your weapons, Anna. We're going nowhere until we do. I stated, making the commander hiss in disbelief. I had no power over her, nor any of the warriors. Who was I to tell them what to do? I won't bow before a hostile alien, she spat, her grip shaking. The human soldiers began to raise their own rifles in impatience, making my scale seethe in orange fury, bordering on red. Mind that they shoot their own people, and where in the hells is their leader? Oh, for God's sakes, Anna! I hissed, looking towards the humans. Anna, you saw my report. Regardless of how barbaric these aliens are, those humans will rip you apart, despite how well-designed your armor is. Your soldiers have no chance. Just do what the human ask and then boast about how great of a warrior you are after, I shouted. Anna looked at me with a look of color that made me expect that I would be the one shot at. I'd never seen Anna that angry before. 
We've only met on a few occasions, but for the most part, she was a happy-go-lucky, if a bit rash woman of Valar. But now, I saw a soldier far away from home with a very itchy trigger finger. The warrior caste had not tasted war for many, many years, and it seemed like they were eager for blood again. We just got you, for goodness sake. You're lucky I like your colors, Lan. We're going to have a long talk after we're done with the thing nice for these humans. She hissed, looking at the other warriors. Stand down. We'll be done here soon, won't we, Lan? She asked, her rifle lowering. I sighed in relief, nodding as the rest of the well-armed, very irritated soldiers, human and Valan, followed suit. Of course, of course. Yell at me and complain to the vanguard all you want, once we're off for this planet. I said, laughing nervously, scales turning a bright green as I looked towards the humans. Lead the way, most gracious hosts, I said, trying to help ease tensions as best a scholar could. Right, follow me, the human stated with a tone of mistrust. I couldn't blame the primitive before being on edge. This was likely just as rough on them as it was on us. We had a lot of ground to cover and a lot of talking to do before either side could truly trust each other. I was just stunned we were so close to armed engagement right as we met. The incompetence of the leaders and the nerves of the soldiers never went well together. We were led down stone tunnels, softly lit by glowing fluorescent lights. Down and down, deeper and deeper into the stone temple these soldiers resided. Through steel doors with strange symbols all over them, from staircase to staircase, we marched onwards. The gravity began to tax our bodies, although the warriors would never show it. Our steps became sluggish and our breath hastened. The oxygen of this planet wasn't as rich as other planets. Our muscles had to work harder, with less energy than we were used to. For the scholar, it was torture. I desperately wanted to sit down. I missed my bed. After what seemed like an eternity, we reached the bottom level of the complex far bigger below the earth than it was above. Suddenly, steel doors opened to our sides, more soldiers surrounding our group as we worked further through the facility. The area around us becoming more steel and less stone and narrow the further we went. Those humans made us take the stairs when they had lifts up and down the different levels. My scales fluxed in frustration, but I bit my tongue. The area became less and less like military bunker and more like a lab. People in lab coats, like me, weaved in and out of groups of soldiers. My heart sank, putting two and two together, my colors switching to a bright, vibrant green. This isn't your leader at all, is it? I asked the human commander. No response. Not at all. I swallowed as we approached a large, steel double doors. The human commander and one of the scientists placed the strange plastic items against the walls on either side, causing the doors to open. And on the inside, I saw them. Dozens of humans wearing similar attire to mine, all running to and from primitive computers running tests, and in the center was a large circular table, the man in the green suit with the strange ribbons on his breast sitting right at it. They brought us to a secret military research facility. I didn't take a genius scholar to know why. Do you really think we come in peace and take us to your leader would work, alien? The man in green asked, leaning back in his chair. Have a seat! You six aren't going anywhere. We have a lot to talk about. Scalan, Anna said quietly, looking around in concern. What is the human saying? She asked, looking to the general through squinted eyes, rough with quills and bright orange scales. With how barbaric these humans were... I really didn't want to tell the Prime for attack warriors that we likely were going to die here. As such, I did the next best thing. I tapped the comlink broadcast button on the cuff of my coat, the device I brought along with me making a connection to our ship quite easily, despite our depth in the earth. I paid to have scholars of communication technology on our vessel. Our discussion with the humans would be loud and clear if anyone was curious enough to examine my lab terminal, and knowing Skaresh... She was already tuning in. He says that we need to have a seat, so let's sit, I said, giving Anna a knowing look, my scales flashing yellow to her, a signal that I had a plan. Despite our earlier argument, the seasoned warrior flashed the same yellow to me in acknowledgement. 
She'd play my little game and be a quiet little hired gun on my unsuspecting alien act. The six of us moved forward, each taking a seat across from the general. Our eyes glued to that one human's form. Now then, the human general said softly, placing a large tube of dried plant into his mouth and, using a portable torch, ignited the end. The human was puffing away on the most foul-smelling plant that I'd ever had the displeasure of inhaling. The urge to cough was rising the longer he puffed on that thing. What do you want with us, alien? What else did you use that sample for? The human asked, leaning forward. And make sure your friends don't lift those weapons. Let's play really nice here, alien. Once you finish answering my questions, I'll be more than happy to escort you fine people out of here, he said, folding his hands together. I couldn't help but look at the human in irritation. Humans were a powerful species, that much was certain, but being so bold and putting a diplomat team at risk to get answers was just foolish. Still, out of self-preservation, I'd play along. We didn't know that you were here, alien, I responded, crossing my arms to match the human's own posture. The human's squinting eyes clearly demonstrated that he didn't like that particular word being used against him. We were exploring this section of the galaxy, looking for hospitable planets for colonization. If your species didn't leave such a mess outside your atmosphere, we would have passed right along, as your planet is far too harsh to hold a stable colony for us, I stated, taking in a breath. Littering your atmosphere with satellites and primitive space stations, let us know a sapient species was here. And you are the first one we found. I apologize if our eagerness to learn more about you and say hello to our new neighbors gave you calls for concern. I said, my tone dripping with annoyance and condescension. I was a scholar, not a diplomat. And frankly, I was tired of the species already. I hadn't been here a rotation, but my patience was growing thin, despite death all around me. Even after my hidden insults, the human nodded in understanding, writing down notes in a journal. Sorry for leaving a mess as we progressed in technology, he said, taking in a swift breath, likely biting back a string of insults himself. My scales lit up in satisfaction. I was enjoying being a pain to the barbarians. Don't be. We lit it too when we first started to get off our own planet, I stated, leaning back in my chair. Relaxed. An idle thought ran through my mind thinking of how the Lan were before we became a space-faring species. The details were fuzzy. I was never good at history, student. The warriors seemed to note my relaxed posture as they themselves eased into their seats as well. Here's your answer, I began. I really did just take a sample to get antibodies for all the dangerous microbes on your planet. By taking a sample from a native species, I just duplicated your own antibodies so that we could inoculate ourselves to as much that we could survive. We don't intend on colonizing an already sapient inhabited planet. Is it so hard to believe that we just wanted to say hello to the only species we've ever discovered so similar to ourselves? I asked, my colors growing orange in irritation. Is humanity that paranoid? The general stopped writing placing his journal and pencil down on the table, with a faint sigh. He looked up, looking into my eyes directly. Yes, our species is always prepared for the worst, he said, eyes filled with determination. I was aghast at such a comment, struck with disbelief. But why? Why would you automatically assume my intentions were malicious? Why would our kind go through the effort of establishing contact, learning your language, and remaining civil until you gave us permission to land? I asked, demanding answers from the savage. The human let out a faint laugh and a soft smile. Not all warfare is combat, alien. You come here, play nice, earn the love of the people, and then suddenly everything changes. Civilizations change. Hell, things have already changed, he said, picking up a small remote next to his journal, turning on the monitor nearby one of the massive primitive computers. On the screen, he was broadcasting a pair of humans sitting at a desk, discussing the past few Earth weeks. My scales turned darker and darker as I saw what mankind had been doing. People looting shops, attacking each other for supplies, claiming that the end of the world was near. They descended on each other like wild animals as our ship was displayed in full view for everyone and anyone to see. They talked about human technicians that tuned into our haphazard communications, able 
to watch our conversation as it happened with the human general. That's how the human civilians knew we'd be here. A technician leaked that information. I placed my claws over my mouth in horror. People were marching in the streets, holding signs up towards the sky. Take me away from this place, was written on one side. Oh, government lies! We need you! On another, people chanted for and against our arrival on this planet. Their various species turned against their government in pseudo-civil war almost the second we arrived here. Good gods, I muttered in Valan, the warriors all watching the same horror as me. They didn't need to understand the language, to understand the strife of a civilization on the brink of collapse, all because we stumbled upon their tiny blue orb. The general looked at me after those horrifying moments, his expression stern. Now, doctor, why should I trust anything you say, considering how much damage you've caused? My scales were boiling, scorched red. I had no words. I was filled with a fury I had not known in my entire life. Scaresh's thought my visit would be restore the faith in the gods, but these savages, these barbarians, only made me scorn them further, but not because of how brutal these humans were. Oh no. The memories of my history lessons in Scholar Academy came flooding back with every video clip that displayed on the monitor. It was like ancient history repeating itself, and I had such a high hopes for such an advanced young species. That is what infuriated me. Because... We were once you. I finally spoke, still thinking of our ancient history, all of that suffering, all of that war, all of that pain. It was exactly how we once were, before the reforms and before our species truly grew into greatness. We were human. We nearly destroyed ourselves before we reached the stars. I fear, after seeing that, your kind may not survive its own hubris. Silence hit the room. Humans were barbaric, cold creatures, but they were very good at picking up on intentions. The general leaned forward, his lips moving into a big smile, despite the gravity of what I just said. You see, now we're getting to know each other. It was at that moment that the English word prick became my favorite. End of chapter. Things with the humans were, uh, complicated. I'll leave it at that. The general was a scholar as well as a warrior. He went on and on and on about the history of the world I currently resided on. Things became far less tense as we talked and my rage subsided. Instead of red, my scales were blue in shock as the talks of humanity continued. We misjudged humanity. I had misjudged humanity, and I made absolutely sure to translate everything I could to the warriors around me, so that they would understand. Between the human general's history lesson and my own translation, we could have been speaking for nearly a whole rotation. General Patrick McCullen was the man's name and rank, and what he lacked in youth he made up for in military tactics, history, and understanding. Although the chaos outside of the base made me question his abilities, his explanation over what went wrong helped clear things up quite a bit. However, his thoughts and views on his species made things all the more troubling. I can tell you right now, Doctor, that our species will not get along, he began, putting out God's awful scented tube of dried leaves, a cigar, from what he told me. Your kind values progress and the success of your species as a whole. You're willing to sacrifice your own individual values just so your society can progress. That's not humanity, he stated, leaning back in his chair. Why this man called me doctor rather than scholar was beyond me. Perhaps it was simply the human equivalent. General, sir, I, the species, went through the same thing. We warred with each other and broke out in fights amongst ourselves constantly. You can overcome that human desire like we did. I said it was growing easier and easier to talk to this man. Now that the guns weren't pointed at us, I wondered if anyone was picking up on the conversation, as I was still broadcasting it. It'd be impossible to tell until I returned to the ship. Until then, though, I simply had to hope that nothing interfered. That's a really cute philosophy and history lesson, Doctor, but we're not your kind. We're humans. 
Humans need a stone hand to guide them, or they'll fight over themselves for any small resources available. It's a bit of a pessimistic view, but we live in a pessimistic world. How? Our own country breaks out into fights over political philosophy on a near weekly basis. You expect us to change simply because aliens showed up in our doorstep, wanting to lead us to the promised land of progress. You want us to become you? He asked, his brow furrowing. Well, no, but similar philosophy would no doubt stop. It wouldn't stop anything, nor would any human want it to, he exclaimed, sending our group jumping back in our seats as he pointed a finger at me. You listen to me and you listen well. No alien is going to show up in my backyard and tell me what to do. I've lived too long and bled quite a bit for this country, a country I love so much that I would die to see it survive, he said, his aggressive stance faltering as he saw our reaction to it. The general closing his eyes with a faint laugh. The same goes for a lot of us. All over the world, we're a species of patriots and kings, he said, almost in a solemn sorrow. We fight over resources, we fight over political ideologies, we fight over religion. We are a race of people itching to be powerful and righteous. We are the antithesis of Valon, from what you've explained to me, doctor, he said. Yet his expression of sorrow uplifted as soon as it shifted. He spoke once more before I even got word in edgewise. And that's fine by me. Because it's just who we are. We change for no one if we believe that the cause is good enough. We'll follow tyrants into battle because they're powerful and we'll stand up to tyrants because our sense of right and wrong. Every human is their own king. I don't care if you're homeless or the leader of a country. Everyone decides their own fate. It isn't decided for you because you're faster than someone, or better at science than others. No, you do what you want to, and you're free to do it. The consequences don't mean crap, Doctor. You say that we're going to die by our own hubris. Then we're going to die by our own hubris, he exclaimed, adjusting his uniform jacket. I am no one's lapdog. I serve willingly because I believe in the beauty of being free to serve. No one forced me to put on this uniform. This duty to my country wasn't thrust upon me by someone older and smarter than me. No, I went out there into that scary world you're so petrified of, worked with humans that all had their own hopes, dreams, and desires, and I achieved greatness on my own merit. You say that you need to help us. What help could we possibly get from someone that does what they're told, and nothing but that? out of fear that they won't be progressing the species. When does progress stop for you? When do the Valar just sit down and do something you want to do? He asked. No, demand it of me. My scale shifted to orange at his sudden outburst. I do what I must because it's what I'm good at and I like to do it, I exclaimed back. You claim every man is a king, but that's easy for a man. Burning tubes of fell, burning plants that obviously are toxic in a nice lab under the earth. Protected by soldiers to say, I hissed, leaning forward. Have you ever seen the hopeless? What have you done to make their lives better? While sitting in your chasm, do you even think about all the wasted potential begging for food? I have since I've gotten here, and so has every other member of my species who has seen you humans. I don't seek fame or fortune from doing what I do, and I'm still recognized for my work. What recognition do those homeless get? What help do you provide them so they provide for you instead of the tax system, hmm? I asked, Quill standing on end. If they're too sick to realize that they're the cause of their own pain, then that's their problem. It is your problem. No one should struggle to survive on a planet that can provide enough food, water, and shelter that people like you can get large. I exclaimed, pointing a claw at the old man's stomach. A low blow, but he'd get my point. The general took the blow with a guffaw, shaking his head and placing his hands on his belly. What can I say? I love and can afford steak, he replied. I wasn't sure what steak was, but this man showed no remorse for his blatant selfishness. He was having none of my scolding. How bullheaded. You think that I didn't struggle? Every human life is full of struggle unless you're born into the lamp of luxury. That's the human experience. You said it yourself. Our planet is an inhospitable zone of danger. Our lives are short. 
I'm sorry if I spent my youth and strength in the pursuit of life I love, but now that I've reached it, I'm going to enjoy every second I have left. And damn the others that didn't make it, I asked in retort. How much time would it take to fix what was wrong with them, Doctor? How long does your species live? Roughly three hundred revolution years. Exactly. Call it a cold as you want, but the truth is we humans face death every day. This planet and our pride in ourselves won't let us give up these precious years of peace just so that we can give other people a shot. We worked hard for what we have, and we don't have time to fix everyone, he said, sighing, actually seemingly annoyed at that response. There was a silence that plagued the room. I translated our argument to Skoana, her own scales matching my own, orange with annoyance. She wanted to speak English at that moment. She was a warrior, just the same as this man was. She could sympathize with the man. But the more and more I thought on what he said, the more and more I realized that it would take more than good intentions and a helping hand to fix humanity. Especially considering humanity didn't want to be fixed. According to him, humanity didn't need to be fixed. I placed my head in my claws, racking my brain for ideas on what to do, what to say, and how to say it in order for the human, who wasn't even the leader of his people, to understand the fact that they needed to stop living the, the way they were. They needed to be better. And then, the thought of how humans would always do what they thought was right popped into my head. All humans were different, and yet groups of them still banded together to do what they felt was right. We needed to give humanity a global cause. We needed to give them an enemy, I spoke softly. Humanity needs a rival, not a partner. Humanity can only fight itself for so long before the world collapses around them. But if we gave them something else to fight... The general leaned forward, hands folded against each other's, the stern look in his face growing bolder. You saying something I should let my soldiers be aware of? He asked, eyes squinting. The human was beginning to grow suspicious of my out loud pondering. Why did I do it in English? I'll never know. But I knew humanity's collective itch to be better, to do better, to boldly go into the unknown. Hells, they knocked on our door when we were scrambling to figure out how to deal with them. What could I do to give them something to motivate them like that? The Valan could coddle them, force them to conform. Humanity would never conform like we do. No, we needed to find a reason to get humanity over their own hubris by their own merits. No lesson the Valan could teach would ever convince humanity to give up their own cultures and individual personas. Those planets out there that we can't inhabit, they're too harsh for us. Too dangerous. They're rich in resources, too, I said softly, my colors turning yellow with hope. Go on. We need our leaders to talk. We need to negotiate. If you humans want our technology to explore the cosmos, you're going to have to convince us that you're worth our time. I'm not seeing it right now, I stated to the general. The general hummed, looking at me with curiosity. What did you have in mind? he asked. Nothing I have the ability to do myself, but once our leaders speak to each other, I have an idea. I just need to be given the chance to talk to them, both in order for our species to find a way to coexist, and to propel your species past this dangerous part in your history. No, you aren't, Valan, but if what you say is correct about you humans, you don't want to be. You humans won't settle for being taught how to progress. You want to do it yourself, and the only way to do that is to give humanity a crisis. I'm still not following, alien, and you'd better watch your words here, the general warned, to which I gave a confident smirk. Humans need to save us. End of chapter. Chapter 7 Save you? Quite so. And how do you propose we do that, Doctor? My eyes splattered for a moment as I felt myself lean forward in exhaustion. It had been a full rotation since we made contact with the General at his forces. I was stunned that this human's endurance... Humans seemed to be far better and keeping them alert with little sleep than the Valan were. Were it not for him engaging me directly, 
I may have met the same fate as three of the five soldiers alongside me, each one laying their head down on the desk, resting. Skaana also seemed to have fallen prey to exhaustion, barely able to shake her soldiers awake during this trying time. I don't think she was expecting us to be sitting around talking for a full rotation. This mission was simple, but humans were not. I used my forearms to rub my eyes to prevent them from sealing shut while in discussions with the general. He needed answers to what my plan would be. In truth, my plan mattered very little. It was somewhat surprising the general was so receptive to talking to me and listening to my plans regarding his species. I was a biologist. I had no military, diplomatic, or cultural experience amongst my own kind, let alone an entirely different species. Was it all because I took the same? You know, General, I said, clearing my throat, before I go into detail, yeah, why did you wish to speak to me? Did we not have enough diplomats to meet you? I asked. The General, somewhat taken aback by my comment, you were the one who took the sample and studied it, weren't you? He asked, lifting one of his furrowed eyebrows in a puzzled expression. Why wouldn't I talk to the one who knew the most about us? Why wouldn't I talk to the one who knew all of our weaknesses? I wobbled for a moment. Did he say their weaknesses? I was exhausted, under the mercy of Earth's gravity, and growing increasingly bored with the constant planning. But something about what he said seemed to throw me off. Something about what he said seemed so very strange. My tired eyes warmed into a squint, purple irises gazing in on his somewhat wrinkled face. I had no reason to mistrust the general, but I had many reasons to dislike him. This taste mixes with distrust quite well, I'm afraid, and I found my brain quickly making excuses to further question him about what was spoken. What makes you think that I even remotely considered your uh, weaknesses? I asked, leaning forward to place my chin on my palms, claws resting on the scales of my face, scales changing to a dull orange. The general grew a smirk, giving a faint laugh. It is my job to be paranoid, doctor, he said nodding in self-reassurance. I'm getting a bit sloppy in my age, but I still can assume the worst in most situations, he stated. There it was again, assuming the worst. I started to grow far more irritated. No, this general's question about my plan could wait. I found my exhausted state granting me bravery I did not have before. You assume the worst in most things, your own species included, I asked, growing increasingly more agitated. What makes you so bitter, General? What makes you so quick to mistrust? More, he stated plainly, his furry, grey upper eye fur furrowing into his expression of irritation. Like I said, people will do anything to anyone if they're cornered and back against the wall. Humans are especially guilty of this, he said, taking in a swift breath through his nostrils. Fight on the few war fronts and you'll see what I mean. It's every man for himself. I audibly groaned, rubbing my face. Every man for himself. You keep saying that as if it's a concrete truth. Without your troops, your scientists, or your commanders, you wouldn't be sitting in that chair. You cooperate every day, I said, dropping my hands to the table and simply looking at the man. I'm sorry, I thought we were starting to get to know the way things were on this world here. Do I need to show you what's happening outside again, hmm? Then it's chaos out there, and all those scientists, commanders, and troops are paid in both respect and resources to do their work. Take away either and they'd quit, he said. My scales fluctuated between red and orange. Things slowly started to become clearer the more tired and the farther away from my bed I became. That won't be necessary, but maybe I should see the world for myself, General, I said, my tone dripping with accusation. If this General wanted to prove his point, maybe I should see the world with my own eyes before I started, as Skaresh would say, playing as the gods. Why was I being held so far underground? Why was the General smoking that fell roll of dried plants in a closed space? Why was he only showing me, whenever he displayed something on those monitors, the chaos outside. It was at that moment that I realized the general was trying to warp my view of humanity. The general was actively trying to convince me from the moment we met face to face his views were correct. He was playing me. I said it once and I'll say it again. Humans are very clever.
My scales quickly shifted from the orange-red hue of irritation to a bright green tone. Panic struck me quite quickly. Skaana noticed my changing color, her own drowsiness subsiding and her attention being drawn back to the human general once again. The general narrowed his eyes at me, that chip of smile slowly fading away. You'll be killed out there. I promise you there'll be some maniac that wants to see you dead, he said. His tone grim. I will take that risk, I replied, swallowing down my nose. I am not taking that risk. You die and there's a war we won't win, he replied. Just tell me that plan you were thinking up, doctor, and we'll get to work here where it's safe. I am not saying anything until I discuss it with my leaders first. You'll need to cooperate. The longer we wait, the more damage is done. Tell me what you were thinking up, or I'll get someone to make you tell me, he said. Oh dear. Scar honor, I muttered, the warrior needing no further instruction as she grinned down at the general, her scales turning a bright orange-blue. It's about time, Lan. Tell me when, she said in a low tone. Oh, how quickly things turned. When once there were peaceful talks, the very slightest hint of mistrust made it all crumble apart. Except there wasn't any trust. It was just a man taking advantage of a peaceful race to get what he wanted. If he truly believed what he said was objectively true, I would have been escorted out, or at the very least kept somewhere beside some underground bunker. We played right into the general's hands. Every single Valan. The general took in a breath to say something, but a sudden rumble in the bunker made everyone in the room a lot less focused on the rising tensions. The general looked around, quickly rising up, looking around to his men. What the hell is going on? Report! He barked out. The soldier quickly ran up, his face pale, his eyes wide, and his legs trembling. He nearly collapsed under his own weight. The general gripped him by the fatigues and looked at the scared man straight in the eyes. Report, Abbott! Can't be an earthquake, so tell me what the hell is going on! The soldier took in a quick breath. The whole room fell silent. Sir, sir, sir uh, turn on the news. The general scowled, grabbing the remote and turned on the monitor that he'd showed me earlier. That's when we saw it. It was the pride and joy of the Valan people. The grand chariot, the bringer of civilization, cradle of Valar. It was the high command of Valar in a spherical ship the size of the fourth red planet, right beside Earth's moon. I thank the gods that the ship had state-of-the-art grav suppressors so that no orbits were thrown out of alignment. To these cosmic bodies, such a grand vessel wouldn't have even been felt. It was a pinnacle of Valar space-bearing engineering. Such a grand display would only have been meant one thing, and that one thing made my scales grow bright yellow. You will release our people, and we will talk! A booming, resounding voice echoed through the communication device in my coat, the general slowly turning to look at me, horror and rage in his eyes. I raised my hands, the sleeve of my coat falling slightly to reveal the sigil on it that linked to my comlink's broadcasting feature. Not clear enough, general. End of chapter. Chapter 8. Was this really necessary, Doctor? Quite a while passed in that room, between the sudden understanding by these soldiers that the Valan, despite our hospitable nature, were not to be trifled with, and the fact that it never occurred to them one of us would be recording and transmitting. Everything that was said and done in this place, well, needless to say that General McCullen was not too pleased at his current situation nor the look of satisfaction on my face as I sat in that chair, quite eager to find my bed once more. My job was done. All of my people now knew what trials humanity faced. Although I did feel as if I owed the general an answer to his question, yes, I did feel this necessary. I replied, looking over at Skaana, whose eyes were glued to the monitor showing the pride of Allah, clear as day for anyone to see. We came to you seeking a peaceful understanding. Well, um, that's not correct, I said, leaning forward, trying to give the general my best impression of the insufferable grin that he wore. Your people came to us. They knocked on our door before they even knew our intentions. Do you want to know what the first human we ever met said to us? I asked, canting my head to the side. The general, still lost in planning, 
fail to notice my obvious self-righteousness. For someone who was reading me like a book for the whole rotation, he certainly was having trouble now. Something that wasn't cleared, I'd imagine, the general said, his tone off somewhat. It was not the reaction I was expecting. Perhaps I expected a bit of panic in his tone. The display of power my leaders provided should have given him a hint that we were not to be toyed with. Yet the general's stature did not change. His eyes moved back and forth. He schemed even when faced with demise. Somewhere in that primitive brain of his, he thought of ways to find victory in this. He still felt that there was a way out of this. And for that, I commended him. The general could not know failure. He said that we would be attacked when we first arrived here, and he was right, though I did not expect by someone in a position of power like you. I had hoped that humanity's leadership wouldn't be so uh, cold, I muttered, disappointment dripping from my tone. The general rolled his eyes back, a smirk once again returning to his lips as he peered at me after a brief moment of thought. I am a leader of military operations, but not the leader of the country. The leader of my country has no idea you came here. The leaders of this world had no idea that aliens made land for. Humanity as a whole woke up this morning to see a giant planet of a ship in the sky with no idea why it's there. They have no idea of your location. They have no idea that we intercepted your horribly decrypted messages. You may think yourself a victor here, but to everyone else on this planet, there is no one being held hostage, he said. He's turned far too dark and grim for my liking. My scales turn orange in irritation. So, are you planning on killing me, General? Let your entire world believe my people came here to attack the vastly technologically benign species. My leaders are already likely upset over this. You could very well have damned any chances that our species could get along without heat attentions. Everything in the past few rotation uh, days. Why did you bring us here? What is your goal? Just tell me why, I exclaimed, my scales turning a bright red, the human soldiers pointing the guns upward, ready to fire. And yet, the general raised a hand, the soldiers easing from the battle-ready positions into more neutral stance. I am not going to kill you, he said, closing his eyes. The game's over. I was going to release you sooner, had we not debated for hours regarding the nature of humanity. Had I known our conversation wasn't private, I wouldn't have been more subtle. I acted out of desperation. I wanted something only you could provide, Doctor, he said, reaching into his pocket, his brow firing as he pulled out a picture of a human with no fur on the head. My color swelled in confusion. Now what was the general plotting? The world is a cruel place filled with cruel people that'll step on anyone to get to the top, myself included, he said placing the picture on the table and sliding it forward. You've learned everything about our physiology in a matter of days. You were even able to reverse engineer our immune systems to be able to resist things that it took humans millennia to overcome. With that kind of information, we could have found cures to almost every human disease. We could have overcome the will of God. We could have made this child's life carefree again. In other words, I wanted an alien in my corner so that this bureaucracy crap could have been avoided. He muttered, his brow firing in irritation. General, do you realize how idiotic that is to say? I asked, my scales turning orange once more. We would have gladly given you this information if you'd asked us for it. And how do I know that? How does any human know that? How can you tell me for certain that you come in peace? How does any human know that you are a people of your word? You could win our trust and enslave us with a few shiny gadgets. You could arrive here and change the very way our society works. You could. I tuned out as he began ranting, my scales changing into a deep green of panic. By the gods, the first human I talked to was so paranoid it drove him insane. He rambled on and on about his mistrust, despite our numerous attempts to tell him that we did, in fact, come in peace. We wanted to visit our neighbors and talk to them. Not a single Valon thought about enslaving anyone. My green scales turned violet as I looked at the quickly disheveled man. I realized, after a bit of thought, why he was the way he was. The man was scared. We did represent change. I knew my people well enough. There was no way the more friendly Valar wouldn't take the chance to dig into the emotions of our new neighbors. 
There was no way our people could leave the new things well enough alone. We were an old race, and we needed something new. Humanity was shiny, new, and full of wonder. We simply assumed that our neighbors were just as excited as we were to meet, likely due to the fact of humanity's literally knocking on our ship, wanting entry. We suspected that humans would be nervous, but we never suspected full-on paranoia like this. We embraced the new, unknown things of the universe. This human both wanted to and didn't want to. He wanted to make sure everything safeguard was in place before they moved forward. He wanted to know he always held the upper hand in any potential conflict that arose. This human could not know failure. I tuned back into the general's rambling when the door behind us opened up. The human soldiers immediately went into a standstill, straight positions, raising their hands over their forehead as the woman walked through the doors, her expression seething with anger. The general also slipped out of his rambling, saluting the human woman. I couldn't help but think that humans being sexually dimorphic made it way easier to identify male from female. It was easier than waiting until one heard the prefix of their names. My eyes glanced over to the table as the woman marched forward. Her style, short hair, fur bobbing with every step. I noticed the picture on the table that the general had slid towards me. I took the opportunity to slip it into my coat pocket before it could be noticed. Everyone standing around us so. After I took the picture, I followed suit, standing up and attempting to match the stance of all the humans took. Clearly, this was an individual that reserved respect, and quite frankly, I didn't want to piss off any other humans today. Madam President, the general trailed off, yet he was met with only a snapping of fingers from the younger human woman. Don't, Madam President, me, you son of a bitch. Do you have any idea what you've done? Do you have any idea what craziness is out there? She exclaimed, huffing sliding her hand through her hair as she turned to face me. I'm Debbie McCullen, by the way, she said, her tone frantic, and she turned back to the man. My gaze shifted between the two. They shared the same name. How odd. I did what I thought was necessary, the general replied, to ensure the safety of our people. Then you're supposed to come to me with a game plan. What a part of commander-in-chief don't you understand? You don't go rogue, hiding in this remote shithole, hoping that you're able to weasel technology out of an alien species. Oh yeah, I've gotten to speak with one of the Valan myself. They're not too happy with you right now. It was all I could do to get them to stay on this ship and not invade us for their people that we had no idea were being held captive, she said. Her eyes filled with a rage that no color any Valan could produce could match. I feared for this general's safety. I feared for the safety of the side of the planet. This woman was going to explode with so much hate and anger that all of the cosmos would be warped into resembling a skull. But gods, I was in love. Congress can't agree on anything, and they're all American. How do you expect the world to treat these aliens? What happens if some warlord gets a hold of their technology? What if they figure out how to turn it into a weapon? The general barked, my scales turning bright orange. There he was again assuming that we would just hand out our technology. The nerve of some people. However, despite the general's paranoia, I was starting to become amused that I had the front row seat to a governmental meltdown. I nearly giggled. We figured it out when we crossed that bridge. This is why our leaders need to speak to each other first, you incompetent idiot. Stealing technology now, before diplomatic relations take place, is only going to ensure our plan will be blown out of orbit, she hissed practically seething with the hate for this general. I almost started to feel sorry for the man, if it didn't feel so good that I was right. But then the commander-in-chief, as I knew her, began leaking from her eyes, and she looked at the general, who, during this entire belittlement of his character, stood tall and proud. She placed a finger on his chest, her breasts becoming staggered, and she shook her head. General Patrick McCullen, what you did... Was treason. I have to explain to your granddaughter now that her grandpa is a traitor. You went rogue and put not just us, but the whole world at risk just so that you could feel important. She seethed, pointing at a nearby soldier. I want him arrested. I want these aliens seen out and back to their vessel. Now, she snapped. I sighed in relief, looking to the warrior cast members that were still in the dark about the whole thing. Sagana looked towards me, her scales a dull grey from exhaustion. Are we being attacked now? She asked, huffing. The bride's here, so that means we shoot stuff now, yeah? She muttered. I shook my head. 
giving a faint yawn myself. I am fairly certain we're going to be escorted back to our vessel and seen home now, I said quietly, and Valan, Skarna groaned, standing up. Oh, thank the gods, we're going home. The human soldiers did what they were told, escorting both the warrior cast members and the general out of the room. And yet, something didn't quite sit right with me. Something felt off. My hand moved into my pocket where I could feel the picture I had taken earlier. The general's paranoia was likely one of many voices of a similar opinions. This needed to stop now if the humans were going to trust a Balan. And so, I did something quite foolish. I walked up to the commander-in-chief, currently keeping her composure as best she could. She looked at me, giving me the faintest of smiles, trying to make light of the current situation. I'm sorry that General McCullen kept you here. We're not all like that, I promise you. Humanity is full of good people. Please don't hate us for the actions of one man, she said, her voice raspy and broken. I shook my head, attempting to give a human smile of sympathy as I pulled out the picture. The president's skin turned quite pale as I held it in my hand. The general said that I can help fix this. I think he may have been right, I said, looking down to the woman. The warriors I came with can go home, but I'm here now. Your general had a point. Why shouldn't I use the knowledge I have about your species for some good? In other words, I want to treat this child's condition. The commander-in-chief paused for a moment, looking down at the picture, then looking back at me, completely dumbfounded. Even after all of this, you, you still want to help us, she said. I nodded quite plainly. She laughed, shaking her head, and held the side of her face with a palm. My daughter's in for quite a treat, it seems. I'm willing to trust you, Valan. Oh, well, that explained the name. Chapter 9 You're going to do what, Skalan? It was safe to say that Skaana was not amused as we were escorted back to our shuttle, ready to depart. When I stated that I would be staying behind to assist this one human with medical treatment, the human leader stated that she wouldn't be sending a friend soon before she left. Whatever that meant. Regardless, in hindsight, it really was a foolish thing to offer an outsider. But the idea began brewing in my brain ever since I began talking with General McCullum earlier. He didn't trust us and he had no reason to do so. To think that there was only one human like that out there was foolish, and I was no fool. The native fauna of Earth may have been far more primitive in technology, but they were just as sapient as us, and, by the gods, I would make sure that we're not seen as tyrants. Skarana was the least of my concerns, however, for the High Command in all of their not-so-subtle glory had arrived. I sighed at the thought, looking to Skarana with an irritated color, I am going to appeal to the High Command to be allowed to visit sick humans to treat their medical conditions, I replied, placing my hands behind my back as we strode towards the shuttle. Skaana's scales were turning quite shade of orange, but that orange only turned to green as armed soldiers standing by a strange younger man in a black suit approached us. President McCullum stated that you wanted to help her daughter, he asked, his tone very matter-of-fact. Was this human the leader's friend? Had I not known better, I would have assumed that he was an AI. His movements were robotic and uniform, clothing pressed to near machine quality, and the communications device was hooked into his earlobe stretching down under his coat, strange eye coverings covering his eyes, leaving him looking manufactured. I was jarring to see, especially considering the life humanity displayed before this. The soldiers around him seemed to just be communicating with each other as well, providing minor security if any security at all. Skaana and I grew suspicious. This human was different. I... Yes, I stated, looking at the human with mistrust as I approached the shuttle. I am going to appeal to our leadership after what happened today in order to make a landfall once again. May I ask why you are curious? I asked. The human's expression did not change or falter. He simply stared at me from behind those abyss black eye visors. Sunglasses. Yes, that's what they were. English was hard. We all appreciate it, he said. Despite the compliment, his expression did not shift. His posture perfect. He reached into his inner coat pocket, pulling out a small rectangular card. We already have established contact with Skafana and Scotch, and it's how we found out that you were here. I'm Agent Brown. 
Before you go, I want you to know that you put a huge load of paperwork on my desk that I need to fill out, he said, his perfect emotionless expression breaking for the faintest of smirks to appear on his lips. I bleaked in shock. Agent, paperwork, and contact with both high commanders of the scholarship and diplomacy. Uh, who was this Agent Brown? Right, I muttered, looking at the card. It was simply a number in black ink on white, thick, pulp-based piece of stationery. No name, no organization, just a string of numbers. You are to say you made contact with our leadership already. I'm sorry to say that I'm a bit skeptical of you, Agent Brown. I stated, the general's paranoia, unfortunately, rubbing off on me. I wanted to be on my ship for at least a few days before I placed my life in the hands of humans again. On my trust. I missed my apprentice. I missed my bed. I missed my people. I was homesick after a day. It was somewhat humorous. What wasn't humorous was what the agent said next. The cunning tongue connives the mighty warrior to brave the mountain a brilliant mind needs to map. The agent spoke. I blinked. The human knew the motto of the Valon Academies. Each of the three castes had the role to fill. So, it was a motto that ever enthusiastic headmasters repeated to each other in giant chambers of echoing praise. I suppose we all needed validity that our work was important to someone. Even if it was just overseeing a school to place young nymphs into programs of study and find them mentors. Regardless, the fact that this human knew this little phrase meant that he'd been in talks with our people, just like he said. Likely, such a phrase was passed on to him by high command because, in truth, every Valon knew ad nauseum. It wouldn't be something any human would throw out and give credence to his claims. I apologize for the presumptuous and appreciate for the not-so-subtle clue, Agent Brown. I stated, my scales glowing yellow. If he had talked to those two high in command, then they told him that phrase was to prove that he had, then I found myself wondering why he had approached me to begin with. Funny enough, he would answer my internal question without me even needing to ask. It is no issue. I am actually rather excited to finally meet aliens myself, he said, his professional blank face breaking further, a large smile forming on his lips. It is very hard to act as if this is an ordinary mission, Scalan. I've wanted to meet aliens since I was, um, a hatchling, did you people call it? I liked this human immediately, and the brightness of my scales, colored both yellow and white in relief, demonstrated that. Even Scalana's scales seemed to change colors, except hers changed to ever-growing red tone. Rage. Whatever could she be mad for? The human just explained, Right, she couldn't speak English. Good enough. Scalon, it's almost as if you're being ignoring her for the vast rotation. Ah, uh -huh. <clears throat> this is Agent Brown, Scalana, I said. My scales turning greener and more red of hers became. Needless to say, I started to worry. Mm-hmm. Going native, are we, Scalon? Time for the quills to stand on edge. Keep your composure, Scalon. Don't upset the warrior, Commander. Well, he seems different from the general at the very least. He even said he contacted the High Command. And you believe him? Maybe this little underground bunker will have some blankets and snacks for you. Nailed it. Look, Anna, we kind of made quite an entrance here, I stated, pointing at the sky with a near-planetary ship taking a good portion of the skyline. Anna squinted her eyes, quills risen up, and she hissed at me. She hissed at me. The nerve! Scalon, I'll break all of your limbs and drag you onto that shuttle back to the ship. Mission over. We're going home. I don't care if you want to mate with this human. Get on the shuttle! She glowered. I glanced over to the human, trying to keep my composure. But whatever it was, my exhaustion or my urge to be petty. I sighed, feigning longing. But he's so relatable, and I feel our colors could melt so. And that's when my face met her first. The world around me faded to black and it was sleep time. In hindsight, I probably should have listened to my rational mind while talking to Skaana. It may have spared my face some serious swelling and pain. As I slowly returned to the realm of the living, my hand moved to the left side of my face. Cursing myself, that warm sting filled my head. My vision was somewhat blurry, but I knew the left side of my face would be discolored from bruising for quite some time. Gathering my senses, I looked around, my vision began to clear. The room I was in was very brightly lit, and the bed I was on was absurdly soft. Soft to the point that I did not want to leave. 
I sank into the soft white sheets where that fluffy warm blanket soothed my roughed up form. The sped was light years ahead of my own, and for a brief moment, I thought Skaana killed me in one enraged punch, and Resh was right about the afterlife. It was paradise. Comfy, are we? A familiar, veiled voice called out from the corner of the brightly lit room. I sat up in my bed, begrudgingly, mind you, to see Agent Brown looking at some tiny monitor in his hand that looked like an awful lot like my own communication device. The room was outstanding in decor, bright, warm colors, large windows letting the light of Earth's star shine in. I groaned in pain, rubbing my face as my nerves writhed in swollen agony. What did they feed those warriors? Trying to be. Why am I here? Where is here? Where is Skarna? Um, that soldier that hit me. I asked, blinking, grinding my teeth to stomach the pain. Agent Brown shrugged his shoulders. I'm not entirely sure, Skalan, he said. His face emotionless as he played around on his phone. But after I explained to her what was going on, she understood the situation and reported back to her superiors. After seeing to her sprained wrist, uh, she hit you uh, very hard, he said, his expression unmoving. I blinked. What did he say? Wait, you explained to her. She doesn't know English, I said, causing the agent to shrug his shoulders, tapping away at his tiny monitor, unflinching, unmoving. I know, I spoke to her in Valan, he said, causing my scales to turn deep blue. Wait, wait, um, you speak Valan, I asked. The agent nodded, the light of the stars shining into the night black hair. My scales turned a bright orange in frustration. Why didn't you tell me that, Agent Brown? I exclaimed, groaning as the strain made the swelling of my face pound through my head. He proceeded to chuckle, yet displayed no change in personality. You never asked, he replied plainly. I rolled my eyes, shaking my head. How did you learn, then? I asked. It was at this moment he placed his monitor down. The man in the dark sunglasses, looking right into my general direction, his expression changed into a knowing and horrifying smirk. What do you think we've been doing since you've arrived, twiddling our thumbs? He asked, placing a hand under his chin, that smirk remaining. You think the Valan are the only species that can learn languages incredibly quickly under pressure. You, Valan, already provided translations. We just put them into practice. It's a beautiful language, really, he said, in the Valan tongue. He was heavily accented, mind you, but he spoke it. Humans started to look a lot less incompetent and a lot more frightening now. End of chapter. I glared at Agent Brown, eyeing him in suspicion. Something was off about all of this. His sudden understanding of our language didn't make any sense. I'd spent over 100 Earth years in pursuit of knowledge, study came very, very easily to one such as me. But this primitive was a youth even by his own species standard. How in the hells was he able to learn the complexities of an alien tongue so quickly? Furthermore, how was he able to even find our location? Was it the general's sloppiness? I'm sure the human was reading the colors on my scales. A soft chuckle coming from his chest as he took off his sunglasses placing them in his jacket pocket. I'm starting to think that you underestimate our capacity to adapt, Skolan, he said, those crystal blue eyes staring right into mine, his face utterly emotionless, as per usual. Purely, as someone who has studied our genome and physiology, you should know that humans can adapt to many different environments. We have people native to tundras and deserts, should it come as any surprise learning another language came quickly too? He asked. I shook my head. Agent Brown, I had the assistance of artificial intelligence guiding my study after thousands upon thousands of simulations, tests, and translations were run. He can't be too old for a human. Consider it my own innate curiosity getting the better of me. But I'd assume you had a lot of help yourself in order to not only learn my language, but also knowing our location and how to communicate with my high command without the general knowing. You humans have secrets within secrets, even from each other. If we're going to work together as a species, then it might be prudent not to be so secretive. I was half expecting some large monologue to erupt from the agent, 
similar to how it did from the general when I pressed him for questions. Instead, I was met with only silence. The silence hung in the air for what felt like a full rotation, until, finally, the human's emotionless face broke, revealing an almost sympathetic smile, followed by a faint sigh. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right, Skalan, he said, catching me quite off guard. Although I'd argue anything I'd say could be interpreted as a lie, I think that it'd be pretty stupid of me to lie to one of the few aliens that aren't looking at humanity as a monster at the moment, he said, his eyes narrowing for a moment. Again, the general made sure that there was a huge pile of paperwork on my desk, kind of surprised he didn't get us blown up either, but I'm digressing. He said, standing up, stretching. Well, I'll start with me. I work for the United States government, kind of like the general, though my career specialty is intelligence. He said, giving me a faint smile and a shrug of his shoulders. The second your ship arrived here, Scalon, my team and I went to work trying to find out how to broadcast to you. Turns out, General McCullum found your mess of a primitive signal first. The General's tackies over there did a pretty good job covering the tracks, proxies, private network, personal encryption codes. The General was planning this out for a long time, considering. The paranoid bastard already had a plan if aliens came to Earth, he said, laughing, shaking his head. Overall, though, it was a slip-up by my department. Wouldn't be the first time that we were slapped in the face, though. Can't tell you how many times our species almost broke out into nuclear war with fission-based warheads because our technology was moody that day, he muttered, causing my scales to turn an aghast blue from how bluntly and calmly he put that. Nuclear war was no joking matter. As soon as nuclear potential was discovered by my own species, we shelved that technology in pursuit of less destructive sources of power. Technology, now that I was a bit apprehensive of discussing with the human that so casually put nuclear war. Regardless, once your giant mothership showed up at our doorstep and broadcasted to every receiver under the sun, it was pretty hard not to figure out where the general locked you up. It took us a few hours to get there, another few just to ensure the president would be safe when we arrived, and then another to scream at the boys in uniform to get them to admit where you were. There are some military operations that are hidden from the president's eyes, but I didn't tell you that, he said, smirking, walking over to the wall near me and leaning against it. I sighed, slowly discarding the fluffy white blanket that I was wrapped in as I sat up, looking over to the agent in irritation. Secrets within secrets. How does your government even run efficiently with so many secrets? I asked. My curls growing rigid, my scales glowing orange. You hide everything from your citizens, from your leaders. How do you even function not trusting people? I asked, genuinely curious and furious at the species. The agent only provided a quick laugh. Never trust anybody wearing a nicer suit than you. That's why I wear this one, the agent said, rubbing his eyes. I visibly cringed at the sight. So much bacteria was on his hands, how could he not fear for his health? Thankfully, the human didn't notice. Humanity is a mixed bag, if you'll pardon the expression. More often than not, you can give people the benefit of the doubt. Sadly, it's people like me that make things pretty rough for trusting others, he said, sighing, looking out the window. <sighs> Frankly, I really shouldn't be telling you any of this, but if you want my opinion, it's not like anything I'd tell you is going to matter anyway. The way our world runs is over. Make way for the space age. My irritation faded, and my curiosity grew. I leaned forward on the bed to listen to what he was saying. What do you mean your world is over? It's not like we represent the end of your time of your species. You just know you aren't alone anymore. I stated plainly, perhaps a bit naively. I was spurring on the human. To put it simply, I just wanted to know more. I needed a second opinion on why humanity was the way it was. The cackle the agent provided was somewhat a shock, however. <laughs> There's a giant space station orbiting the planet right now. Aliens are at our doorstep. Petty things like, this country said this and that country is planning that. 
really doesn't mean anything anymore, now that we know for sure that super fast space travel isn't just possible. There's already people doing it. People are starving out there, Skalan. How many Valan starve in the streets? He asked, raising his eyebrows. The color of my scales dimmed. It happens, but, but not often, I muttered. And when it does happen, it's due to the nature of the planet we're colonizing, not from negligence. We make absolutely sure all of our people are fed, clothed, and bathed. No one fails in Valan society. And I replied, only causing the agent to laugh even harder. Oh, space communism! <laughs> Fascinating! He exclaimed. Communism? The humans clearly saw my confusion. A smirk residing on his face. Let me guess, your government distributes food, materials, and necessities amongst your people, right? Well, uh, yes, I stated. Based on what a colony needs, we try to send the necessary equipment and materials for survival as well as additional surplus so that there is something to do other than work, I stated somewhat proudly, causing the human to hum, his eyes squinting. And there are no disputes. No one tries to steal from anyone to have more, he asked. No colonies complaining about other colonies having more. If the colonies on one planet are having a rough time, do they get more supplies? If so, how do more stable colonies react to it? No, I replied plainly. There are criminals that are detained, but they are rehabilitated, and once we figure out what is wrong, we work to solve that person's issues to the point that they can function again in society. Every Valar knows that our species can only progress if we all work together for it. No individual is above another. They simply take more responsibilities as they grow more capable. Those responsibilities come with proper titles and recognition, I said with pride. Let me get this straight. You devote resources to one individual to make sure they get everything they need to succeed. No one takes advantage of that, he asked, pressing the issue. No Valon ever takes advantage of the generosity of their government to make out like a king. Not a single soul. My scales dimmed further. My shoulders sank. A few do, I said, sighing. But they are not, Balan. If it is decreed that they are true detriment to our society, they are made castless. The Valan have no failures. Rest assured, the statistics on those that are castless are slim to that they are erased. Agent Brown said, but not in a condescending or angry tone, despite the statement he unleashed. Every Valan is a worker bee, and your lead is a queen bees. A defective bee is no good to the hive, he said, taking in a quick breath, raising his eyebrows. Again, human terminology was lost in me, but with the term hive, I got the impression he thought of us as mindless drones. He waved his hands. Your species is weird. It's understandable, but really bizarre for a species like us. Humanity wouldn't like it that much. We love your technology, but once they see your darker side, you'll be hated by a lot of people, he said. My scales burnt orange in irritation. So there is no chance for our species to get along. Are our mentalities so different? I asked, causing the agent to shrug his shoulders. Yes and no. If I had my guess, everyone's different. I personally don't see any problem with you guys. I think that we'd get along great, he said, smirking. Just letting you know, you can't please everyone. You'll be criticized no matter what you do. Especially since your society so closely resembles that dreaded communism on Earth. I have a solution to that, though, he said, tossing a pair of metallic objects into the air after retrieving them from his coat pocket, catching them midair. And what would that be? I asked, growing suspicious. It's hard to hate anyone that helps sick kids. Our Mother Mary's is a children's hospital close to our location, too. You already said that you wanted to help out the president's sick daughter. But why fix one little girl when there are plenty of other kids that could use a friendly alien making their lives better? Humans can be real scumbags. But get a couple bedridden kids walking again. I'm pretty sure you'll make some politicians and a certain general scramble to come up with reasons to hate you. Agent Brown said, walking towards the cream-colored door. You may need to get ready for some noise first, he said, chuckling. Why? I asked as he opened the door, leading to a wooden area surrounding a block of artificial stone with a few ground-based shuttles and other men in very impressive suits talking into small devices around the area. 
You'll be the first Milan to be introduced to the public. My people are working to make sure everything's secure. But there's going to be screams and shouting. We'll do everything in our power to keep you safe, Scalan. But there's going to be chaos. Can you handle a bunch of rowdy humans? He asked. My scales turned a bright yellow as I got out of bed, walking behind the human. I took a punch from a former partner of mine. I think I can manage some primitives, I said, humming in amusement. The human laughed in response, putting his sunglasses back on as he stepped outside. Even in space, hell has no fury like a... Wait, what was that a woman? It's hard to tell with your kind. You're clever, human. You figure it out, I said, following him outside and to the passenger side of his land shuttle. The high difference between the Valon and humanity was quite apparent. It was like trying to stuff myself into a can as I squeezed into the shuttle after opening the door. This shuttle did smell quite pleasant, though. Beard fecking aliens, he muttered, taking safety harness from the side of the pilot seat and buckling it in before starting the engine. I jumped in my seat from the sheer volume of the black shuttle's engine. The sudden surprise reminded me of something, a question unanswered. Agent Brown, you never did tell me how you were able to learn our language so fast, I said, eyes squinting in suspicion, especially once he gave me a faint laugh and a grin in return. You're a clever alien, Scalon. You figure it out, he said, having the shuttle reversed from its parked position in front of the small building we were in before driving off on the paved road. End of chapter. Chapter 11 I learned a lot about humans and Earth in the few days I had been there. They are rash, headstrong, and their opinions on their leaders differ from person to person. While my species was mostly unified, these people seemed to take pride in what sets them apart. I first began to notice it when Agent Brown and I reached the nearest city to the location of the tiny cavern where my Earth bed was located at. Different parts of the city would have varying architecture and in different states of repair as well. Loud sirens blared in the air as cars raced to and from the many streets. Some of their homes, from what I could tell, would have different colors of flags by the portals inside of their homes. They were flags. Having a flag wasn't an alien notion to me. After all, most of Alon had at least one flag somewhere that represented their caste. But the humans were completely different. Humans had more flags with more colors than I could count. It made sense, though, given how different each human was from each other. Even with all of these flags, however, most of their patterns were bland. Portions of the flag would be a whole color, followed by another color and a third. Maybe there was a sigil on the flag somewhere, but for the most part, it was as if someone painted three lines on some fabric and proclaimed that they were done. It was somewhat lazy compared to the intricacies of the land flags. But it would be best not to openly voice those opinions while surrounded by these ruffians. Did the Valan have music, Scalon? Agent Brown asked, his hands on the guiding wheel of his land shuttle as we moved through the city streets. I turned my head, looking at him in confusion. Of course, we have music. We're not uncultured. We have art, music, and performing arts. It's not like our entire society dropped beauty in the name of scientific and engineering progress, I said, crossing my arms, sinking a bit into my seat. Well, at least trying to. I'll freely admit I was a bit too tall for human vehicles. I wasn't saying you did, Agent Brown said, his hand reaching over to the center console of the shuttle. Want to listen to some human music? Human music? My head tilted to the side, eyeing the human agent with an inquisitive and, dare I say it, anticipatory look. Why, yes. Yes, I did want to listen to human music. The more I thought of it, the more that I realized that, with an entirely different culture, humans would have entirely new, different, and interesting art to share. My quills rose and my scales turned yellow. I was positively giddy at the thought, even as we made our way towards a hospital filled with sick children. I was going to get a taste of human music. Why, yes, I would love to hear some human music. I never hoped to have another human grin at me the way Agent Brown did in that moment. 
All right, I'll let you listen to the music I have here. Let's try something timeless, he said, fingers gracing the touchscreen on the center. It took my eyes a while to catch up with what the screen was displaying. First, it sorted by genre. Then he chose rock. Finally, the artist was selected. Someone called Led Zeppelin. Was, um, it intentionally spelled. Did humans name their children after metals? How very peculiar. Yet, as soon as he pressed the play button on the touchscreen, my perception of humanity was forever changed. Their music was barbaric, and their humans ate it up. Loud crashing metals, followed by distorted electrical strings, echoed into the shuttle at a volume that would make anyone's ears bleed. My hands clutched over my own as I swiftly changed into a near-neon green with panic. Not only did this maniac have some diabolical wailing, screaming madness playing out into the shuttle, but he only seemed to grow angrier as the song went on. He sang along with the music, looked over to me occasionally, and then proceeded to sing some more. Were I not already crammed into this car like a sardine, I would have probably curled into a ball and waited for death. Needless to say, I was not a fan of Led Zeppelin. Really? Agent Brown asked, swiftly turning down the volume of that god's awful noise. He seemed a bit upset as he looked straight ahead. Well, at least as upset as Agent Brown could look. Whenever he displayed too much emotion, it was fairly jarring. Yet, from what I could see, Agent Brown looked rather displeased with my distaste. Was it that bad to listen to? All I heard was metallic rigging and garbage through the sound system, Agent Brown. If that's the best humanity has to offer with music... I'll stick with Milan music, I said, looking straight ahead. I was a bit shocked, honestly, that none of the humans on the sidewalk seemed to notice that there was an alien in the shuttle that was playing loud, vile music. Those darker windows really did assist in keeping unwanted eyes away, it would seem. Metallic ringing and garbage, he asked, appalled at my statement as the hospital came into view in the distance. What next, Galan? Gonna tell me to do my homework and go to bed early for church in the morning. What? I questioned. Church? Homework? My question only seemed to make the human cackle while he proceeded to make his way to the large stone structure, where many, many humans had their own land shuttles stationed. Nothing, old man. Nothing at all, he said. Pulling up to a barricaded lot where a man in an all-gray uniform with a yellow badge on the right sleeve. Agent Brown didn't even have to step out of the shuttle to greet this human before the barricade was lifted. Then he drove into the forbidden lot, which was filled with land shuttles of far better quality than most of the ones I saw on the way here. I looked towards Agent Brown to ask why, but as he parked his shuttle in a yellow outline and powered down the engine, the only thing I could think of was stretching my legs. I immediately opened the shuttle door, unfastened my safety harness, and lurched out of the shuttle, the gravity still taking its toll on my body as I stumbled on the stone floor. Agent Brown stepped out the shuttle next, humming as he closed the door behind him, moving to me and shutting mine for me. Hope you're ready for a lot of questions and premature balding, Scalon, Brown mused, chuckling softly. I've dealt with hatchlings before, Brown. I'm sure I can handle small, sick humans, I replied. Agent Brown drew his hand towards the entrance of the hospital. Then by all means, prove it. The hospital has been secured. Let's see you handle it. I swallowed, my green scales brilliantly shining. Surely, human children wouldn't be too much to handle. Right? Right? By the... God, if I thought the rock music was loud, nothing, I repeat, nothing in the vast cosmos of everything could match the sheer volume of a shrieking human child. This place was filled with many screaming human children. Sure, it was understandable why they were so excited. I was a new exciting thing in a world filled with new and exciting things. It was what made children so endearing. The eagerness to explore and learn new things. But human children, they were all of that with a dash of mania and energy. 
Yet those were the ones that could walk and talk, as I was led by some of the very timid staff towards their own quarters, so that I could wash and be made sterile. I saw some of the worst cases. Bedridden children. Children unable to breathe on their own. Children unable to eat on their own. Children whose organs were fading faster than the human doctors could fix. It was a bittersweet environment. Even as these children withered away, not a single one seemed to lose hope. They wouldn't die. There wasn't a soul in this hospital resigned to their own death, even if their prognosis told the opposite. Even human children could not know failure. There were many eyes and hushed whispers around me. Agent Brown kept a close eye on me, as well as a few other security guards that patrolled the area. I would be unharmed. Still, I was somewhat confused as to how they all had all of their equipment at the ready for me. Agent Brown had worked quickly, it would seem. Still, it was somewhat jarring that they had gloves made in respect to my own anatomy. They fit quite nicely, and the entire time I sterilized and made myself ready for examination, the snagging feeling of something not quite being right filled my mind. It was all far too convenient. When I was fully prepared to meet with the first child, a little girl struggling with bone marrow mutation, I was handed a fully documented chart on her case history, as well as having a human doctor tell me all about her condition. I wasn't quite paying attention to begin with, but as the doctor continued, my interest slowly shifted away from the chart I was studying to the human's explanation. This was someone who had no advanced hardware or software to read into genetic anomalies of patients with cases like this. And yet, this woman whose hair was grey as a cloud knew nearly every single detail of the disease this child suffered from. A disease known as acute lymphocytic leukemia. A mutation was a mutation, no matter what you decided to call it. So, she has been taking well to the chemo so far, the doctor said her nerves seeming to ease as she gazed at the patient. A little human child, female, who had lost all of her hair due to the only treatment available. It was obliterating her body, this chemotherapy, and I was getting more and more disgusted the more I learned about it. Well, considering you are actually bombarding this child's body with toxins and radiation, I'd say she looks pretty good. I muttered from behind my mask, eyeing the chart once more. I sighed, looking over to the doctor, my scales orange. May I attempt to treat her doctor? I asked, looking behind us for a moment to see the crowd of doctors and staff simply staring at me. What? Hadn't these primitives seen a Valan scholar before? The doctor sighed, smiling sadly as she looked at the sleepy, bald girl. I really wish I could say yes, she sighed, giving a mournful tone. I'd love nothing more than to have some actual angel swoop in here and save all of these kids. It'll get them out of this damned hospital. Then maybe give me some vacation time, she teased, giggling lightly. Unfortunately, for safety purposes, I can't let you do that. One look at you and I can see a doctor. We know our own kind. But if you screw up and that little girl dies, not only is this entire hospital at risk, but I have to live with the guilt of knowing I let some alien come in here and treat our children she admitted, turning around to peer at me with sad, beautiful blue eyes. So you are saying you don't trust me? I asked, wondering why I was brought all the way here to help treat these children if the doctors would tell me no the second I arrived here. You said you know I'm a doctor. Why not trust me? Aside from making a uh, not-so-subtle entrance, what have I done to not earn your trust that not only do I mean no harm, but I could very well save this girl's life, I said. I think I touched a nerve. You could save her life, but you don't know, the doctor replied, crossing her own arms. Her gaze shifted to the quickly growing crowd, the tisk following suit. Don't you all have patience to see as well? She asked, and like actual magic, the large crowd scattered to the winds into different rooms of the hospital. It didn't stop some of the human children that could move freely from peeking their heads out of the doorways to stare at me. But at this point, I was used to being stared at. I do know 
I replied, keeping my tones soft and as non-hostile as I could. It's a mutation. I've treated them before in my own species, I announced, causing the senior to laugh. Oh, have you now? Well, Scalon, was it? Tell me what I haven't heard from forty years of practicing medicine. Tell me how you would treat this, she demanded, leaning against the doorframe as if I was the one that made this child sick to begin with. I rolled my eyes, growing ever more tired of the hostile tones of nearly every human I met. I reached into my lab coat pocket, pulling free the phylactery I hid in my belongings before I was taken by the general. This is a biomaterials collection device. We call it a phylactery, I said, reaching into my other inner lab coat pocket to pull free my communications beacon, using it to link to my workstation in my ship. Each phylactery comes with a microscopic nanomachines capable of doing certain tasks within the body. Normally, they just pull apart the genetic information in a collected organic sample. But if they are, say, injected with proper instructions given to them, then they will fix the issue and be safely excreted out of the body when their task has been completed, I explained, looking over to the doctor who seemed, much to my surprise, understanding my explanation. I see. So you inject your nanomachines into the patient, and those nanomachines correct the error in the DNA causing the mutation? She questioned. I nodded in reply, causing the doctor to stare at the phylactery while I went about linking my mini workstation to it, retooting the medical nanomachines to do as I asked. I already have the basic template for human genetic structure on my workstation, so any blatant red flags such as tumors or mutations in the bone marrow should easily be picked up and removed, I stated looking to the doctor with a pleading look. If the girl dies under my care, by all means, have me killed, or whatever it is your humans do with criminals. Just take my word. I can fix this human. The doctor looked at me, biting her lower lip in frustration and nervousness. Several years of training were going down the drain for her if she let me go through with this. Yet another thought crossed my mind as she debated whether or not to let me treat a patient. Besides... It was kind of the whole reason I was brought here. Do you really want to waste the agent's time? I asked, nodded my head over to Agent Brown, who was busy tapping away in his own communication device. Somehow the man knew that we were talking about him, one of his hands rising into the air as he gave the faintest of waves before becoming absorbed into his own electronic activities once again. I sighed in disdain. Way to be intimidating, Agent Brown. Were it not for these agents storming into my hospital and telling my doctors that some alien was going to be coming in to look at the sick kids here, I would have had you escorted out already, but... She trailed off, sighing herself, following with a shake of her head. You were given government clearance to treat human patients. I can disapprove all I want, but at the end of the day, the government wants you here. And if you're willing to help... She trailed off once more, resigning herself to her decision. I don't see why you can't at least try to help she muttered. And with that, the recalibration of the nanomachines and the phylactery was set to eliminate any malignant mutations found in the human body when compared to the base genetic structure taken from the first human sample we gathered. I activated the phylactery, the needle extending outwards as I walked into the room. As I did so, the poor, bald, sick human girl opened her eyes to look at me. They were a vibrant green and wide as the system stars as she finally realized who she was looking at. You're a... you're an alien, she whispered, her voice raspy and weak. My scales turned bright violet while I nodded in response. No, no creature deserved the kind of pain she was going through. I looked at her bedridden form for a few brief moments before I decided to do something unsanitary. I lowered my medical mask, revealing my face to the human child. I am, I replied, the girl giggling in response. You sound weird, she chirped, giggling profusely. It was a relief to see someone as sick as she was in such high spirits. Were any of our hatchlings subjected to the treatment these human doctors gave to children with her condition? Well, a weak voice and being restricted to bed rest would be the best results that we could hope for. I know. I do sound weird, I muttered, taking a few steps forwards, the claws on my feet tapping softly against the floor. Her green eyes stared holes into me, as if she was looking into my very soul as I approached. You're pretty too, she beamed, showing off a big smile and her juvenile set of teeth. I'm happy they sent a lady alien here. 
Lady Eighty. Humans with their sexual dimorphism. I gave a faint laugh as I looked at the phylactery in my hand, making sure everything was ready and sterile for administering the dose of nanomachines to the sick girl. I'm a male, uh, boy alien, I corrected, laughing once more as I approached. The girl blinked, looking at me with confusion. But you're too pretty to be a boy, and your voice is too high. Do all boy aliens look like purple girl lizards? She asked. My scale shifted to a deep blue, my head turning around outside, where I saw the senior medical staff all cackling at the doorway. Did my species really look that much like what humans perceived as a woman? We all had the same body type. We were not as bulky as human males were. I sighed audibly, shaking my head. Yes, I could see where the human girl was coming from. Well, most of my kind do look very similar. How girls and boys look mostly the same, I said, trying to keep my composure despite the immature giggling from the adults in the hospital. The girl's eyes widened, filling with what I could only assume was childlike wonder. Really? You're all that pretty, she asked, growing giddier and giddier. I wish I was like that, she muttered, her giddiness fading into what I assumed was sorrow. I dealt my head as the dosage of mana machines finished calibrating to treat the small human. You do? I asked, tilting my head to the side as my scales swiftly changed back to the remorseful violet. Why do you want to be like us? I asked, trying my best to give my softest voice possible. Don't you think we're strange? No, uh, I think you're pretty. You have long hair and change colors. It's so cool, she exclaimed causing my scales to swirl with yellow in joy. Out of all the humans I've met, it was a sick child that made me feel the most welcome on Earth. I looked at your records to see how you were sick. Your name is Lily, right? I asked, laying one of my hands on the bed. She looked at my gloved hand curiously for a moment, prodding at the scales under the synthetic material with a small index finger. Mm-hmm, she replied eyes glued to my swirling violet and yellow scales. Well, my name is Galan, but you can call me Lad, because we're friends, I chimed in, causing the girl's eyes to widen and look up at me with wonder. We are? she asked, as I took her arm in my hand. I nodded quickly, the yellow on my scales growing brighter. We sure are, I reassured, taking the phylactery and placing the end towards the arm. I'm going to help you make you feel better, too. So, make sure you hold very still, I instructed. She nodded quickly, her body going rigid as she attempted to toughen up for a new alien friend. It was an adorable sight. In a flash, the needle of the phylactery jammed into her flesh, administering a dose of nanomachines, and withdrew into a sterilizing compound in the phylactery before Lily had time to react to the puncture. She blinked a few times, looking at her arm, then at me then back at her arm again. Did... did... did you help? She asked, somewhat confused. I blinked in surprise. Did she not feel it? I couldn't help but chuckle. Deja vu hitting quite quickly after remembering that the astronaut didn't even flinch from the same needle either. I did. You did really well, I exclaimed. The girl smiling once more before giving off a yawn. Hey, you, you said you wanted to be an alien, right? I asked giving the girl a compassionate look. She nodded softly, head resting on her pillow again. Sleep would claim this girl soon as the nanomachines went to work. Uh-huh, she replied. I stood up, checking my phylactery to ensure that it was sterilized before placing it in my lab coat pocket once more after the needle had retreated back into its rest. Then how about an alien name? I mused. She nodded quickly, causing me to give a faint laugh at the sight of the tired girl's unyielding excitement. <laughs> Whenever you talk to an alien like me, you can tell them Scholar Scalon said your name for us is Scalili. Okay? I asked, moving back towards the doorway. She nodded, her eyes slowly closing, but a smile remaining on her lips as sleep claimed the cancer-ridden girl. As I walked outside of her room, I looked towards the medical director that had spoken to me before, my scales turning completely yellow. So, give it about a quarter of a rotation to her. Six hours, and the mutation should be gone, I said, 
causing her jaw to drop. Six hours? Six hours. She paused, shrugging her shoulders as she pointed down the hall. Well, if you're right and she passes our tests in six hours, mind helping us with the other kids here? She requested, giving me a hopeful look. The first look of compassion and camaraderie I saw from an adult that questioned my species' intentions. I looked down the hall and my scales turned green. There must have been hundreds of rooms in this medical facility. Surely they didn't mean for me to do everything tonight. Yes, they did mean for that. Humans are, if anything, uh, quite impatient. End of chapter. Chapter 12 I was so hungry, tired, and thirsty. Did humans ever stop working? I swear, I'd been here in this human medical facility for nearly an entire day, and I've seen the same humans running to and from the patients that I had not seen yet to treat. Some humans even slept here. There were beds set up in certain areas where fully clothed, exhausted humans would collapse and leak from their eyes. Well, medical professionals always treated so poorly. My phylactery was running low on nanomachines to help correct many of the genetic illnesses that I could treat. Localized mutations could be treated and disposed of, but uh, full-body mutations. It'd take more than a few nanomachines and some biotechnical know-how to correct their issues. And it wasn't easy, telling these children whose friends had been treated that I could do nothing to aid them. At least, not with better medical equipment that these primitives did not have available. I was a violet lamp with how brightly my scales shone in morning. But there was nothing I could do without approval from high command. Make no mistake, these were children. And my soul wept for their plight. But we were visitors here. It was still up for our leaders to decide if we were truly welcome and how far our generosity would extend. Part of me I was even nervous about any remnants of the nanomachines I used being picked up by these clever primitives and used for nefarious purposes by men like the general. I did not underestimate their wits, and the nanomachines would disintegrate after their purpose was done. Their remains cleaned up by these humans' shocking proficiency at toxin cleanup. I truly envied their biology, to an extent. They lived shorter lives than us, but they were far more efficient than us. Their bodies were biologically designed for survival in hazardous environments. Were it not for the weather being relatively forgiving in this location, I would have feared for my safety. I opened up a small hollow terminal from my communications device to record who I treated and what I did. Twelve Earth hours had passed since I first arrived, and my first few patients, Scar Lily included, had already shown vast improvements. Scar Lily was already showing far more energy than she had been before, and the other children seemed to be following suit. I had to hand it to Agent Brown. He was right about how humans would react. Instead of suspicious eyes, many of the human doctors looked to me with awe and thanked me for my service. I made many human friends amongst the medical staff, doctors, nurses, assistants, many names and stories fell upon my ears as I worked. Humans with families with many resources to spend, they gave their children the best educations available for success. Others had to make due with debts and ambition alone to get where they were. Yet, it wasn't just money for many of the staff. I saw more and more of the Lan culture as I found out why these doctors worked in these absurd conditions. The resources paid to them were very, very high for their services. They did what they had to out of compassion, academic pride, and a sense of duty not to any government or society, but to themselves. They were doctors, and as such, they would do whatever was necessary to ensure the survival and livelihoods of these children. Most of their funds came from donations, but there were some medical facilities that needed payment for proper treatment. An idea that stung for me. Did humans really need the necessary funds to ensure payment of these highly trained professionals? I shuddered at the thought. That would be like me asking my superiors for vast sums of much-needed colonial resources 
simply to do my job and ensure the survival of my fellows. It was irritating to think about. But then again, these were humans. I was Valon. I had no right to judge them. I thought about that a lot to keep my mind occupied. I thought of the General, of Agent Brown, and of Chief Physician here, that each came from all different backgrounds. I knew little of Agent Brown, I'll admit, but that is what made things so odd to me. I had met three different people that all represented somewhat similar walks of life to the Valar. The General was the warrior caste, Brown the diplomat, and the Chief Physician the scholar. They were all so different, but the same. Humanity was a strange opposite to the Valon, and that was just with this one human territory, the United States. I had imagined what other countries would be like. I wondered how they were reacting. I was so busy treating the patients, I barely noticed the side conversations going on about my people. It was until my hunger and thirst truly began to take a hold. I frowned, walking to the chief physician, my scales starting to dull from exhaustion. Pardon me, I began. Is there anywhere I can eat some food and drink water? I'm quite famished and have been working for many, many hours, I stated, catching the human off guard as she turned around to face me. Have... have you not had a break, Scalan? she asked, blinking. It was at that time I noticed her name on a laminated badge on her own lab coat. Dr. Gladys Mormheim. Have you really been working for free for twelve hours without food, water, or a break? She asked, her face paling, nearly matching the grey streaks in her hair. I blinked, nodding in confusion. Well, yes. The longer I dally, the longer these children go without treatment, and it is the least I can do to show camaraderie with my new interstellar neighbors, I said, trying my best to offer a human smile. Yet, judging from the reaction, I assume it simply looked jarring. Fair enough. Scalan, she began, lying, her eyes closing. Take a damn break. You've done more for these kids in the past twelve hours than we've done in months. I'd say that deserves a free meal from the cafeteria. Um, can you even eat human food? She asked, blinking. Have you eaten on Earth before? When she asked that question, the realization that I've only been drinking water hit me very, very hard. My stomach twisted into knots, reminding me of my mortality and demanding food. The audible gurgle of the empty stomach echoed loudly outward, causing a few passing human assistants and medical staff to look at me, laughing at the sound. It was at that moment that every human around me pushed and shoved me towards the cafeteria, demanding I eat. I wasn't even sure if I could eat their food. Would it be poisonous? Yet, at this point, I was salivating so much and my stomach growled so loudly that I didn't even care. It was Scalan's turn to throw caution to the wind. I even caught a taste of the general excitement around me as a herd of humans surrounded me and spoke of different kinds of food available at the cafeteria they had. I even caught a glimpse of Agent Brown chatting on his communications device. He blinked one eye at me as my entourage and I passed by. A strange human greeting, to be sure, and I responded with an awkward hand wave. My hand lowered and my gaze flicked between the different humans around me. Apparently, my treatments somewhat cleared up the schedules a bit, with many of the patients showing vast improvements to their health. When we reached the cafeteria, the sense of the place drove my stomach wild. I smelled herbs. I smelled food being cooked. I was relieved to see what the humans ate. Their diet was quite similar to ours. And then... I began to realize my initial fears were a bit misplaced as I approached. Biologically, humans and Valon were very, very similar. Our stomachs produced many of the same enzymes for breaking down food. I actually felt rather foolish for not being able to answer the doctor's question. Regardless, I was uncertain on whether or not some of the spices these humans used to flavor their food would prove hazardous. So perhaps my initial trepidation was not completely unfounded. The humans barked orders at me, telling me what to order and how to have it cooked. There were a few humans behind the counter, looking at me completely speechless. What? Had they never seen an alien before? The nerve! I looked at the menu, my brain taking a moment to process the different alphabet and what each word meant. 
I looked towards Dr. Mormheim, my scales growing darker and darker with dread. I... I have no human currency to pay for food, I muttered, causing the good doctor to laugh, shaking her head. Again, Skolan, we'll take care of you here, she assured, crossing her arms, looking towards the cafeteria staff. The alien eats for free, she announced. My scales brightening at the declaration as my ravenous eyes stared through the human kitchen staff's very souls. I would like to try the pizza, I said, the staff looking at each other with confusion. The, the what? they replied. The pizza. A strange orange triangle with red circles, I hissed, causing the cafeteria staff to cackle at my attempt to order. Oh, pizza. No problem, the male corrected moving towards the circular pie and cutting a slice of it away, placing the slice on a circular plate made of a similar material to paper and handing it to me. It comes with a soda if you like one. Which would you like? He offered, a smile on his face. Is, uh, water, okay? I requested, the human nodding, turning around, before a person from my entourage timed in. No, let him try a monster, she exclaimed, cackling. I blinked, looking at her. Monster? I inquired, Dr. Mormheim stepping in, shaking her head feverishly. No, no energy drinks for the alien. She barked. I scoffed. Well, now I was just curious. I narrowed my eyes, my scales turning orange. I could use the energy. I will try a monster, I said, laughing faintly, making the one who suggested it to me raise her arms up in a victorious pose, and Dr. Mormheim paling in concern. Scalan, she began, shaking her head. Monster is a carbonated drink filled with sugar and a bunch of chemicals that act as stimulants. I just think it'd be, uh, safer if you didn't drink something that's pretty much every human's universally agrees is unhealthy. Can we compromise with coffee? It should give you the energy you need without making the alien under our care go into a cardiac arrest, she said. Her face as stern as a clutch mother watching over hatchlings. I found myself pouting. I wanted to try the drink, but I conceded. She was right to be concerned. Humans, while similar, were far more durable than I was. If humans showed concern, then so should I. Fine, coffee it is, I sulked, the human bringing out the cylindrical can with strange neon symbols on it, pausing before putting it back in the refrigeration unit and pouring a strange, dark brown liquid into a large cup, steam rising from it, making me grow concerned. Put ice cubes in it as well, so it isn't scalding hot and Scalan can drink it. Morheim ordered, the worker complying and adding frozen water cubes from a machine attached to the refrigeration unit to the scalding hot drink, the steam from the liquid slowly fading away as it cooled. I looked at the doctor in confusion as the strange-looking drink was handed to me, causing her to smirk. It's bitter, she began, shrugging her shoulders. You may not even like it. I'd say try the pizza first, she teased, causing the group around me to laugh. My scales burned bright orange as I skulked away to a nearby table. I made sure to use a nearby alcoholic sanitizer on my hands before handling the food and drink. But that was the last thing on my mind as I lifted up the warm slice of pizza and brought it to my maw. My sharp teeth made quick work of the soft, doughy food, and I began to chew it, taking in the taste. My eyes widened. My heart raced. My the God's pizza was amazing! I stuffed the whole damn slice into my face as fast as I possibly could. The sounds I admitted could only be described as diabolical, as the humans looked at me with utter terror as I did unspeakable things to that slice of pizza. It was so savory. The liquid that pooled on the tangy orange-yellow toppings, the zest from the red circles, the soft, pillowy fluff, and the divine sauce under the tang. I was purring in delight, and my excitement only grew as I looked towards the cup of coffee and began to drink with haste. I was told the drink would be bitter. I had fears that I would detest the taste. However, have I thought the pizza tasted good? Then... Let me tell you something about coffee. Those few first sips I took were a gift from the gods. I tasted nothing bitter, likely due to a difference in taste. What I tasted was beautiful, earthy, and more importantly, 
addicting nectar that I felt almost unworthy to drink. My scales fluctuated in a brilliant cascade of colors, my mind and emotions unable to reflect the true awe I felt at the majesty of this drink. The high command itself was worthy of this, this blessing. The world stopped rotating, the stars dimmed, the heavens sang, and I was in paradise. And just as I grew to embrace this gift, the drink was gone. The warmth was gone, and I was alone on Earth once more. I gently placed my cup down, looking over to Mormheim, my quills fluffing outwards and growing rigid in pure need. More, I stated flatly, causing her to blink. Oh, you like more, please? By the gods, do you drink this regularly? I exclaimed, jumping up from my seat. How do you find this bitter... How do you go without feasting constantly? This, this food isn't food. It's a gift from the heavens. Please, more, more pizza, more coffee, more, 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 I exclaimed. Perhaps this would be a good time to tell you that the Valon do not react very well to caffeine in high concentrations. We have equivalents, but nothing beats human doses. I was a mad man, and the humans around me slowly backed away, and I grew more manic with each passing second. Why are you just standing there like damned idiots? I cured your children. Give me coffee now. Scalon, Agent Brown called out. I turned to look at him, my scales still fluctuating in a tide of different colors and shades. I nearly hissed at him in pure, unadulterated want. What? I exclaimed causing the agent to laugh. I'm speaking Valan, they can't understand you, he shouted back. Was I speaking Valan? Had I lost that much control? I blinked, my heart racing, my breathing hastened, and my eyes moved straight to Dr. Mormheim. I cleared my throat, despite how savage I must have looked. I desperately tried to regain my composure, but looking back on it, I still must have looked like, well, a monster. May, may I have more coffee, please? I requested. That's probably not a good idea, Scalon. Yes, uh, yeah, yes, you're probably right. As I sat back down at the table, resting my head in my hands, making a variety of primitive full-on sounds of delight, my foot tapping on the ground while my body adjusted to the insanity that was the Valon reaction to human doses of caffeine. Another man ran in, wearing a lab coat similar to Dr. Mormheim. Hey, they're showing the UN meeting with the Valon on TV. It's going to happen in a few hours, he shouted. I blinked, jumping up from my seat and kicking the plastic chair behind me. Well, well, let's go then. I have many more people to treat before the show. Yes, yes, let's go, gotta go, I said, barely bouncing. I wanted to run across the planet. I needed to run across the planet. I had more energy than I had when I was butter hatchling, and by the gods, I was going to spend it by making sure every soul in this hospital was treated to the best of my abilities. Ah, uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea, Scalon. Agent Brown chimed in, causing me to snarl in irritation. How dare he refuse me doing my job? I had humans to save. Why not? I barked back at him, making the agent snort, shaking his head. Because you're going to be present in the discussion as a character witness for us. So, um, get yourself together and pray that you don't crash when the caffeine wears off, he said, causing my scales to stop fluctuating in color and fall to a bright green of worry. Uh-oh. End of chapter. Chapter 13 Scalan, we're not going to need to get you to bed, are we? Dr. Mormheim asked in jest, nudging my arm as my whole body shook under the salt of that coffee. The staff was kind enough to provide me a blanket, allowing me to wrap myself in a cocoon while my senses burned with energy. That along with a cup of water and two slices of pizza to fill my stomach. I was starting to think that maybe, just maybe... I'd be able to best the self-imposed affliction before the UN and the High Council demanded to speak with me. I trembled with worry. Perhaps first contact was not the appropriate place to be testing alien cuisine, especially while tensions were still absurdly high. I looked over to Dr. Mormheim with an exasperated expression, 
my colors fluctuating with the onslaught of different emotions brought on by the absurd amounts of caffeine present in human beverages. Even something as simple as their cooking was stimulating and mind-altering. I, uh, I, well, uh, Dr. Monheim, I replied, my voice shaking, my body curled up under the blanket in an attempt to cleanse my body of that infernal toxin that made me feel like I could outrun a comet. My comment fell on deaf ears as the doctor walked in front of me, her eyes gazing into my own. It was like my very soul was stared into, and my scales went green in terror, only a hatchling facing the clutch mother could feel, despite me likely being nearly double her age by Earth standard. You're shaking pretty bad. Do you have any other symptoms? She asked, tugging at the blanket I furiously clung to. My irritation was clearly showing, scales shining in bright orange in disdain, I said I'm fine, Doctor. Just a bit of the jitters is nothing to be concerned about, I snapped back, only causing the experienced Doctor to hum in thought, which was swiftly followed suit by a faint tisk. Were you a human, I'd throw you into a room and pump you full of fluids until the jitters went away. But considering the circumstances, she sighed, running a hand through her head fur, there's very little one doctor like me can say to keep you under observation when you're expected to give your opinion to people who make way more money than me, she muttered, giving a cheeky smirk. My less than amused expression made the doctor giggle. In truth, I think you'll be fine, Scalan, she mused, folding her hands behind her back. There are three glasses of water and two pieces of pizza next to you. I want all three of those glasses and both slices gone before that agent comes to scoop you away. Not much we can do with the caffeine already in your blood, though. So, we'll have to hope your kidneys won't fail when the caffeine gets processed. She nodded, looking to me with confusion once more. You, um, do have kidneys, right? Yes, the Valan have kidneys, I groaned, reaching out my comfy blanket cocoon to snatch a slice of pizza from the nearby plate, biting down on the grease-blissfilled treat. My scales immediately turned a bright yellow at the flavor causing the doctor's amusement to grow exponentially. She actually pulled up a chair to sit next to me, pulling out a small pad of paper from a coat pocket and a pen. Scalon, this actually brings up a good point, she began, beginning to write things down on that small notepad. We don't know much about your anatomy, since dissection is out of the picture. Could you explain to me the similarities and difference in layman terms between our species? She requested, causing my scales to flare green for a moment. Dissection... I began to fidget even more noticeably, causing the good doctor to laugh at my obvious unease. Relax, Galan, it was a joke. There's a thing in popular culture that there's a secret underground military bases where they bring in aliens secretly to dissect, to learn more about their anatomy. She chimed in. An absurd notion to the doctor, but my eyes went wide with that statement, and I became a green light. Secret underground military bases? Yeah... But that's just conspiracy theories. Conspiracies? Uh, sure, I muttered, clearing my throat. <laughs> uh, back to the question then. Assuming my body doesn't shut down with these shakes, I'd be happy to help, I said, reaching a jittery hand forward to place the half-eaten pizza slice down on the plate as I began to sip on some water. Ask away, doctor. Sure, she began, gazing at me in a comfy cocoon. For starters... How are we similar? she asked. In many ways, I stated, shakily resting my cup on the table. We have all the same bodily systems. Evolution appears to have a universal list on what major organ systems to include. Endocrine, nervous, respiratory. You'd be quite disappointed just to see how similar we are. It'd be better to go over what makes us different and what makes you humans so fascinating and horrifying to the Villan biologists like me. I began, my scales turning yellow as I was brought back to what I knew. I could have been having a conversation with another scholar of my species. So, your kind have no additional organs to note of. Are we exactly the same in most respects? She muttered, writing details down on the notepad. I groaned, taking a few more drinks of water before I really began to consider the question being asked. My mind felt as if it was running a marathon, but this was a fellow biologist. She had questions I needed to answer. We have a few mundane additions to our digestive system, I began, though they do see some use. We have an organ named the VAC, 
Attached to our small intestine, it releases an enzyme into chyme being digested to further break down nutrients for us. I'm sure mine is having a great time learning how to deal with pizza and coffee, I cackled, causing a soft smirk to rise up on her lips. In terms of digestion as well, we are omnivores, obviously. However, we are far better at processing proteins compared to you. If the calculations of a moody biology AI can be believed, I cackled. The doctor, on the other hand, did not find that last statement funny. In fact, her skin turned extremely pale. What was that about AI, Scalan? she asked, her attention immediately drawn away from her notepad. My head tilted to the side. Oh, AI, artificial intelligence, quantum computing gave us the power to create living minds in our machines to assist in tasks, I nodded, smiling. My personal artificial assistant is named La Raya. It can be a bit moody, but we get along quite nicely. The anniversary of its creation will be soon, too. I'll be sure to give it some time off to do what it wills, I smiled, my shaking frame falling back into the chair. Yet the good doctor seemed to be growing more and more panicked. My head tilted to the other side, curiously. What troubles you, doctor? I asked. You... You have AI. Yet, you're still here. Is... Is it like a program or something? She asked, leaning forward. I blinked in confusion. Why was she so interested? It was just a scholar AI. Most of Alon did have one AI assistant to help with their duties. Well, it does consist of some pretty powerful coding, but for all intents and purposes, it is an artificial life form. You'd like them. Lariah is pretty snarky, I muttered, cackling under my breath. My heart race was finally starting to settle down. But I grew concerned with how Dr. Mormheim's breathing seemed to increase in pace. Again, what troubles you about it? Scalon, she began. Humans and artificial intelligence, um, we've written horror stories about it. How are you still dominant in your culture? Why hasn't the artificial intelligence tried to wipe you out for using it like you do? They're slaves to you, she cried out, exasperated, but it only caused me to laugh harder at the audacity of it. Slaves? How AI, <laughs> hardly, how AI have personal resource accounts and even our captains on some of our ships for exploration missions. The leading scholar of faster than light travel on ships that I live on is an AI, I reassured, trying to ease the human's unease. Were humans that paranoid about everything? It actually began to bug me quite a bit. Dr. Moheim, you've battled some of the worst genetic diseases I've seen in a species. And I've catalogued many, many thousands of them. Every human, aside from Agent Prow, that I've seen has had some air of paranoia about them regarding other humans, what our species is going to do, and what the future holds. To answer your question with one of my own, why would we give AI any significant reason to crush us? We treat them as equals and honor the work that they do. We want to do the same with humans. Please. You're the first human that actually makes me feel like I'm speaking to someone not trying to stab me in the back. Explain this to me, I begged, forgetting about the caffeine overdose at the moment as I leaned forward. Dr. Mormheim let out a sigh, the color of his skin returning as a few strands of gray hair fell on her face. It's a human condition to be paranoid. It goes all the way back to when we were cavemen, I guess. She shrugged. I blinked in confusion. What does she mean by cavemen? She seemed to sense my confusion and let out a laugh because of it. Now evolutionary forefathers, we call them cavemen, as we found primitive artwork from them in caves along with tools and the beginnings of what we'd know as civilization, she began, clearing her throat. It appeared that our discussion on the biological differences between our people would have to be put on hold. Scalan, you must have looked at our world before you landed here. Did you not see the giant storm clusters floating in our atmosphere? she asked. I bit my tongue, not wanting to answer the obvious question. Humanity doesn't survive a planet filled with animals that have claws, poisons, and razor-sharp teeth. Plants that look good enough to eat, but will cause your body to convulse and writhe on the ground in horrifying agony. And, finally, natural disasters such as literal mountains exploding and pouring hot ash into the atmosphere, causing hundreds, if not thousands, of years of winter, she bellowed out. My eyes went wide my scales shining a bright neon green, and I fell back into my chair, thinking about what she had just said. I surely should not have been that bad. 
You must have been apex predators to become sapient as you have. I nodded, thinking on how much stronger and more oxygen efficient humans were compared to us. I was stunned, however, when she laughed at my assertion. Oh, heavens no. We were prey for most part until we developed tools. At least, that's what I remember from my anthropology classes, and that was years ago. She trailed on. I was quite enthralled. Not once had I considered the evolutionary necessity behind humanity's paranoia that was so clearly obvious. My mind trailed off to when we first encountered the planet. The weather patterns alone deemed the planet uninhabitable by my people. Earth was a planet of hazardous environments, dangerous flora and fauna, and its gravity alone would be enough to cause significant health problems with prolonged exposure. I was already feeling quite exhausted being on this planet. Minor differences in gravity could be felt after a while. This, uh, actually explains a lot about your people. This constant paranoia. It explains your biology as well, I mused, my eyelids falling slightly. The caffeine finally seemed to be wearing off, leaving a void of energy where it once was. A yawn left my maw before I gazed upon the doctor once more. Constant threats during your evolutionary path would explain why most humans I have met are wary regarding the unknown, I muttered, causing the doctor to laugh. Well, a lot of us are. We are also inherently curious and explorers. I suppose you could chalk that up to being a nomadic people that can survive in almost any climate, she stated. I was inclined to agree. She actually began to laugh, looking towards me with an almost predatory gaze. We were explorers because we needed to travel for food. At least, that's what I think. We'd tail animals faster, stronger, and bigger than us for days until they were exhausted and couldn't fight back. Then we'd kill them and feed our families with their meat. We are endurance hunters, willing to go everywhere and anywhere to ensure our survival. She spoke darkly, my eyes growing wide with the thought. Endurance hunters? Oh my. These primitives not only clawed their way to the top of the food chain, but they made absolutely sure that every other creature knew of their might. Humans were horrifying. They were prepared for everything that could go wrong. They were prepared to fight for everything they needed to survive. It was no wonder the general took so many precautions when we first arrived. Why, he planned for our arrival for God knows how long. Humans expected danger at every turn and nothing would stop their biological need to survive against all odds. Their children were pumped full of toxins designed to keep mutated cells from growing further. Their astronauts would pound on alien ships just to see what was inside. Their military worked in secret, preparing a hidden line of defense before any threats even arose. They looked at their fellow humans as rivals to their own survival. Humans were very good at telling nature, technology, and any other threat to go feck itself. They were human. They survived the onslaught of Earth. They bested every single threat thrown at them by their own damned planet. And then, once those threats became mundane, they waged war against genetic mutations and hypothetical alien threats. Everything was a threat, at least in some way, to a human. But the unknown also presented an opportunity for better odds of survival and living. Hence, the friendly nature of some of the humans I've met. I'm a new, unforeseen possibility for them. My entire race was. Some people embraced the unknown as a new opportunity. Others viewed it as a danger that needed to be watched and guarded against. No two humans thought the same. No two humans had the same opinion. Humans were stuck in this primitive struggle between welcoming and fleeing the unknown. They scrambled around their little blue orb, desperately searching for their next step, and they were so close. Yet, they just couldn't agree with one another. It wasn't as simple as borders between countries and civilizations like it was with the Velan. Humans just genuinely had drastic differences in their ideals, even on an individual level, that arguments were bound to happen. But the species' emotions weren't just colors of their scales, but rather physical actions. Rage from a heated argument would no doubt lead to minors. Sure, a punch to the snout by an angry warrior cast member happened, but it took a lot to set off a Valan like that. For humans, it was second nature. Or was it? The doctor seemed fairly rational, as did Agent Brown. My scales turned orange in frustration. 
I had to speak to the High Command in a few Earth hours as a first-hand character witness for humans, and I still didn't know nearly enough about them to offer a decent opinion. I knew of their subtle deceit. I knew of their paranoia. I knew of their reckless abandon for their own safety when a new opportunity appeared, which, by the way, was a species-wide contradiction when their paranoia was considered. Humans weren't uniform like we were. They were all different. They were a colorful vomit on a blue planet, and each individual drop of paint was a different color, and it was driving me mad. Good gods, I was just a scholar, not a philosopher, like the diplomat cast. I took biological samples. I read those samples after my AI partner ran some mundane tests, and I provided my input. That was it. Why was I the lucky one that just so happened to take the damn sample of human genetics? Why was I the focal point of all of this? They could have sent anyone else, but no, they sent me. That general asked for me, and my people just went along with it as if nothing was the matter. And now, I had this important task. After talking at length with a grand total of three people to offer an opinion on their entire species, it was impossible. Every single member of their species was different. Every single one had their own dreams and motivations. Every single one either embraced or fought against the unknown. They battled each other for dominance because they had no one else to fight. Nature, the one thing that kept them in check, was no longer an issue to the mighty human. What do I say? How do I say it? How can I possibly tell anyone anything about a species that could not be understood even in 100 years of research? My scales turn bright red with the fires of my anger and thoughts. Scalon! The voice called out. I didn't listen. My body was no longer shaking, my exhaustion from the caffeine no longer present. Only fear, doubt, rage, and misery awaited me. I couldn't pass judgment on an entire species, nor should I. I was in my element here in the hospital, treating sick people and discussing our species' anatomies. But no, my fate is much more grand. All because I did what I was supposed to do, and took that damned biological sample because my species acted like hatchlings around new sapien biological lifeforms on some backwater fecked up monster world. Skull on! A voice barked, snapping me out of my trance, my scales fading away from red to a stuff muted orange. As I turned to look at the voice, it was Agent Brown with a certain bald-headed, bright-eyed girl bouncing up and down on her feet. Hi, she exclaimed, holding on to Ivy. I had tests. I'm better now, she said, her voice not nearly as choppy as it was while she was sick. When I get all the way better, can I see the other aliens, Mr. Scalan? she asked, chipper as could be. I nodded hastily, falling back into my chair as she nearly ran forward. Nurses and doctors were trying their absolute best to keep her away, as the fact of the matter was that she did just have a life-threatening mutation. However... After Agent Brown offered pleasant words, she waltzed over to me, swaying back and forth, those eyes of hers staring into mine. I'll be able to see more aliens, right? You're gonna take us into space, right? She asked, her voice as sweet as fructose. I sighed, looking to the small human child. Maybe. Maybe I was overthinking this. Maybe this wasn't some massive moral dilemma I had to solve alone. Maybe I wasn't the perfect space-aged alien that came here to enlighten humanity. Maybe our species had something to learn too. Even after the chemical hell this child went through, she was ready for adventure. Maybe all of humanity was. Maybe all of humanity just needed a little push in the right direction to get moving past their primitive, horrifying blue orb. I'll see what I can do, Scar Lily, I said, reaching out for my blanket to pat her head. She giggled wildly and wrapped her arms around my cocoon frame in adoration, happy as could be. Good. Maybe if we get into space we can find other circadian kids to help like you did for me, she said. I positively melted. Maybe, Scar Lily. Maybe, I responded, Agent Brown crossing his arms. A smirk on his lips, 
as he peered over to us. You've got a few hours still, Scalon, Agent Brown said, shaking his head, and you have to spend two or three meeting the people that want to thank you. Thank me? For what? I asked, my head tilting to the side. What? Did you think those kids you just saved wouldn't have parents? He responded. Let me tell you, there's a river of grateful tears and gifts outside of this room for you. Security is barely able to keep them out of here from swabbing you. Figured I'd let you see your handiwork firsthand before I guide you through the mob, he cackled. A mob of overjoyed humans. Oh, this would be a treat. End of chapter. Chapter 14 On Earth, the phrase, they're wearing their emotions on their sleeve, is said when someone is very emotional or is clearly showing how a situation is affecting them emotionally. The lawn is constantly in this state, as our scales change colors depending on our mood. There is very little a lawn can do to stop this. The most common accepted theory regarding it is that it was a mating display when we were but lowly, non-sapient creatures. My own theory is that it is an adaptation of an environmental camouflage. My kind has no need for natural camouflage any longer. So the trait was repurposed. Or what? I don't know. But that is beside the point. When a human wears their emotions on their sleeve, things get very, very physical. A lawn will illuminate with bright yellows when they are overwhelmed with joy. But a human... A human will crush you in their arms with a bizzle strength only titans could know. Perhaps that was something I should have considered when I ran about curing children of life-threatening mutations. By the time I walked out of the cafeteria behind Agent Brown and heard of the security shout, Stand back! I was immediately grabbed by one of the largest humans that I had ever seen. He was almost as wide as he was tall. His muscles far beyond anything my calculations had predicted. Tears and uh, various other fluids stripped from his rather bald face as he buried it in my shoulder. I could scarcely breathe as his grip around my frame tightened. He even lifted me off the ground in his display of joy. You saved her. You saved my little girl. He choked out, sobs and more fluids staining my lab coat as I struggled to take my next breath. Agent Brown and a few security guards tried to get this behemoth of a human away from me so that I could breathe once more. This man was worth three Agent Browns in sheer height, weight, and muscle mass. Titan was a good way to describe him, as I felt this man could shatter mountains with a single blow from his heavily tattooed fist. Let go of the alien! Agent Brown barked in a tone that I had not heard from his secretive agent before, a solid projectile pistol drawn up against the man's bald head. Was he really going to shoot this man that was slowly choking the life out of me? No. No, he wasn't. The man took the hint and slowly set me down to shaky legs as he began to wipe the fluids onto his heavily calloused hands. He smiled wider than I thought possible for a human. My little girl, Lily. She was given only three months to live. You, you, you saved her. He choked out, raising his hands up to ease Agent Brown's agitation. I, I, I didn't mean to hurt you, if I did, but, but holy shit, the news was wrong about you. The news was wrong about all of you. you you're not here to take us over at all. You're saving our kids, he shouted. I was too busy gasping for air to really accept the man's apology or pry any further into what exactly he was saying about the news. Agent Brown barked some orders at the security staff and proceeded to shout to the top of his lungs to... To, uh... Oh, by the gods, there were dozens of them. As my eyes slowly started to adjust to having oxygen once more, I saw a tide of people, much like the barbarian that grappled me earlier, holding each other and looking at me in awe. They did not wear uniforms like the medical staff here. They seemed relatively casual in attire, albeit strange compared to what the Valan wore during casual affairs. Agent Brown was not pleased in the slightest. He pressed a few buttons on his communications device, upon which he, in a very shrill, high-pitched squeal of a scream, barked orders into it. 
His face was red as our scales became when we had a fit of rage. Honestly, I do not blame his security or himself for the barbarian of a man getting through to me. He was driven by very human emotions, and those emotions were quite physical. The man seemed to be well-intentioned giant, like the Parna Striders of my home world. They were large, imposing creatures, yet were herbivorous and would more than likely flee from you than attempt to harm you. We tried to domesticate them, but giant creatures made poor house pets. I digress. The large, heavily tattooed man was pushed back into the crowd with gleeful parents that would not be denied the chance to gaze upon the alien that cured their children. They cheered, they wept, they made calls on their own personal communication devices. And furthermore, they begged for me to stay and help other kids and people they knew with similar diseases. They begged me to stay to cure more people. I was too overwhelmed to really answer any of their questions or ease their emotions as Agent Brown quickly abandoned Dr. Mormheim and the rest of the staff and pushed me towards the parking lot once more. Security barricading the tide of emotional parents from our location. Jones! Agent Brown called out. A security guard running up to him from the security booth in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir? You're fired, and if you don't fire every single one of your incompetent security staff in the next 15 minutes, I'll find a reason to throw you in jail. Your security team was supposed to keep everyone the feck out, and they weren't able to. Who let the parents in? He seethed, guiding me towards his car, opening the passenger door, and shutting me inside. His face was scrunched and filled with an immense fury. He would have made the sky rain magma if his blood boiled any hotter. The poor security lead's face went pale as he attempted to explain himself. Agent Brown appeared to be having none of it, yet I couldn't quite make out what he was saying through the closed car door. Nor did I want to. As my heart settled down and the tension from both the wild parents and the screaming federal agent slipped from my senses, pride moved in to take its place. I placed my hands behind my head, Cool sandwiched between both as my scales turned a bright yellow. My tired eyes lidded shut as I thought about just how intense a human display of affection was. I'd done great things for these humans, and I didn't even really have to try. Primitives were so easy to make happy, and their happiness was so lively. I felt like a hero. Hells, I was a hero to them. It was a good feeling. It was more than just my job to fix people to these humans. It was a legitimate, heroic act. I was used to applause for succeeding in finding treatment to a troublesome disease or purifying a water supply from a waterborne parasite. But that was just my job to the Valan. To the Valan, that was what I was supposed to do. And while yes, I was praised for being good at it, it was just what was expected of me. I am a biologist. It is expected of biologists to develop new medical treatments and solve biological problems. To do so is to do what is expected of you. For humans, succeeding in what you were supposed to do appeared to be some form of magic, judging from how much of a reaction I received after completing my task. Dr. Mormheim wasn't rushed by thankful parents for doing her part in treating them. Yet I was. True, with the treatment I provided, the mutation was eradicated rather than simply bombarded with radiation and chemical treatments. But Dr. Mormheim was limited by her technology available. Oh, what humanity could do with their technology was up par with our own. The Valan would be rather irrelevant. At least, those are my thoughts on it. It was actually rather intimidating to think about. Humanity could survive in a multitude of environments. They could develop and implement new technologies very quickly, and they were always prepared for the worst should it happen. My species grew far too comfortable on their throne. Humanity would step up to claim it if we were not cautious with how we handled this meeting. This meeting. Oh, heavens. I was to be the judge of humanity in a short while. The thought crossed my mind as Agent Brown finally finished berating the security official and into the car. It was time now. There was no time for sleep, 
No time to say goodbye to Dr. Mormheim. And certainly no more time to reflect on the variety of strange things going through my mind. No. This is it. I was going to be taken to the location where we would meet with actual human leaders, where I'd provide a non-biased opinion on what I'd seen. There'll be other Valar there too, you know. In your shoes, uh, sandals, Agent Brown, as if reading my very own thoughts, responded. My scales turned a bright blue from sheer capabilities of his intuition. Was I being that obvious? No. No, I wasn't. Humans were good at reading people. Even aliens. Humans were good at a variety of things, but Agent Brown's specialty seemed to be people. Really? Others made contact as I have, I asked. It had been quite a few days since I'd talked to the others of my kind. I was fairly clueless as to how the rest of my kind approached humanity. Agent Brown nodded, his face turning rather emotionless once more. He rested his hands in his lap and looked at me with those cold, intuitive eyes. Yep, but none like you, Scalon. Every other Valon was given the royal treatment, but not you. You were met with hostility the moment you got you. You got a taste of the side of humanity our diplomats didn't want you to see. You got to meet General McCullen, he stated, closing those infernal eyes of his. The other Valon, their opinions won't mean shit compared to yours. Everyone wants to know what you have to say, which is why I have to ask, what are you going to say, he requested opening his eyes once more to stare holes into my very soul. I... I'm uncertain, Agent Brown. Not good enough, he interrupted. I leaned back towards the door, looking at Agent Brown with confusion. Everyone else is going to lie to you, but not me. And I am a professional liar. If we fact this up with you, in particular, all of our hopes die with your words, he said, looking forward out of the windshield. Everyone thinks the Balan are either going to get us or help us get into space Star Trek style, he admitted, sighing. And what do you think, Agent Brown? I prodded, genuinely curious. Personally, I think you'd be fecking idiots to let us get into space. Personally, I think that we should rot here on this planet all by ourselves. My kind isn't ready to explore space. My kind isn't as beautiful as yours, he said, his tone growing dumb. And... That's why you should leave us here. We're not ready to give up our diversity, our individuality, just to see the galaxy. I don't think humanity will ever be willing to do that. I think, truly, that we need to find our own fecking way off this planet. We need to grow up as a species and do it ourselves, he muttered, causing me to shake my head. That's quite the sentence you're forcing on your kind, Agent Brown, I replied, my scales turning a bright yellow. I'm not the kind of person that'll write speeches in advance or prepare to sugarcoat anything. I'm a scholar, first and foremost. As such, I will tell both my kind and yours the honest to God's truth about what I've seen and what I think about your species. I stated, my brow firing in determination. All you need to do is ensure my safety until we get there. Afterwards, you'll hear my opinion on you. But I need to be honest with you first, I muttered. Agent Brown nodded, turning on his land shuttle after inserting some core into it. Human technology was odd. Go on, then. Not getting any younger, he laughed, moving his car into reverse and looking through the back window. I hate how your kind doesn't trust each other, I hissed as he pulled out his parking spot and began to move out of the structure that housed all of these land shuttles. I understand why you do not trust each other, or aliens for that matter. And it still irritates me, I admitted, leaning back into my seat. Same here, he muttered, turning onto the road out of the hospital parking lot. Say, Scalon, you've gotten to know a few humans since you've been here. Mind if I go for broke and tell you a bit about me? I mean, it's not like you're going to sell my secrets on the internet or something, he blurted out, chuckling to himself. I shrugged my shoulders. I didn't see how it had hurt to know a bit more about the one of the most secretive, strange individuals I'd ever met. It was the man who didn't display a single emotion, but spoke with so much it hurt my eyes. I'll take that as a yes, sir. First things first, sir. I kill people. End of chapter. Chapter 15 Agent Brown never struck me 
as a violent man. Was he odd? Of course he was, especially considering his utter lack of facial or emotional displays that many of his human counterparts displayed. Yet he was always, at least, somewhat pleasant. He never struck me as a murderer. It made my scales shine a bright blue at the thought of it. Someone so pleasant to speak to was a murderer. There had to be an explanation. There had to be a reason why an ordinary, unhinged fellow could find the will to kill someone with no reason other than he was ordered to do it. A warrior caste member would scoff at the idea of a caste leader ordering them to kill someone who posed a political threat. It was not how the Valan operated. It was barbaric. It was vile. It was disgusting to even think about. We didn't even kill our prisoners. They were rehabilitated until they could rejoin society. Sure, some of my species did not rehabilitate, and they were dealt with. But they, uh, they, uh... My train of thought was detoured as a soft chuckle erupted from the agent as he switched into a different lane as our speed picked up. At this point, I was quite used to the pull of this land shuttle, so the change in velocity did not affect me as much as it previously had. My eyes turned to look at Agent Brown who was softly shaking his head. That man had a talent of knowing what I was thinking at any given moment. As such, I eagerly awaited his explanation behind his barbaric actions. Did you know how many human countries there are, Scalon? He asked, his tone neutral, his tone still that pleasant breeze that ensured me that I was safe, that I was secure. I began to loathe that tone of voice from the emotionless man. I began to hate it. I hated how well it worked on me. I hated how, even knowing that this man was a killer, that I was completely safe under his protection. I am uncertain, Agent Brown. How many are there? I dismissively asked, waving my hand with a roll of my eyes. I didn't care. This man was a fiend. Just under two hundred, he replied, his eyes unflinching from the road ahead. That's a lot of people to keep tabs on. Unlike you, Valon, who I assume have a vast database of all citizens born under your empire, we are not an empire, I corrected, my eyes narrowing in disgust. We are a civilization. All of the planets we have claimed are our own were uninhabited by intelligent species. Ah, but they were inhabited by something, weren't they? Beasts, plants, bacteria. All of them are not native species to Valar. Totally, Scalon. Is claiming a territory already inhabited by something else, not something an empire would do. He mused. I loathed him for his words and how correct they were. Suppose we were an empire, despite how vile the idea of that is. What does that have to do with anything regarding your profession, Agent Brown? I hissed, causing the agent to crack a smirk. It has nothing to do with it at first glance, but with different countries come different cultures, ideals and goals... The Valon are unified, so an empire would be a relatively natural thing to become. Why would you care about swallowing up planets under your banner if no other cultures were present to protest your own? Empires aren't all that bad, so long as they don't oppress anyone. That is where I come in, he began, his smirk fading. I am very good at dealing with people. I pick up on languages faster than most humans. I pick up on subtle gestures. Comments and glances. I'm also very good at pretending to be someone that I'm not. I know 13 different languages, excluding Valan. I am a trained cosmetologist, able to dye my own hair in a variety of different colors, and I know how to properly contour lines on my face. I am fairly androgynous, much like the Valan. I can make my voice higher or lower in pitch and give a variety of accents to truly blend in. I'm a ghost, Scalan. They call my kind spies. He was a spy. He was an information stealer. Oh, gods! I had been so foolish to not see it before. My scales dimmed to an abyssal black as the horror of it finally dawned on my foolish mind. I'd been careful to leave no trace of technology that I brought with me, but this man was a traitor and thief of knowledge by trade. He made me feel safe, complacent, and all the while he worked to worm his way into my technology. Human paranoia began to creep my thoughts. Would this man kill me and take my technology and, with how quickly humanity worked, use it against my people? Smile slowly appearing on his lips did little to comfort me. Relax, Galan, believe it or not. 
I'm not here as a spy. I'm here because I genuinely wanted to meet you, he said softly, reassuringly, hoping to ease my tension. It did little a bit to further drive me into paranoia. Scalan, if I truly wanted your technology, you would have been dead the second you and your team arrived on Earth. Your ship would have been malfunctioned and exploded. There would have been charred Valan corpses all over the news, and it would have been quite the tragedy. No evidence would have been left to show any foul play was present. Do you want to know why I could have done this? Because I was there at Alpha Camp, the base you and your soldiers went to when you first arrived. If you mean to make me feel better by telling me just what you would have done if you were on the job, you're vastly mistaken. You are a killer, Agent Brown, and you still haven't told me why you do such others than it is your job. Humans employ you to kill other humans, and now I know potentially friends in the cosmos. I sighed, looking straight ahead out of the windshield. Yep, I'm an evil son of a bitch, he replied, shrugging his shoulders. Humanity made me evil. Do you know that there are some countries out there that hate me simply because I was born here, in this country? Do you know there are some humans that would behead me simply for not believing in their political agendas? Humans are a very, very scary race. I am a first responder to that horror. Yes, I do kill people, and I am paid very well to do so. But there's hundreds, if not thousands of people just like me that'll feel a lot less awful about doing what we paid to do on my own countrymen. Would you not do anything to protect your own people? He asked, looking at me sincerely. My scales shifted from their grave black towards a rather neutral, flowing palette. Agent Brown had a very good point. It still painted humanity quite poorly. To the individual who has cast judgment on his entire species, but it was a good point nonetheless. He lived in a barbaric world with barbaric people. As such, barbaric actions would need to be taken. It disgusted me to think about, but a human would do absolutely anything to make sure they survived. Humans could not know failure. I see I'm making a breakthrough then. Now, while I'm not excusing my job as anything other than monstrous, all I'm saying is that I'm good at it. I am very good at what I do. I was in the room with you the entire time McCullum blabbered on about pulling himself up by his bootstraps. Blah, blah, blah. The guy needs to learn how to shut the feck up once in a while, he cackled, shaking his head. I actually gave a laugh in reply. It was very true. McCullum was very, um, empowered to see his philosophy recognized and agree with. The fact that Agent Brown was in there alongside me was both haunting due to the fact that I didn't even recognize him and comforting, knowing I didn't have to listen to that idealistic buffoon alone. McCullen's daughter is the leader of my country. She presides over everyone here as our top-level federal official. She also is a very close friend of mine, he spoke softly. For the first time since I had met this man, I thought I could see a hint of emotion on his face. She doesn't know about that. It's a very one-sided friendship. My mother was very wealthy, and we were neighbors. My mother also had a very debilitating disease. It's called HIV. It's life-threatening, but her wealth ensured good treatment, and she was able to live longer life than most with that death sentence at the time. McCullen and his daughter lived there at the time. The president, at least then, really helped my mom by not being afraid of her or hating her for that disease. He muttered, sighing. I blinked in confusion. I would she be hated for having a disease? I asked, causing the agent to laugh softly. <laughs> uh, there was a theory back then that the disease was transferred by homosexuals. To have that disease was to have a brand that you, yourself, were one. It was a social suicide at the time to be known to have it. We know better now that it is blood-borne disease, but... Uh, he paused, looking at me, and my quite red scales, his eyes quickly moved to the road. But the brilliance of my anger towards their very sentiment boiled my blood. Okay, probably not the best thing that I could have said to the person who is going to cast judgment on my species. But hey, let's chalk that up to putting out all the dirty laundry, he remarked, shrugging his shoulders once more. And before you cast judgment, remember, a lot of humans were angry about it too. That's what I keep hearing over and over. A serious issue arises, but that is fine because there is an outrage over it by others of your species, I hissed, my quills standing on end, or at least trying to 
as I was pressed against the chair in this land shuttle. All I'm hearing is we do bad things, but a lot of us don't like doing them, so that makes it okay. When do the bad things stop? The Valon are not a perfect species, far from it, but at least my kind actively try to better themselves. Your kind has such potential, and all I am hearing is how you are ruining that potential by being self-serving, loathsome creatures. What if I was to tell you humans, back then, when you were young and your mother was dying, that my very first emotional partner was another male like myself? Would I be ostracized and hated by Bond? Hisses escaping my snout with every exhale. I had never been this livid with anyone before, but knowing a species used something like a disease to outright hate people who chose their own sex as their partners. Well, I could only tolerate so much bullishness. Agent Brown nodded after I spoke my mind. You should be angry about it. You should be angry about what a lot of us do. We need the push. Agent Brown spoke in a mournful tone. It's why I think that we should stay on this rock. It's why I think your people are far too beautiful for us. I'm talking to someone who lives in a utopia. By all human accounts, you belong, don't need or want for anything. Humanity. We're uh, primitive, I interrupted. You're all very, very primitive, yes. Agent Brown muttered, putting off the highway, driving towards a large building in the distance, which was surrounded by other buildings of similar make. The area was much more beautiful and well-designed than the one that surrounded the hospital. Flags of all different colors rose into the skies, much larger in scale compared to the ones on the housing buildings. Agent Brown sighed as he approached what I assumed was our destination, where I would give my thoughts on their species. My eyes narrowed as I looked at my destiny, eager to be free of this place, of this planet. Skalon, he spoke softly, with purpose, the hardened shell he wore on his face easing, and for the first time, I met him. I saw a human on that face. Despite all of that hatred and fear, President McCullen still came over to keep my mother company. She still bought me presents for Christmas, still saw my mother as a human when everyone else, at least in secret, judged her for something she didn't do. She had a bad blood transfusion, but everyone thought she caught her from being sexually dirty. Yeah, they thought homosexuality was dirty act, and a lot of people still do but not President Deborah McCullen. When my mom and I were very alone, Debbie was there to say hi. Then it was Senator McCullen, and finally, President. The leader of this country of misfits and hate-filled bigots is a loving, caring woman who made my childhood that much better. My scales dimmed, the red changing into flowing colors of thought. He began to pull up what I assumed was a security checkpoint. A few guards moved towards the land shuttle. Please, uh, don't judge us for the actions of the loud. Their voices overpower the good in us. For every General McCullum, there are three Dr. Mohamheims. Just, uh, promise me that you'll remember that when you're talking to their leaders, okay? He begged, his voice shaking. He was, uh, showing fear. Yes, that was it. It was fear. It was a fear I did not expect from the agent. My eyes closed, and he slowly slid down the window on his side of the land shuttle. I began to mutter to myself under my breath, If there are guards out there, if Scar, Sko, and La are listening to me right now, please help me. End of story. Chapter 16 My heart began to race as Agent Brown talked with the two security personnel, armed to the teeth. My thoughts wandered, and my gaze moved upward into the crystal blue sky. I could see the massive station that housed my people's leaders up there. It made me think about how all this began. How one silly expedition to a backwater solar system with the most hostile planets imaginable led to the discovery of another sapient species. This little insignificant blue dot, amongst countless others, housed one of the most impressive species that I ever come to know. They were impressive, yet horrifying. They were primitive, yet infinitely intelligent. How could our two species coexist? It was up to me to decide. I gave a faint laugh under my breath. All of this happened because I decided to take a sample of a human tissue so that our species could make contact with them. Rather, when humanity decided to throw all caution to the wind and pound on our ship, 
They were just as eager to meet us as we were to meet them. My eyes shut tightly at the thought. By all accounts, from what I've seen, been told, have experienced, our species was better off without humanity. They were a barbaric kind, letting their emotions control their actions. They mistrusted each other out of pure instinct. And here I was, sitting in a human land shuttle, as we made our way closer and closer to our destination. My eyes slowly opened. The building, as we approached, was massive in scale. It soared high into the heaven, the stone shimmering, beautiful, white-fringed with beautiful gold. It was heavenly to look at. Humans crowded the front entrance, each of them holding very, very primitive recording equipment. My eyes went wide, however, as I saw who they were talking to, these human recorders. They were speaking with and recording with land officials. Judging from the yellow color of their robes, they were all diplomatic caste. Of course, they were diplomats. A diplomat should have been in my position. Politics and interspecies communications were no place for a scholar. My hands fell against the window on my side of the land shuttle as we moved ever onward on that pristine black road towards the back of the building. More and more security personnel, looking more like armed soldiers than uniformed guards of the hospital, patrolled the area, keeping out the human civilians with relative ease. Huh. So humans could be competent when it mattered. I began to put two and two together. The humans recording my people were likely the informants of their species, informing the human population of what was going on today. The thought made me even more nervous. Not only were my people waiting on bated breath for a true, unbiased opinion on humanity, but many humans questioned their fate. They questioned what I would say. They questioned if this place would be their eternal home until they figured out how to leave. It was difficult to say how quickly they would discover it. How kind cooperated and, using our combined intellect and drive, we were able to discover spaceflight and survivability in the cold darkness of the cosmos very quickly. Humans stood to surpass us just as quickly. I only question what it would take to drive humans to put aside their territories, borders, and even flags to work together as a species, rather than as countrymen, to achieve a common goal. I had full faith that they could do it, but I wasn't sure how long it would take, nor what it would take to get them to do it. I racked my brain, destroyed my composure. I must have looked like an exhausted mess. I went several days without sleep, barely any food, and using human restrooms was less than dignifying. Did they truly stand up to urinate and separate males from females into their own separate rooms? Well, I suppose for health purposes they may have had a point, but it would make more sense to... I rolled my eyes. Humans didn't trust each other, even the opposite sex. The survival instincts was going to drive me absolutely mad by the time I arrived back on my home ship. I would need to go to sleep for several rotations in order to regain my new shred of composure I had lost in this God's forsaken planet. Agent Brown arrived towards the back of the building. Several of the human press, as I heard Agent Brown mutter, began to swarm the security barricade. Flashes of cameras, screaming, risen microphones all entered my peripheral vision as I was escorted out of the car by three large, intimidating human males, nearly my height and twice as wide. They could each squeeze my head between their hands and leave it nothing but pop between their fingers. The mental image was uh, less than settling. Between the intimidating human security personnel and the screams of the human press, I was eager to be rushed into the large building and have those doors slammed shut. My scales must have been as green as the large plants that rose towards the heavens of this planet. Agent Brown placed a hand on my shoulder, looking up with that neutral expression, yet I could see in his eyes that he was truly concerned. Whether that concern was about me or the fate of his species, I was uncertain, and I did not care. He nodded forward, urging me to follow him in silence as we wandered down the expansive, glimmering, pristine hallways of a building designed for leaders and greatness. It seemed to be a universal truth that leaders of every species wanted the best, freshest, and most exuberant housing, no matter where they went. Humans had enormous, well-crafted, beautiful buildings. My kind had planet-sized, space-faring space stations. 
it would appear that even species as different as humans and Valan had similar tastes. My train of thought was derailed as I heard a quite familiar shrill. My scales turned a deep, dark, soul-crushed black as I heard that shrill, that squeal, that cheerful skip with every click of a step. My eyes went wide. No! Not now! Not here! I slowly stoned and saw it approach, her claws tapping against the beautiful stone floors, her gaudy colors shining a brilliant golden yellow that nearly matched her official diplomat robes. Those gaudy colors, that vile tone of voice, I knew that female. And as she nearly skipped over to me, Agent Brown looked towards her as well, then back at me, and must have seen the hate in my eyes. Now, I have never been an intimidating fellow. I have never seen someone like Agent Brown show anything but the slightest fraction of emotion. However, when someone as good at reading people's thoughts as Agent Brown slowly began to back away, he must have heard the wails of the rotting damned swirl around my frame. My eyes burned with the hot, fetid rot of one thousand carcasses. My blood boiled like volcanic magmas. My quills stood on end, and every exhale left wisps of almost tangible smoke around my body. Needless to say, those black dismal scales swirled with molten red. It was a universal sign for every Valon to ever exist to stay away. But to Skia, whose very mind was filled with starshine and sweets, all she saw was a fellow ship dweller. Greetings, Skalaskalan, she chirped, her voice claws and glass to my ears. I hissed at the female. I actually hissed at a fellow ship dweller. She managed to catch that message very quickly, her scales immediately shifting to a shock blue from that vibrant gold that they had been earlier. Oh, oh heaven, Skalaskalan, you look awful, she muttered softly, expressing genuine concern. I trembled in fury. I wanted her gone. I wanted her to leave. The only thing letting me tolerate her presence for even this long was the fact that she was Valan, and I was desperate to speak to someone of my own species for once. Really? I asked, my voice dripping with disdain and followed by another hiss. What gave you that idea, Diplomat Skoya? I asked. Leaning forward, my eyes wide and frenzied, that stupid, oblivious wretch could not even see my utter hatred for her as she took a few steps forward. She reached towards my shoulders, and a very savage part of my mind told me to eat her. However, despite how much I felt that the humans, especially Agent Brown, wouldn't have even flinched at such a display of savagery, cannibalism was frowned upon in Valan culture. Now, Scholar Scalan, I've been sent here to make sure that you are presentable for the human leaders. I must say, though, with your colors and your current complexion, you, you look fairly, um, um, tribald, she muttered, tugging at my tunic and sniffing my uniform. You could use some new clothing and some sanitation, too. Uh, luckily, Skaana and her security team gave me permission to go through your quarters and find your... You went through my quarters. You went through my quarters to take my things, I asked. The skies dark, and the earth shook, and human children screamed in terror as I prepared to unleash one thousand woes upon this Milan diplomat. Skoya laughed nervously, despite not seeing the imagined devastation I was prepared to unleash upon this world. Her scales turned a bright green as she took a few steps back. Well, 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 I was granted permission, and uh, I, I guess it is required to... You, of all people, you went through my possessions. Do you realize how invasive that is? Do you? Do you? I trailed off as I imagined storms brewing, showered lightning upon the world, instead of a storm of cosmic fire and brimstone. The only thing I unleashed was a sign of disdain. My scale slowly fading into an annoyed orange, shouting that this gaudy ball of colorful annoyance would do nothing but make tensions worse. Instead, I shook my head. Just give me my damned robes so I can get this over with, I muttered, disdain. Finally, for once in Skyar's miserable existence, she was able to take a damn hit. She nodded, staying silent, turning around and leading me through the extravagant corridors towards a room whose door was made of polished, slightly red wood. She opened the door to reveal a brightly lit room with many different trays of exotic foods and drinks on display, along with beautiful works of art all over the walls. This was no simple room. 
This was an extravagant penthouse. They were providing me with, at least for a short time, that I would be allowed some brief respite from my exhausting visit on Earth. Skia closed the door behind her, her scales turning a mournful violet as the door clicked behind her. She sighed, looking towards me with sympathetic eyes. I know you hate me, Scala Scala, she muttered, rubbing her left arm as if she were wounded. But I had to be the one to see this. This is my job, Scalan. This is what I'm supposed to do. I don't mean to upset you. I really don't, but... Then stop talking to me, I hissed, blinking at my own reaction to the female. I sighed, my eyes closing, a twang of guilt striking my conscience as I slowly slid off my lab coat, letting it fall to the floor. Someone else could clear my mess. I was utterly exhausted and still had work to do. Apologies, it's been uh, a rough time here on Earth. I do not hate you, Skya. I find you incredibly annoying, but I do not hate you. I replied, a flash of yellow appearing on my scales as I approached a human sanitation station. They called it a shower. I moved towards the shower, closing the restroom door behind me, and, after some trial and error, figured out how to operate the strange decontamination chamber and began to work at cleaning myself off of the grime and stress off of my duration on the human world. I cared not if Skaya was in the main room on the other side of the door while I bathed. It was her decision to escort me here. Likely, she was to see to me for the duration of my stay here while Agent Brown prepared to escort me to the humans and Valan leaders. Would the High Command be here on Earth? It was unlikely. I didn't trouble myself with the thoughts of what was to come, however. I was more focused on, for once during my stay, having some peace and quiet. I could have sang I was so relieved to have some fresh water wash over my exhausted form. What in the heavens was I going to say? Everything since I arrived here seemed to be a blur now. Agent Brown seemingly vanished, leaving me in Skiyar's care, of all people. Although I assumed that was likely the work of the Valan leadership after hearing of the rituals I'd gone through while here. Speaking of my diplomatic assistant, I heard a tapping on the wooden door through the roar of the rushing water falling upon me. I sighed, placing a hand on the beige tiles that adorned the very clean marble shower. Scala Scalad, are, are you okay? That incessant, bright voice screeched through the wood door. I grumbled, rumbling my face. I had no more desire to play nice with this diplomat, yet I would remain cordial. I would remain friendly. I needed to. I couldn't allow emotions to write over my thoughts on humanity. I couldn't let them wreck my irritation, my exhaustion, and my desire to just go home skew my opinions. Skia was a good test of my resolve, I supposed. I am fine, ya, yeah, I called out, cutting my cleansing short and turning off the water, stepping out to dry myself off with one of the very, very soft towels they had provided. Humans had a way with luxury. I began to get dressed into my official scholar cast robes, keeping the soft, damp towel hung on the convenient rack as I walked out. The coolness of the room refreshing on my cleansed form. Remember, it's a diplomatic skia outside of this room, she insisted, causing me to roll my eyes in disdain as I moved over towards my coat, grabbing many bits and pieces of technology I may have overlooked and stuffing them into my robe pockets. Humans could not touch our technology. Not yet, at least. Not until I've said my piece. Not until the Valan leaders decided what to do about this primitive species. I would not allow an oversight on my part to ruin all of this. I would not allow my exhaustion to mean nothing. What are you doing, Skalan? You're acting quite paranoid. Ya yeah, commented, taking a few tentative steps towards me as she watched me double, though. Trevor checked my lab coat and discarded clothing for anything I may have missed. The phylactery, the communicator, and a few other technological odds and ends I bring with me no matter where I go. I gave a faint laugh, shaking my head. Humanity seems to be rubbing off on me, I replied, standing up, stretching, and giving a faint yawn as I turned to look at my dreaded shipmate. Life was in soft towels and amazing food for me while I was here, yeah. I know, she nodded. Her scale shining a brilliant, if gaudy violet. That's why the High Command got involved. Everyone on the ship got to hear your trials under human general's care. I was quite worried about you. Scar Rash was throwing fits about it. We were forced to detain her, she muttered, causing my scales to shimmer orange in irritation once more. 
Detain. What did she do? It couldn't have been that drastic. I replied, laughing faintly. Skiar shook her head, her scales dimming. Skiar's scales never dimmed. She was a bright, bubbly, shining example of annoying glee. What could cause her scales to dim? What did Skaresh do? Skaresh, uh, once the general began to insinuate that he was going to take you aside and uh, convince you of his ideologies, attempted to detonate the engine core of the shuttle that you and the warriors took to the base, she was going to kill them for trying to, uh, well, um, you know, she muttered, rubbing her arm once again. We all knew how emotionally charged she was, and that once she left, after all, you were the one who gave her those eyes of hers, she said softly, so it was only natural that she would overreact considering how dire the circumstances were. She is to be detained until you return, Skaya nodded, my own scales turning blue in shock. Detonate the engine core. Has she gone mad? I proclaimed, running a hand through my quills as I shook my head in disbelief. And I didn't give her those eyes. I simply helped design them. Regardless, that is not how a scholar is supposed to react when tragedy strikes. What is she going to do if a plague hits a colony world and she starts to fix it? Blow it up, I exclaimed, my scales turning orange once more. Oh, Skuya, you were a fantastic diplomat. This was the last thing I needed to hear in this present moment. Lan, she began, immediately drawing my attention, was addressing me with my informal name. Skaresh had no clutch, mother. Skaresh's entire clutch was destroyed in an earthquake on her home world. Like it or not, you are the only parental figure in her life. Don't think that none of us notice how you two operate. You may not notice, but we diplomats do. She is a pupil to you, but to her, you are a clutch, father. If you look at humanity as cold and calculating as you look at someone who clearly sees you as a parent, I fear for the future of our relations to humanity, she chastised, causing me to take a step back. None of us questioned why she attempted to do what she did. She was in such an emotional stress that she had no true primary color. She was maddened at the thought of losing her only parent. You know as well as I do that she's going to be a great scholar of biology if she can survive you. If she can be emotionally attached to you, Skalan. Her eyes narrowed, and I saw, for the first time, angry red on the bubbly diplomat scales. How can anyone be atrociously attached to you is absurd. You have no personality. You are your work. Everything is about your work. Skoresh is a pupil that you are culturally bound to teach. But other than that, did you even think about her once during your discussion with the general? Did you think about how the future with humanity might influence some of our nymphs like Skoresh? Have you ever once considered that a new species' thoughts, opinions, and cultures might make our newest generations far better and more powerful than any other Valan before them? She asked, pressing claw into my chest, demanding my answer. I had none. I had never once considered what humanity would mean to our people. I had only thought of how humanity would lie, cheat, and steal our technology for their own personal gain. I never once thought, remember Lan? She spoke softly. Her scales beginning to glow a soft yellow. They knocked on our door first. Speaking of doors, the door to my room opened and Agent Brown appeared, looking at us both, giving a sigh of fear. Hey, um, Skalan, it's, uh, time. End of chapter. Chapter 17 Skalan, it's time. I am quite aware, Agent Brown. You know, uh... If you want, we could probably delay the hearing. Uh, wait until you're, uh, 100%. I dusted off my lab coat, my eyes narrowing and scales growing orange with disdain. I was quite done with Earth. I was quite done with all of this waiting. Was I tired? Of course I was. Was I hungry? Well, uh, I was. But I'd rather take the time to properly enjoy human food without some hearing over the fate of both of our people looming over our head. In short... I was done with waiting. I took a few steps forward, feeling a hand rush towards my shoulder, clasping me at. Skia seemed to want final words as well. My quills rose, my orange deepening in tone. I was sick of playing their waiting games. Skala Skalan, please, if you are not in the right frame of mind speaking to these leaders, a, a lot of weight will come with your opinion, she muttered, Violet in a concern. I scoffed, rolling my eyes and shaking my head. Of course I understand. Skala Skalad will do the best for the Bula, as is expected of him. I mocked, waving my hand in dismissal. 
You act as if I haven't thought about what I was going to say at all when you first announced that I would be speaking to the leadership of both of our species. I sighed, taking a few steps forward. To be quite clear with both of you, I know exactly what I'm going to say. No amount of rest or food is going to change my opinion. I stated plainly, a rumble rising from my chest in irritation. Now, Agent Brown, can we please get this over with? The faster I speak my mind, the faster those with far more political clout than you or I can discuss how best to approach this. I just want to go home. Agent Brown was somewhat taken aback by the statement. It wasn't too harsh, was it? Perhaps it was, but it was the honest truth. All I could think was the resting in my own quarters. All I could think about, especially after Skyar brought it up, was making sure that my apprentice had peace of mind. Her words hit me harder than I thought they would. It hurt to think of how much emotional pull I had over my apprentice. I did care about Skoresh, but had I truly shirt? Why would I? It was my duty to educate her, not to be a clutch father. More and more responsibility was placed on my shoulders. Or rather... More and more responsibility was revealed the longer I stayed on Earth. Who in the right mind decided that a scholar had any right to give any opinion on political activities of both of their own species and an entirely different one? Who in their right mind would give someone like me the responsibilities of both molding a nymph into a respectable scholar and a proper Valon citizen? Was that not what Academy instructors were for? It wasn't the same, however. I knew that. Nothing could replace a clutch mother and father. I still remembered mine fondly, as well as all my siblings. I still kept in contact with one of them after all these years. He was a warrior caste, however, so our discussions were usually just, as the humans put it, catching up. We shared little in common other than our birth rotation. Still, he did attend my ascension ceremony. Once I was given the title of scholar, just as I attended his once he was named Warrior. I was uncertain over the fate of those who raised me as a hatchling. It uh, just wasn't a thing a lot of Balon thought about. It was a thing we all took for granted. It was what was expected of us. If we were to reproduce, it was expected that we would mind our children for a while before they left to find their place in our society. It was far more personal with humans. Many human children in that hospital were between childhood and adulthood, yet their birth parents were still there by their side. Everything was far more personal with humans than it was with the Valan. For a species that wore their emotions on their sleeves, the Valan seemed rather cold in retrospect. I shook my head free of those thoughts, taking a few more strides towards Agent Brown. As I said, I am ready to speak. Lead me to where they are expecting me, I ordered. Actually, feeling a bit of satisfaction for finally giving a direction instead of being led by a leash. Agent Brown nodded, both to me and Skiyar, as he turned around and nodded his head to towards the hall outside of the guest room. Remember what I said, Scholar Skalan, Skiyar called out while my scales took a deeper hue of annoyance. Agent Brown took the hint, and both he and I made our way outside of the room, leaving a nervous diplomat behind. Good riddance. The walk through the hallways of this building seemed far more daunting than I first anticipated, my scales shifting from orange to vibrant green and anxiety. It was far easier to say that I was ready to speak than it was to actually speak. It was not my place to speak. I always hated doing so unless it was in a strict academic setting. Rambling on about information only my own cause cared about was far easier than giving input on political engagements. I gave a faint laugh at the thought, causing Agent Brown to hum. What's up? he asked, slowing down his pace to walk beside me. All I've been thinking of since I've been here was how I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this, how it wasn't my place. I feel like I'm being dragged around, kicking and screaming, I replied, feeling a bit better, finally getting this off my chest. Agent Brown lofted an eyebrow. That's life, friend, uh... He spoke in a nonchalant tone, shrugging his shoulders. Very few of us really get to do what we want to do. It's gonna hit you, Valon, very hard when your whole life is based around what you do for work, he muttered, causing me to look at him inquisitively as we turned the corner. Well, if it is what is expected of us, we are given a role best suited to our personalities and proficiencies, I mused, causing Agent Brown to crack a smirk. That's, uh, great and all, but 
I know I'd be absolutely miserable if I had to do this my entire life. You're a scholar. That's all you are, he hummed. I crossed my arms, a bit insulted at this. Very correct statement. It is what I am good at, I pouted. Of course it is what you're good at, Scalan. I'm good at my job, too. That doesn't stop me from enjoying hosting parties for others or even teaching on the side. Work shouldn't dictate who you are. That's why humans can do hard labor and still be happy. It isn't who they are. They aren't just construction workers or waitresses. They're parents, teachers, priests, and even community activists. Humans can be whatever they want, whenever they want. If you decide tomorrow you wanted to be a performer, could you be one? More and more people began to appear as we approached our destination. Yet his words stung and distracted me from the Valon and the human eyes staring at me in anticipation. Of course I could. We are people. I am still allowed to have hobbies. I am even given an allowance of resources to pursue my hobbies. The Valan are not just cogs in a machine, I replied. I am good at what I do. All Valan are good at what they do. Entertaining others isn't the same as deciding the fate of an entire species, I argued. Agent Brown shrugged his shoulders. You've got a point, Scalon, he muttered, laughing softly as we moved through the crowd. Maybe you are ready to speak your piece. Then again, who the hell am I to judge, he replied, as the crowds began to become larger, the volume of their voices growing louder. Guess it just goes to show that humans don't really know crap. You, Valon, are the big boys with the big toys. It's really up to you guys if you want your little brothers and sisters to tag along on your big space adventures, he cackled, his expressionless face shifting into something uh, almost human. It was jarring to see genuine emotion appear on Agent Brown's face for the first time. We approached a few security personnel, each one nodding their heads to Agent Brown and allowing us to squeeze through their burly forms as humans rushed us with microphones and cameras. The security barked at the press, causing them to argue amongst one another as we made our way further and further back. The volume dimmed as we made our way down the hallway with fine art and regal rug that sprawled down its length. It became almost hauntingly quiet as one security guard stood in front of the door, grimming us down with an indifferent gaze. His head was shaved bald, tinted spectacles covered his eyes, leaving only an emotionless face and hulking, burly mass to guard the way. I don't think even Scar Anna would trifle with such a titan of a human. The swan, Scalon, he asked, his voice heavily accented, yet he still spoke English. This is him, Dimitri. Take care of him, eh? Dagent Brown requested, causing the huge man to let out a loud cough off. No one died yet under me watching them. The area will be fine. He spoke with absolute confidence. This man was to be my bodyguard. I turned to look at Agent Brown in confusion. I thought you were my escort, I muttered, causing Agent Brown to laugh, shaking his head. It is the end of our relationship right here, Scalan. I have things to do and people to see. Can't expect me to watch you everywhere. That would be creepy. He nodded, patting my back, quickly pulling his hand back after his flesh pierced one of my quills, causing me to bend over laughing as I spotted the blood. Looks like there was still some stiffness to my quills. I wasn't so old after all. Damned aliens, he pouted, wiggling his hand as Dimitri took out some gauze from his black, fine tailored jackets in a pocket and, without another word, began treating the wound. I took the derogatory statement in stride, perhaps even with a bit of pride. I wounded a human and, with their remarkable physiology, that was an accomplishment in my book. After the agent's hand had been bandaged up, Dimitri began to mutter into a small wire hooked into his ear. Even with how primitive human technology was, it appeared that they still had quite a few channels to communicate through. It was fascinating, if a bit jarring. Just how many humans had I walked by that had communicated my presence to others? It was no wonder that someone as frightening as Agent Brown and this Dimitri fellow had been tasked to keep me safe during my stay on this planet. Everything is ready for him, Brown, Dimitri spoke, looking towards the two of us. Agent Brown laughed, giving an almost sad look in my direction as he took a few steps back. All right, Scalan, that's my cue, he replied, looking towards the other end of the hallway. I'll be watching. We all will be watching. It's been nice talking to you, an alien. Even if you tell them that the Valanche should stay far, far away from humanity, it was still a pleasure to meet one. He spoke, nodding his head in what I assumed was respect. 
Take it easy, friend. And just like that, Agent Brown turned and walked away. My gaze lingered on his form as it slowly began to grow smaller until he turned around the corner, vanishing from view. My scale shifted to a deep violet. Even Dimitri's company, I suddenly felt very, very alone. Skalon, he spoke, his tone gruff and stern. There is no place to worry. It will be quite simple. Four other Valan will already spoken today first. First they will announce you, then you will give small greeting. Then your high command will acknowledge and request your statement and state of humanity. Afterwards, each human leader with a question will announce and ask a question you are under no obligation to answer. Dimitri stated, slowly turning to open the door behind him, the quiet rumbling of hushed voices bellowing out from the circle chamber as the door slowly opened. Now they expecting you. Do not be too troubled. I have faith in you. And we just met. My eyes went wide. It was filled with humans, all sitting in a circle surrounding a large podium. Each one of them was dressed to impress. Somewhat. I recognized some of their formal wear, but others in the crowd of human leaders were wearing outlandish, yet still quite aesthetically pleasing outfits. I was stunned to see how many different cultures humans had. Even more surprising to me was that these different cultures were all sitting down together to discuss this. And I couldn't help but glow a bright blue. We knew they all had different countries and different cultures, but the fact that they were all sitting down together, they weren't connected by remote terminals like I'd assumed that they would be. They were together, in person, ready to listen to me. Humanity, the very species that suspected everyone and anyone could kill or harm them, managed to put all of that aside, to listen to a different species that stumbled on their front lawn by accident. Needless to say, I was quite impressed. However, they were not the only race present. Towering above them were three different monitors. Each monitor cast the image of the bust of the three high commanders. Their judgmental gaze poured down on me, and I nearly buckled at the weight. These were legendary figures for my people. Barely anyone saw or even spoke to the three of them. My eyes were glued on those monitors in sheer awe. It was kind of funny. I was prepared to step up to the podium and just speak my mind about what had happened. I was ready to shake my fist at these leaders and tell them how I felt, and then take the first shuttle to my ship and sleep for seven human centuries. However, now that I actually stood in presence of the human and of Elan political titans, my courage wavered, and I was but a hatchling again. My heart raced. Dimitri seemed to notice my hesitation and my sudden stage fright his hand grasping my shoulder as he nodded forwards, silently snapping me out of my daze. Step by cautious step, I moved towards the center of the room. Nervous, stern, and curious human eyes drilled holes into my very soul as I saw the wooden pony with the microphone attached. The flashing red and shuttering sounds of primitive cameras wielded by human press that had been given exclusive access to the room echoed an eerie silence of it all. There was a human at the podium already, a female human with her hair as yellow as the system star. Ladies and gentlemen, scholar of biology, Scalan, the woman spoke with a weak smile on her face. The human crowd applauded as I approached the podium myself, slowly beginning to walk up to the small staircase to stage in the center of the circular regal room. The humans applauded, yet the Vlan High Command did not. Instead, each one of them wore a deep green on their scales, except the High Commander of Diplomacy, who wore a soft yellow in his, more than likely quite pleased with all of his communications with another species. I swallowed, slowly leaning forward, my breath echoing into the recording device on the podium as the applause seemed to die down. I extend the warmest greetings, High Commanders and Human Leaders. I am Skalan. I, <laughs> I must apologize in advance. I'm not quite used to this. I spoke softly into the microphone, my voice dim and weak from nerves. The High Commander of Diplomacy Scales brightened. A soft chuckle came from his chest. Relax, young scholar. You've had quite the journey. The High Commander of Diplomacy spoke. His tone and accent a near-perfect match to some of the other humans I'd spoken to. He spoke in perfect English. Over communicators, no one would ever suspect he wasn't human unless they saw him in person. 
there was a reason that he was the high commander of diplomacy. You have done quite well for yourself, regardless of your trying journey on Earth. However, it is that journey that we need to investigate. Indeed, a booming voice from the high commander of warfare spoke, his scales changing from green to a bright yellow to match the diplomat. Our new neighbors gave the other Valan that came to the planet quite the noble treatment. You are the only one that saw both sides of humanity. You were the only one we decided to leave mostly alone under human supervision. He spoke, causing the high commander of scholarship to scoff. Which is why you insisted we warp in to make the display of power when the young scholar found himself in trouble, she asked, a soft hum of amusement rising from her chest. Regardless of our fellow leaders along with us, they are waiting for your opinions on humanity as a whole. We've heard diplomat after diplomat speak. I'm eager to hear what one of my own caste has to say. Speak, young Scalan. What do you think of humanity, she said. The whole room faded away as I looked up towards the three most respected and valued Valon in the entire galaxy. These three were elected to lead us. Every Valon colony, almost unanimously amongst each of the castes, voted for these specific individuals to preside over all Valon affairs, foreign and now domestic. Each one of them looked down upon me like three gods of old, and they expected me to speak coherently and honestly. And that's not even going into how those nervous human eyes looked at me. I, I managed to blurt out, feeling, oh, so very small. I cleared my throat, breathing at my nerves, a determined, bold orange yellow appearing in my scales. You wish for my opinion on humanity? Very well. You're the most paranoid, self-centered, and individualistic species any one of our fiction writers could ever have conceived of. I spoke, hush whispers echoing through the room. They have opinionated, they are bold, they distrust anything different than themselves that could threaten the safety of their people, even if that thing isn't even a threat. In a word, they are dangerous. I paused, a soft laugh following a suit afterwards. But that individuality breeds something great about them. Look around you, high commanders. All of these completely different leaders, with different cultures, ideals, and beliefs, are still sitting together in peace to greet us. That human danger breeds human achievement. It was humanity that made the first move to greet us. Humanity, for all of its paranoia, still welcomed us onto this planet and didn't attempt to kill us. Well, aside from one, I muttered, clearing my throat. You wish to know my true opinion of humanity? The Valon Colonial Union and these uh, united human nations could never ever get along. You are just too different. Yet the Valar people and humanity would be woefully remiss if we did not embrace our new neighbors. We stand to gain so much from each other. We are an old, tired species. Humans are a new hatchling eager to make an impact. We need them just as much as they need us. Humans cannot be matched in their adaptability, their keen intuition, and their remarkable technological advancements in a short periods of time, I stated, taking in a deep breath. Humans cannot know failure. They will do everything and anything to succeed, even in the direst of circumstances. They make ferocious enemies and incredible companions. It would be a crime to cut ties with them. But the rotten fruit amongst them would spoil the whole bunch, I admitted, my scales turning a soft violet in woe. I cannot recommend providing these human nations with the means to reach the cosmos alongside us, I admitted. I also cannot recommend we cut ties with them completely. Fortunately, I do have an idea. And what would that be, Scholar Scalan? The High Commander of Diplomacy asked, his scales matching my own in their violet hue. Well, my very gracious host, General McCullen, showed me that there are humans amongst these nations that are discarded. There are humans amongst these nations that are wasted potential, in my eyes. Considering that humans tend to treat those that offer aid in the highest esteem, even risking physical injury to do so, I propose we take their discarded humans with us. Humans cannot know failure. So why not test their resolve? Why not give these discarded humans another chance to succeed when their fellows decree that they are useless? We provide our hatchlings and nymphs many, many chances at success. I feel that humanity would take those chances and exceed our expectations ten times over, I stated, my scales growing a bright yellow in hope.
You want us to take humans away from Earth to join us? The High Commander questioned. I wouldn't call it taking them. I'd consider it opening another door after the first was slammed shut. Let the humans that want to come with us come with us. Let them show us and the other humans that thought them lazy or unmotivated how powerful I know they are. I wished I could grin, for I could almost hear the screams of anger from General McCullum. The High Commander of Scholarship could barely contain her giggling. I personally love this idea. I have noticed human ingenuity as well. It would prove quite an asset to the Academy of Scholarship, she stated. If humans are as passionate and dangerous as you say, then having them as allies rather than rivals would be a boon, the High Commander of Warfare decreed not even hiding his amusement. The only High Commander that seemed uneasy was the High Commander of Diplomacy, who began to notice the rapid whispers of the humans in the room around us. You pass harsh judgment on our neighbors, Scholar Scalan. You even risk losing much of the friendly communications with such recommendations. However, I too have noticed the harsh treatment of some of these less fortunate humans here on Earth. It is a noble cause to wish to bring them to a better life. However, they are a different species, and, as you said, they are dangerous and individualistic. They are unlikely to acclimate to our culture. They could even risk causing discord amongst our own people. Why should we risk taking humans among us? Why should we lord over these human nations as holier-than-thou aliens that threaten the stability? of their established cultures, he asked, causing me to recoil at the very good points he made. I'm not saying that we should make them Valan citizens and steal them away. I'm proposing a mutual effort by both these human nations, as well as to create a cooperative union between our species. We stand to gain much from each other, but we also could lose everything if one species dominates the other. Early cooperation and communication could very well make the difference in maintaining our cultural differences. I'd never suggest we simply take humans and force them to become Valant citizens, each human in a caste. That would never work with their individuality. Instead, why not use some of the underdeveloped colony worlds that we have at our disposal to found multi-species academies? Willing humans, as well as willing Valanums, can choose to attend these. Willing humans would be allowed to innovate and find their calling, like we Valan are. And wild nymphs struggling to find a place can bond with the species that share many similarities with them. As the humans say, two birds with one stone. I nodded. The human crown hushed, and the high command of diplomacy hummed. What a fascinating idea. You have um, thought of this quite a lot. I am genuinely impressed. You would have made a fine diplomat, Scholar Scalan, he replied turning his head from the side to side. However, how can we be sure that this would not end in disaster? It is a very optimistic viewpoint of an idea, but I fail to see how something like this would succeed in practice. He replied in dismissal, And what would this cooperative union even hope to achieve that we have not? Well, for starters, we wouldn't be alone in the galaxy anymore. I replied. How long have we been alone, High Commander? Do you really wish to go back to that? I asked. The silence answered my question. Even our High Commander shuddered at the thought of being the only species in the galaxy once more. I closed my eyes, giving a sigh. As for humans, well, I have a hunch that many humans, without very much to show for themselves, would be itching at the opportunity to spite the very world that abandoned them. Perhaps it is a leap of faith. Perhaps it is wishful thinking, optimistic thought, but like it or not, humanity will soon be joining us in the galaxy. They'll work tirelessly to join us. I'd rather see the downtrodden here be extended some sort of courtesy from their galactic neighbors before they watch their fellow humans soar off into the cosmos without being given the opportunity themselves. If humans are deprived of homes, food, and basic necessities right now, how likely is it that they will be granted permission to see the grand majesty of the galaxy? I asked. There was a pause. It was a very long pause. Was my idea flawed? Very much so. But it was the best input I could provide. 
I feared these humans, but I grew fond of them just the same. I didn't want to leave them on this planet, nor did I want of them those that failed to succeed to rot on their homeworld. The cosmos was vast enough for everyone, and I believed humanity could very well spark a golden age not even the Villan could have even imagined. Of course, it would also be hilarious to see General McCullen's reaction when he saw all of those lazy people make something of themselves with us. Finally, the High Commander of Diplomacy broke the silence. And how do you propose we allow these humans to join us? He questioned, causing me to give a faint laugh. Humans are very physically emotional, High Commander. I'd rather not imagine what would happen if a leader told their people no to our offer. The statement caused another silence. The High Commander of Diplomacy hummed. We have much to consider. Perhaps it is time for us to deliberate and the human leaders to question you now, he said, his scales turning green with worry. My eyes went wide. Oh, right, the human leaders, uh, who I just uh, condemned. Uh, well, uh, this is going to be fun. End of chapter. Have you ever been in a situation where everyone in the room is judging you? I'm fairly certain, no matter what one species is, that will have had a situation like that. Family, friends, peers in your field, we've all had to go through one of these situations where the whole world rests on your shoulders. Or at least, that is what it felt like. Feeling that glaring, that judgmental eyes of all the human leaders directly on me, I'd condemn them, but not their people. This is why it should have been diplomat in my place. A scholar has no right to talk to anyone. I felt the chains of my caste pull me back from the social scandal. They'd wanted my opinion, and I gave it. Why were their eyes filled with such malice? Why did I feel like the whole room was filled with contempt for me? They knew what I asked when they asked for my input. They had no right to judge me so. My scales glared a green orange and irritated anxiety as they whispered amongst themselves, casting side glances towards me during the brief silence of my stance of the human Valon relationship. I gave them everything that they wanted from me. I gave my opinion. What more did they want? First, the representative of Sweden has the floor, a feminine voice spoke, her voice echoing out from the primitive broadcasting device around the room. One man in the back of the well-lit circular room rose from his seat, his clothes exquisite from what I could see. His hair was the color of pure fire, and I prayed that that fire was the only cosmetic. Well, first off, uh, before my questions, I am aware of what happened to you when you first arrived here, scholar. He spoke, his voice twinged with an accent. It is English still understandable, even to my idiot ears. It is only natural that there would be some mistrust. I don't think anyone here, aside from the truly proud amongst us, would deny you that much. In my opinion, your harsh judgment is expected. He said almost in a, was it, fatherly tone. From how terrifying and imposing this large man was, his words dripped with honey, and my scales swiftly retreated from the orange hue as my irritation at their judgment seemed to fade. It was no wonder this man was considered a leader. Nevertheless, he trailed off, I find your proposal not only insulting but troubling. You come to us with ships the size of planets, guns pointed at our very home for daring to keep one of you against their will, a simple broadcast informing the public would have done more than enough to free you. But such blatant display of power was not meant to free a, uh, pardon me if this sounds insulting, simple citizen of your people. In my opinion, and like many of my associates who I have spoken to at great length about this issue, such a display was to establish dominance to a lesser species. He scolded, eyes growing wide. Wouldn't you agree, scholar? he asked, eyebrows lifting as he expected an answer. W well... I cleared my throat. In Valan society, we are all equal, from our leaders to our nymph students, I nodded. We are uncertain what you would do if things became dire. Everyone equal, indeed. Would the humans you brought with you to God knows where say the same? He asked, a smirk traveling on his lips. Would they be equal amongst you? All the Valan pet propaganda project let us, the primitive humans, know just how wrong we were to abandon our people like you say? He asked. Falling over the leaders, my shoulders sank, but a determined glow hit my scales. Of course, we were equal the moment we found you. 
You could have fooled us, was all he replied with before he raised his hand. No further questions. I hand the floor over to the next representative, he said before I could retort, taking his seat. I sighed, feeling the sting of the subtle aggression behind his honeyed words. Next representative from China has the floor. A smaller, younger man began to rise, dressed to impress same as the fiery-haired man. Black facial hair adorned his face, stylized in a manner I had not seen previously. His youth did not mask his intelligence, for instead of contempt like I saw from many of the representatives, all I saw was study, much like a scholar. He was sizing me up, as if examining me for any potential weakness that he could exploit. Most of my concerns have been addressed by my associate. He spoke, his words accented well. They did not flow the same, his accent thick, yet the authority in his voice was just the same. Did all of these people know English? It was my understanding that many of these countries had their own individual languages and cultures. I grew confused. Why would each of these leaders know one particular language? They were leaders of their countries, correct? Why would they know the primary language of a different country? Trade relations could only go so far, right? Did they learn the language simply for trade? My scales shimmered in thought until I heard the man speak once more. Do you know what you offer? He asked, raising one of his eyebrows inquisitively. Do you know what you are offering to do? I don't think you do. Not really. New offer is not extending a hand out of friendship, but out of fear, he said, clearing his throat. Why would you not offer to simply build here on Earth. My associates and I welcome you in our boon arms. If you are so charitable to take and our less than fortunate citizens, why would you want to take them away? Why would they? They the only ones you permit to come with you? He asked, causing my scales to dim in fear. Well, uh, I just, uh, I don't mean to. You don't not trust us, he answered for me waving his hands dismissively. No relationship in trade or diplomacy can be forged on lack of trust. We trusted you with your giant ships and massive guns to not destroy us. But for all of that technology you have, for all of your advancements in technology, you still don't trust us to accept your gifts with gratitude. Why do you truly believe that we would betray you either second that you let your guard down? He asked, a twinge of anger in his voice as I began to shrink. At this point in time, scholar, I don't believe your people are any kind of salvation or even needed. We do not need your kind of salvation or offer. We are better off alone if you are the best the galaxy can provide. He scoffed, sitting back down in his seat and sipping on a glass of water. The next representative can speak. The blonde female human didn't have the chance to announce who would speak next. The leader from China had blown open the lid to their mutual concern and anger. And the next leader, a fair-skinned man with gray hair, was the first to stand up, pointing an accusatory finger towards me. He is right, he exclaimed, sighing, shaking his head. You do not trust us, but you want us to be a part of your galactic civilization. You want humanity as pets, he exclaimed, causing my scales to flare up a dark red in anger. That's not fair. You wanted my opinion, and I gave it. It is not my fault. All I saw while I was here was mutual distrust of everything and everyone. You humans only look out for yourselves, and if you don't believe me, you clearly haven't taken a look outside. I barked back, my eyes going wide at my sudden outburst. Strangely enough, the gray-haired man began to laugh at my outburst. And you proved us wrong with that mindset, How? The giant ships in the sky, the air of superiority around you. Please do tell us, scholar. I'm dying to know, he spoke, his passive-aggressive tone only driving my anger further onward. I wished his accent was thicker so I wouldn't be able to understand him speak. My tolerance for humanity was fading swiftly. You're right. We have flexed our muscles next to your world. But aside from letting you know that we are not to be trifled with in case you decided to treat us as a whole as you treated me when I arrived here, have we done anything wrong? I asked. He sat back down, raising his hands. Not yet. The only reason Germany even accepted this invitation was because, despite your blatant show of technological prowess, you haven't done anything to warrant us casting you out. You talk in here, cast judgment upon all of us, with only just meeting us this month. And then you expect all of us to submit to your whims. Scholar, that is not how progress can be made between two nations. We are not your pets. Unless you bring something better to the table that is agreeable to all parties involved. I am sorry to say that humanity and your kind will remain apart. 
It was but one leader who refused, but from the hush drawn over the leaders, if they were even leaders, seemed all to silently agree with his statement. My opinion was unacceptable to these humans. They'd rather see the downtrodden remain as such before ever even suggesting that I had a point. Sure, they posed many good points, particularly the younger man with the darker skin. I didn't trust humanity. I didn't trust them at all. I feared that they would learn from us and obliterate us. Was that fear? No. Was it reasonable? Maybe. That is why we needed to simply take humans who wanted to go with us. They needed to be watched. They needed to be... Uh... My eyes went wide. My scales dark blue. No, oh, no. I wanted to control them. I was so petrified of them that I feared that they would use anything we gave them as a weapon. I feared that they would destroy everything about us and kill every last person because, well, if they treated their less fortunate like dirt, how would they treat us? G gods I was becoming the general. More and more representatives asked questions and stated their opinion, some as angry as the leader from Germany, others quite composed and confident. Each leader was different from the last, yet I was in my own mind for most of it. I didn't listen to anyone besides the general. Did Dr. Mormheim ever ask for any technology when I was assisting? No. She just asked for my help. Did Agent Brown ever take anything from me? Despite him helping me to bed when I had nanites used to save those children in my pocket? No. I didn't trust humanity at all. I didn't trust any of these primitives, and they saw right through me. Every. Single. One. A familiar voice followed suit, putting me out of my head as my finished answers, the representative of South Africa's questions. It became clear to me, about halfway through this trial by fire, that these were not truly the leaders of their respective countries. Rather, they were sent as ambassadors. It made sense. All of these leaders in one spot was risky. One angry citizen with a bunch of explosives would have thrown the world into chaos. They spoke on behalf of their leaders and that was enough for me and the High Command. After all, not even they were physically present here. Opting to send in eager diplomats like Skyar instead of while they simply had themselves broadcasted. Hit this voice, the one that I heard before, as was based that contained it. They had only spoken to her for a few moments when I first arrived, but the aura of authority radiating for the President seemed to, somehow, despite my feeling like the scum of the galaxy, make me feel even smaller. She showed no menace or contempt towards me, only a disappointed look of a clutch mother towards her young. I was easily this woman's elder by nearly 100 years, and even still, I felt like a child. Scala Scalan, she stated, her voice barely containing her own woes. After all, it had only been a short time since the general was imprisoned due to his actions against us. I sighed softly. This whole situation seemed to be growing further and further out of hand. I didn't mean to have anyone jailed, insulted, or even threatened. I just wanted to go home, and maybe, just maybe, have a new species as a galactic friend when I returned. The likelihood of this seemed far less optimistic as it previously had been. First and foremost, as everything has happened to you, happened while in my country, I extend my deepest apologies for any stress or threats to your safety. Had we known about that earlier, none of it would have happened. It was a hiccup in our intelligence, she stated, closing her eyes for a moment, gathering her thoughts. It never ceased to amaze me how humanity could just bounce back from turmoil, or at least put on a good face while suffering from it. Humanity could hide their emotions when they needed to. It was both a blessing and a curse, from how I saw it. When a Valan was upset, people would try to comfort them as best as they could, Humanity had to admit it, and, from what I could tell from the President's tone, they needed to hide it. There was a time and place for emotion in humanity, and it broke my heart at how little time would be spared for it. It was no wonder humans had such emotional outbursts. That being said, the fact that you cast judgment on one aspect of us you hardly understand is only insulting but ignorant. We understand perfectly well that all the Lan are equal, and there needs to be seen to. But Skalan, how many planets do you have resources to pull from? She asked, crossing her arms. How many people do you have ready to and able to help those in need? How many teachers, instructors, engineers, biologists do you have to ensure the advancement of your kind? 
You have nearly unlimited resources and labor to achieve your goals and species-wide philosophy that is truly, truly haunting to see. Nothing on Earth resembles that. Nothing on Earth could resemble that. We do the best with what we have, but to see the species that can create planets to travel in, what gives you the right to judge us at all? She asked, raising an eyebrow. I had no response. She really was like my clutch mother. Did I need to bring her sweets and an apology card before I could go collect flora with my friends next? Was I, as the humans called it, grounded? All that being said, I actually have no questions for you, she stated, giving me a disappointed look, but I do have a counteroffer that I think is far more agreeable than the one you proposed. I blinked, looking around the room as more hushed whispers and even a few laughs followed her statement. Really? A counteroffer? Why would they... I began talks as soon as what you do regarding the Villan the moment your ship was reported to have arrived. We've come up with four possible plans of action by colleagues and I, she stated, looking up to the monitors as the high commanders one by one returned, almost as if on cue. Apparently, they were growing impatient, or perhaps concerned. Whatever the case, it was a bit troubling how quick they were to return once humanity stated it had been a plan of action to counter my own. Well, look at that. If I didn't know any better, I would have said that you've been listening. The president spoke, causing a soft rumble of laughter from the assembled human representatives. The high commanders looked less than amused at a joke. We have followed your schedule provided for us, the high commander of scholarship stated. We're here, there you have a counter offer. If you are all quite finished scolding the young scholar for being, dare I say it, a civilian... I am more than prepared to listen and make at least some headway so that we aren't just throwing Scholar Scalan out into the cold, she stated coldly, a twinge of orange on her scales in mild annoyance. She was the leader of my caste, though died quite miffed about the treatment of someone of a fault. The president seemed far less than that pressed. The human leader had quite the weak, and even in the face of a species that piloted ships on a planetary scale, she still stood tall. He stopped being a civilian to us the moment he arrived near our planet, like it or not, High Command. He is one of the few people who made first contact with us. He may be a civilian, by your standards, but that is where honesty lies. It's been nothing, a back-and-forth discussion in staff rooms since we were able to contact you. Like it or not, Skalan has been among people, sick, healthy, rich, and poor, during his time here. I ask you, as a fellow leader, what opinion would you value more? A person looking through the monitor at your planet, or someone who, uh, walked on your planet? She asked, raising an eyebrow. There was a hush that followed her words, my eyes moving up to the monitor. The High Commander of Warfare Scales were a deep, brilliant orange. The High Commander of Scholarship seemed to enjoy the challenging mind before her, her scales a bright yellow. Yet, the rose hue appearing on the High Commander of Diplomacy Scales seemed to throw me off. Rose? It only appeared for the briefest of moments before fading into yellow. But I saw it, as did likely every Villan in the room. Oh, I can only imagine the gossip that would follow such a sight. My commander fancies a human leader. President McCullen knew how to make an impression, it seemed. Now, as I was saying, she began, again after the hush settled, I actually agree with Scalan. There isn't enough being done for our homeless and struggling. We just don't have the time or resources to deal with it. While I fail to see how that has anything to do with us being given a hand joining you in space, my fellow colleagues and I, as I said, have an alternative to shipping you those that would agree to bow before new masters. I beg your pardon. The High Commander of Diplomacy snapped back. I did not stutter. We're not stupid, High Commander. Just because we don't pilot planets doesn't mean that we can't see that you just want new exotic species to brighten the galaxy up a little. You want us to come with you, we'll come with you, but we're not abandoning our heritage and cultures just so that you feel a bit more comfortable with us, uh, primitives, she scoffed, clearing her throat as the high commanders looked at each other, scales all mutually shifting to red at scalding words. We want you to build here on Earth, she replied, looking up, suddenly catching the high commander of God. Uh, excuse me? Excuse me? You insult us and then invite us to your world, the high commander of warfare barked, the human leader nodded. I have 13 human nations agreeing to it. That's a great start. We can do everything you want there, too. Invite any humans who's willing to participate, but no human can be left out. You want to lead us by example. Come to our home to do it. Bring your own resources, your own manpower, and your own supplies. 
We'll provide as much as we can to help. I completely agree that we, as a species, need to move forward and better ourselves. But we won't get there by you not trusting us as a whole. Enough to join you. You'll just be collecting pets, not embracing a new people, she said, a smile falling from her face. Thirteen places of study where we can learn from a species that has been here before. We aren't perfect, far from it, but we're quick studies. Give us thirteen bases of operation where both humans and Valan can exchange cultures, knowledge, and technology. And I think there's still hope for us yet, said Smirkin. And what's to stop you humans from taking what we offer and obliterating us when you have the technological ability to do so? The High Commander of Weather asked, leaning forwards towards the microphone. What's to stop you from using us for technology and abandoning us? What's to stop you from destroying us? Because why would we even remotely need to fight you or steal from you when there is a galaxy full of resources out there that we can learn to funnel to our own people? In a society where resources can be claimed by the planet, where no mouth will go unfed, why would we scorn you when you helped us reach the next step of our civilization? Do you see this is some kind of game? Are you that detached from being planet-bound that you can't see what you're offering us? There isn't a soul in this room that is unwilling to work with you because you're holding the keys to space. You're holding the keys to fixing every single problem Earth has, and you're afraid we're just going to use you after helping us to get off this rock. High Commanders, none of us expect to be given what you have to offer for free, but we all expect to be given the chance to earn it. The High Commanders looked at the human leader in awe, concern, and fusion. I was stunned myself. It was a valid question to ask. Why would they need to fight us when they could, if they were running out of resources, find another planet? There were millions of them. Even after all this time my species spent as space-sparing one, we still have not exhausted any of the resources the planets we claimed provided. In fact, most of our metals came from asteroid belts. Even with how much humanity consumed, not even they could hope to make a dent in what the galaxy had to offer. The High Commander of Diplomacy chuckled, shrugging his shoulders. I like it, he stated. It allows our people to meet a new species. It allows our young to grow into better individuals, having outside perspectives. My car stands to gain a lot from this proposal. I agree, the High Commander of Warfare admitted. Having a world with such intense weather patterns and higher gravity would help better train some of our own warriors for more extreme conditions. My car stands to gain much from it. The High Commander of Scholarship seemed to gain a look of satisfaction over her face. Would you look at that? All three of us agree. It'd allow us to research humanity, perhaps find some biological common ground between us. She mused, resting her head in her palm. My car stands to gain much from this, she said, her gaze turning towards me. Thank you for your input, Scholar Scalan. You are no longer required. You may return to your home ship. Wait, what? My eyes went wide. Oh, gods, I was finally going home. End of chapter. Chapter 19 Being escorted out of the room was simple enough. The blonde-haired woman that had announced each of the representatives walked over to me along with Dimitri. Dimitri was the muscle behind my escort as we made our way towards the back entrance. From what I could gather as I left the room, the discussions were fairly free-form between various leaders and the high commanders. It didn't matter to me. Not anymore. Call me petty if you wish. But my job was done. I was no longer needed for this political game. I was free from my duties and could return to where I was needed, what I was good at. As we left those large, dark red, wooden double doors to the hallway, I was overwhelmed as a sudden onslaught of blinding white flashes and human voices bellowed out. Microphones and cameras were shoved into my direction as I nearly leaned on that large human male while we marched through the sea of bodies. What happened when you first arrived, scholar? One of the voice demanded to know. Is all of humanity worth condemning for what happened? Did they probe you? Did they try and dissect you? Do you think humanity as a whole is ready for the space age? These humans were parasites. I hated them for the second I heard their voices. I knew their type. They were scum. They feasted on gossip. They swam in half-truths and... Some write downright lies. 
Not even Valar was safe from their kind. They were the press and, while they were essential to transmit news to the people, they were worms They cared little of how they extracted their information. Not even an exhausted, world-weary alien was safe from their prying questions and invasions of personal space. Dimitri was able to keep them from getting too close, and the blonde human was doing a fantastic job of rattling off vague answers that would do little but make the information junkies salivate for more. The press would get their stories. Eventually, not that, I was certain. If Valan Press was notorious for discovering things by putting their snouts where they didn't belong, I could only shudder with horror as to how these crafty humans got their information. People likely died in the pursuit of gossip. Of that, I was certain. Various security personnel were doing a fantastic job as well. But when a mob of cameras breached the wall, it had taken an army to keep them back. And these were just the ones that were lucky enough to secure special badges. These were trusted reporters. I could only imagine the animals that were outside. My heart began to race, and I became ever more excited at the thought of returning back to my ship, away from these humans. If I was to see this species again, I would want to wait for the dust of first contact to settle. My eagerness to learn from my apparently new companions was only defeated by my desire to get back to the ship and take a long-deserved rest. I missed my bed. I missed my work. I missed Skarash. My scales went blue. Skarash was imprisoned on the ship still. Worry washed over me as I thought of my student. What a bright future I foresaw for that deformed Valon. The Valon that never saw the cosmos with biological eyes. I hoped that she wasn't making things worse on herself. She had a habit of letting her emotions get the better of her. She would have been far better choice for humanity's first alien contact. Or perhaps not. That nymph would have made a foolish decision with the general. She was still so very young. It was troubling how concerned I was for her well-being. This wasn't normal. She was my pupil. Nothing more. And yet, I worried for her safety more than I usually would. I longed to see her face. She was no emotional or reproductive partner. Yet the thoughts of those sick human children rushed into my mind as I thought of my own sick child back on the ship. Skarresh had so much potential for greatness, and I knew that. Someday, she would even surpass my extended resume. I had the makings of a paragon of scholarship. I knew that she could very well be a high commander if she wanted it. Anything that nymph wanted to do, she could do. Every challenge I gave her, despite whining and complaining, was done completely and perfectly. My scales swirled with yellow. I was proud of that brat. Eventually, the security of the building was able to get the riled up press out of the way completely, some even being arrested on the spot for getting too close. My word, humanity really was stepping up to the plate. True, I had not been harmed, but I guessed humanity was tired of their hiccups. There were rights spoken of and people hauled away. The reporters screamed, freedom of press or something, but security did not care. No more screw-ups were allowed, and, in all likelihood, I imagined these reporters would be released once I returned to the ship. Besides, there were already several diplomats on Earth eager to please and eager to talk. I guess they were not as savory of stories as I was. We weaved through security checkpoints, the blonde-haired female soon taking her leave, her duty done to help escort me. She had pressed to please herself. It freed me to look up towards the behemoth of an escort. A smile began to form on his chapped lips while his boots slammed down on the carpet with audible thumps. You did good, alien, he simply said as he walked down the long hallway. I don't, re don't really think that I did anything at all, I replied, looking down to my feet. It was true, the human leaders did all the work. You built the bridge, ah, they was up to your leaders and I was to walk in on it, he nodded. He smiled, growing warm. No one expected your review of us to be particularly pleasant. It was somewhat of a wake-up call to many humans. Somehow I doubt that, Dimitri, I sneered. I cannot cast judgment on you all. It is not my place. Still, how come so many people are without homes? How come so many go without medical treatment? How come... 
There are many things that keep us from moving forward. Humanity has, uh, having grown uh, comfortable. He shrugged his shoulders. I am not a politician or a strategist. I am just a big guy with lots of muscle and a knack for keeping his mouth shut. But, between you and me, now that this is all said and done, humanity needs a kick in the balls by a large orbiting planet, he cackled. A slap, no, a punch to the face to make us realize just how small we really are, he continued to laugh. We're all small in the universe. The Valon could continue to grow for millions of years, and we'd still be about a whisper amongst shouting voices with how grand it all is, I muttered, causing Dimitri to nod, poking one of his fingers into my arm. Ow. Exactly. The issue with them humanity is we think that we are oh so big. Take it from me. I am large, even by human standards. None of this discussion means anything. But since you've already heard the entire world give you their opinions, what's one more, eh? He asked, actually causing me to burst out with laughter, the large man's smile growing into a crooked, toothy grin. You have a point, Dimitri. I managed to utter between laughs. I know I do. A lot of people do. You included. Opinions are like ourselves. Everyone has one, and they're usually full of shit. The point is, it doesn't matter if humanity agreed with deals or not. What matters is if they're willing to listen. Not a lot of leaders are willing to do that. Already, I can see that things are looking up. Humanity was humbled, thanks to you. It'll take a lot to rise up uh, that golden spire that we used to, he chuckled. And what happens to us when humanity stands on that golden spire? I asked the large man, whose hands were big enough to crush my head like a rotten fruit. Then we see your people's character, Skalan. We get to see the Valan humbled. He spoke in a grim tone. We get to see people who, for thousands of years, were the pinnacle of civilization, be matched. If you wish to be worried about our species coexisting, that is what to worry about. I have seen what happens to when two superpowers refuse to compromise. It is not pretty. His tone soured. I swallowed, my head turning backwards towards the human speaking with the Valan diplomats. My scales turning a bright green with anxiety. But that's where people like you come in, Dimitri chimed in as we approached the back exit of the complex. People like you who have seen the good and bad. You are likable, Skalan, if a bit uh, workaholic, Dimitri rumbled, his tone becoming jovial once again as he walked out. A beautiful, pleasant breeze hitting my scales. The warmth of the system sun making me shudder. I... Uh, I never really took the time to see how beautiful the world was. I was told that this world was a harsh place. I was told that this world would rip me apart from inclement weather and clashing climates. Yet, from what I could see, that beautiful sky and the billowing white clouds of water vapor painted portraits that would make any Valan artist orange with irritable envy. This world was beautiful in its own way, and so were its people. Humanity had so much untapped potential, from their cultures to their very DNA, they could survive anywhere, and woe be unto anyone that told them no. They made outstanding scientists, able to reach the cosmos with primitive calculators, and even better soldiers with bodies that pumped nearly lethal doses of adrenaline into their veins. As my violet eyes peered at the Valon shuttle that had been made ready for me, and a few of the diplomats here, I sighed in a bit of sorrow. My entire stay on Earth was me just wanting to go back home. I never took a chance to enjoy what this wool had to offer. A bit of amazing human food and a near overdose of caffeine was something to remember. But there was so much more to experience. This was a world with over 100 different countries and cultures. I only knew two. The United States and Valan culture. If an agreement can be met regarding these human Balan blalices or study, you will you return, Skalan? Dimitri asked as we approached the shuttle. I shrugged my shoulders. It all depends on if I'm needed elsewhere. I am a planetary scale biologist, Dimitri. I can't let wanderlust drag me away from my duty, I replied. You let those higher steams rule your life. What will your life be once you are at its end? Here lies Scholar Skalan. He did what he was told. Dimitri scoffed. I simply laughed. A few warrior cast hopping out of the shuttle, ready to escort me inside. They looked just about as eager to get home as me. My legacy will be what I have done for people other than myself. It doesn't matter if I am not remembered. 
What matters is the things I've done. You may not remember the individual who invented the wheel, but you still use four wheels on your land shuttles, right? I inquired, a look of satisfaction on my face. The individual doesn't matter for the Valan. We're all equal. I will die knowing I did everything I could so my race could prosper. Dimitri shrugged, a huff of disbelief rising from him. How noble, he replied, reaching into his coat pocket, pulling out a rectangular plastic-like item and handing it to me. Regardless, I'm sure these people will remember you. He smirked, looking down at the picture. I saw an image of Dr. Mormheim and many of the children my treatments helped save. My scale shifted to a bright yellow as I gazed upon the image. The human children were holding a sign that read, in big, hastily drawn letters, Thank you, Skalan. It was absolutely adorable. It's important to look at the big picture, but even little things like that, little things like taking a trip to a hospital and treating sick kids when you have the power to do so. It may not be galaxy changing, but it matters just as much, he said, before bursting into laughter. <laughs> but who am I to say such things? I'm just a hired muscle. You take care now, Scalon, and always remember that no matter how wise someone may appear, at the end of the day, there's a billion more words of wisdom people are eager to shove into your ears. Take everything with a grain of salt. He nodded as I turned, walking onto the shuttle taking a seat. Thanks, I said in a hushed tone as the warriors all boarded after me, the shuttle door closing as we all buckled in for the exit of Earth's atmosphere. Good, a male Valon soldier huffed in his communicator. Let's get off this damned primitive rock. My eyes narrowed towards him, my scales orange with irritation. Keep saying that. I promise, in two or three hundred years, we'll be the primitive ones, I barked, causing the other warriors to laugh. Whatever you say, Skalan, the soldier shrugged as we lifted up off the ground. There were no windows on the shuttle, only monitors to the ground below. I thought I would see Agent Brown one last time before I left this planet. Alas, he was not there. The one human I spent the most time with was gone. I would likely never see him again. Soon, the only thing I saw on the monitors was the flames of exiting Earth's atmosphere. Once the last rumble of the exit was gone, I slouched into my seat, hands reaching into my coat pockets. Huh, that was weird. I felt something in my pocket that wasn't there before. Pulling it out, I saw a strange rectangular device. My eyes went wide when I realized what it was. It was Agent Brown's communication device. How did he manage to slip that in my pocket? Did he even... How did I not notice this? My heart began to race. If this was slipped on my person with such ease, what could have been taken from me? There was a paper note stuck in the back of the device, hastily written English words on a white paper. Hey, Scalon got caught up with work, so couldn't say goodbye. The code for getting into this phone is 1234. I made it easy for you. I know you hated the music I played for you, but I put a bunch of music on this that I thought you would like. Just slip the two tiny speakers into your ears if you can. Unlock the phone and hit play. I already have the program up. Anthony, or as you know me, Agent Brown. My scales grew yellow as we approached my home ship. I did as the note instructed, trying my best to get those speakers into my ears. It was a struggle, but I was eventually able to. I tapped the button on the front of the device, a screen asking for a code appearing with a bunch of digits. One, two, three, four and I was greeted by a bright white screen with a grayscale image of a man sitting at a piano with a triangle pointing to the right, appearing at the center of it. I blinked, the stringed instruments and the music pleasant to my ears. My scales turned a bright, almost golden yellow as I listened. My eyes glued to the monitor, watching the earth slowly fade away as the port door to the home ship opened so the shuttle could enter. My eyes turned down to the bright screen, reading the text under the name Noel Coward, 20th Century Blues. Yes, that made sense. It was a phrase repeated many times throughout the song. The man singing had quite the voice. I was enthralled by it. I'd hardly noticed the shuttle lurch as we docked, the warriors unbuckling their safety harnesses and nudging my shoulder, causing the speakers in my ears to pop out, the fins stretching outwards and a sudden lack of pleasant music. You're home, genius. Let's go so I can get something to eat. Skodar has got something called wings from Earth and snuck them onto the shuttle. 
You need to try human food, Skalan. It's amazing. The normally indifferent warrior purred as he walked off the ship onto the cold steel floor. I couldn't help but chuckle, raising those speakers into my ears again and unfastening my safety harness. There was almost a skip in my step as I pressed play once more. A piece of earth seemed to follow me home. What a wonderful gift from Agent Brown. I guess humanity wasn't that bad. However, my first goal was to find Skaresh. Despite my strolling and joy at finally being on my home ship, I was still quite worried about my pupil. Was she still imprisoned? That question is what led me to the ship's holding cells, usually reserved for the alarm that got too intoxicated during the work breaks. I hummed along to Noel Coward. As my hands moved towards my pockets, the hustle and bustle of the Valarn on the ship very distant as my mind swam in those pleasant notes. I found myself fond of the song, World Weary. It was quite nice to hear that humanity could be soft and not so loud and intense all of the time. As I reached the holding cells, I was a bit stunned not to find Skoresh behind the glass walls. Every cell was empty. I blinked, looking over the worry cars that let me in. Taking out one of my ear speakers, she shrugged. Hey, don't get mad at me, Scar Earth. I just work here, she cackled. My eyes narrowed, scales turning orange. Not funny, I rumbled, causing further amusement to rise out of the holding cell. Oh, you can't take a joke. Scarish is waiting up in the biolabs. All we've been hearing about while you were down there was you. Quite frankly, we're all kind of tired of hearing your name, she nodded. I sighed. I could sympathize with her even giving her a nod of my own. Not my choice, Lona, I spoke, using her informal name, causing her scales to turn like yellow in thanks. I know, Lan. A lot of us are just itching to have a slice of normal again. Things have been pretty tense, you know. My cast has pretty much been at the ready to be told to storm the gates if anything happened to you, she said, her scales shifting a deep violet. I've killed dangerous monsters and creatures on different planets, but uh, I've never gone up against sapient things before. I'd do it, but... It'd be like... Tyranny? I asked. Girls rising, scales orange. Yeah. We wouldn't do that, would we? We wouldn't, you know, actually wage war against another species. It's different killing animals. I don't know. Humans have families, too. It'd be like trying to kill my clutch sister. She spoke softly. That was odd to see. I'd never seen a warrior cast so afraid before. They're different, but we still think... We still have the same higher brain power. Maybe I'm just an idiot here, Lan. But I really hope our two species get along. I don't want to kill anybody. She trailed off. I took in a breath to say something, but in all reality, there was nothing I could say. The warrior cast, charging with warfare, suddenly had their jobs become far, far more grim. A thought that never occurred to me, a scholar. I just made their weapons. It wasn't my job to kill anything. Oh, gods. Thank goodness things did not turn sour on Earth. After a few more words exchanged with Skolana, I took my leave and, in silence this time, took the lift to the scholarship labs. My thoughts began to swim with what Skolana said. It never occurred to me that things could have turned that ugly. War never appeared in my mind, and with how primitive humanity was, it never occurred to me that war, with technological advanced species like us, would have turned into genocide very, very quickly. Good gods, what were the high commanders prepared to do with their flagships? I shook my head at those thoughts as I made my way down the halls towards the biolabs, pressing my hand against the lock to the side that slowly opened. I tisked as I looked into the dark room, the dull glow of my terminal as well as the bioluminescence of a certain small Valon nymph, scales a deep violet, appeared before me. She was curled up in the corner. How and sanitary. She shattered several lab safety protocols by doing so. Ahem, I announced, flipping on the lights, an amused yellow on my scales. Skoresh's head rose up from her knees, her cybernetic green eyes staring holes into me. Uh, Lan? She asked, slowly rising up. Hello, Skaresh. I heard you've had an exciting time. Why so violet? I asked chuckling under my breath. Apologies about my extended vacation. I know you must have been worried. Explosively so, I teased, chuckling under my breath before a sudden rush from underdeveloped Valon ran into my personal space, 
to clawed hands shoving my chest. I stumbled back, the lower gravity of the ship finally getting to me as I nearly fell to the adjacent wall. Three rotations, Scalan! Three rotations! I sat in a cell worried sick over you, she chirped. Her scales a little red. I thought, we all thought, I know, Rash, I replied softly, my gaze falling to the steel door. You could have died, Scalan, I know. If you did, I'd... I'd... I took a few steps forward, watching Resh's scales become deep violet, jitters of woe erupting from her snout as I took the sides of her face onto my palms. This violation of sanitation was acceptable. I'm here, Rush, I whispered. And I'm not going anywhere, I cued. Skyar's voice echoed in my mind. Resh was not just my pupil. Resh was more than that. Resh was, whether I liked it or not, my legacy. I swear it to the gods, Resh. So long as you need me, I'll be here. Resh's eyes moved upward, peering at me in wonder. Her violet scales becoming yellow with elation. Do you, you promise... Do you swear to the gods, Lan? She asked, her tone of voice rising. I swear to the gods. You were right about them too, you know. While on earth, I begged for them to keep me safe. Here I am, I spoke, removing my hands from her. And we have a lot of work to do, I said, the determined look appearing on my face. Skorisha's head tilted to the side in confusion. Already? You've only just come back. Don't you want to rest? She asked, causing me to laugh heartily. Well, of course, I mean, don't mean immediately. I'm just saying that soon. I'll need to make sure that you're ready, I nodded. Ready? Skalan, I'm quite a few revolutions away from being accepted by the Academy of Scholarship as a full-fledged scholar, she muttered, my eyes narrowing in amusement. That's the Valon standard, yes, but after everything you've done and proven to me, both during my tutelage of you and your outburst here on the ship, I think a grander destiny is in store for you. I chirped, causing her the young Valon to blink in confusion. If all goes according to plan, we will need scholars to go to Earth to teach humanity. Out of every scholar I've ever met, you're the most, uh, human-like. If it comes up, you're getting my recommendation to go there, I announced, Risha's scales turning a bright blue. Me? Why would I ever want to go to that planet filled with monsters? Did you forget what they did to you already? She barked, scales turning a fierce red. Chuckling. I handed her the picture of Dimitri had given me, Skarresh's gaze falling upon it, the red inner scale softening to a variety of muted colors as she lost herself in thought. Humans are equal parts clever, terrifying, and curious. They are capable of great things. Whether or not those great things are terrible or amazing is up to both the ones that make it through this scooting the humans proposed and our own example we need to be equals to them. Again, out of every Valon I know, I believe you would fit best down there. And I said, crossing my arms, a warm yellow glow to my scales as I looked at my protege. That, and I'll get you out of my quills for a few revolutions, I cackled, causing the young nymph scales to grow a bright orange as I turned to exit the lab. Where do you think you're going, Scalan? She snapped, causing me to stop in my tracks. I'm going to bed. Strangely, she didn't stop me after that. No thoughts went through my mind as I made my way down the lab halls towards my quarters, opening them up, letting them shut behind me. I completely disrobed and fell onto my bed, rolling up in those soft, inviting sheets, my head resting on the cloud-like pillow. I was home, and everything I had been through, the people I'd met, the sights I'd seen, I was finally safe in bed. My eyes slowly began to close, my scales nearly bursting from bioluminescent light as I felt sleep slowly begin to drip over me. Good night, Earth, I whispered as consciousness slowly left my body. End of chapter. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. Worth energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank the T5 members and Patreons. Alithia, Barky, Fudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper, Arnholtz, Arbard, and Gusta, Lord Ashrakal, and White Van 420